We have enough fire trucks going up and down Barbie Road, full siren anyway. We're used to it. Even with no fire. Even with no fire. fun, man. He's still Johnny to me. Yes, I am. Well, this is more of the EMT things that go by with full sirens, but there's a restroom down at Ellison yep. Heights, and every time one goes down, I hey, want one or somebody at Ellison Heights to <laughs> pick the bucket or something. <laughs> uh, the movie with them from Latterman's from there. Oh, okay. 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 <laughs> John's a great guy, and Bill is too. I know, if you work for him, I know he's aware of things. <laughs> you, know, you know what you can do? Why don't you, why don't you email me and give me a template of how you want me to pull stuff together? Maybe the quickest way. Or this You've already done it. But in the what, we, what I want to do is walk the people with squabbles. Include this one. Oh, well, that's easy. That's even better. In other words, I want to find 25 stops well, let me know in, an hour and a half, in, a, in an hour and a half. Piece of cake. Piece of cake. I, good for you, not for me. <laughs> hey, Dave. Join me in the hotel room this thing tonight. Katie. Oh, I'd like to uh, save the day. Yeah, sure, fine. I want this own case to be settled, and then we can deal with this other thing on its own merits without without having a developer oh. case hanging in the balance. Right. Okay. Yeah. You get the message. I'm just going to leave them in this bin. Good afternoon. Yeah. Welcome, everyone, to the Durham Planning Commission. It's good to have you here this evening. The members of the Durham Planning Commission have been appointed by the City Council and the Board of County Commissioners. We're an advisory board to the elected officials. You should know that the elected officials have the final say on any issue that's here before us this evening. If you wish to speak on an agenda item, and I've seen many of you already do this, we encourage you to please sign up to the table. It's on my left. And just pay special attention to make sure you're signing up for the particular item on the agenda that you want to speak on this evening. Uh, you will be called up to speak when it's time in the public comment period. We ask that you state your name and your address clearly into the microphone, and um, we will then be able to let you know exactly how much time you have. Uh, each side, those speaking in favor and those speaking against, are each given 10 minutes per side. The time will be divided among all the different individuals who signed up to speak. Finally, all motions are stated in the affirmative, so if a motion fails or ties, the recommendation is for denial. Thank you again for being here this evening. Commissioner Bryan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. As we talked previously, I just want to call everybody's attention to the rules of the quorum, which are posted on the left side of the doors entering this chamber, and in particular, rule number 21, Signs such as I see out here tonight are permitted, but you cannot block the view of the person behind you by holding up a sign. Now, we're probably a little bit more forgiving than city council, but if you do it at council, you could be asked to take all signs out. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bryan. Uh, and then before we have the roll call, I would ask that everyone standing, if you could please find a seat in the room. Uh, that's a fire code standard issue. And there are seats up the stairs uh, on my left as well. Those are available for the public as well. Thank you. And may we have the roll call, please? Commissioner Alturk? Here. Commissioner Johnson? Present. Commissioner Ghosh? Here. Commissioner Bryan? Present. Commissioner Satterfield? Here. Commissioner Durkin? Here. Commissioner Hyman? Present. Chair Busby? Here. Commissioner Miller? Here. Commissioner Kinchin? Commissioner Hornbuckle? Uh, Commissioner Hornbuckle has requested an excused absence. So noted. Commissioner Van? Present. Commissioner Gibbs? Present. Commissioner Williams? Present. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I will move an excused absence for Commissioner Hornbuckle. Second. Properly moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. 
Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. We will move to the approval of the minutes and the consistency statement from the July 10th, 2018 meeting. Were there any comments or will someone be ready to make a motion? I move approval of the minutes and the consistency statements as presented. Second. Moved by Commissioner Bryan and seconded by Commissioner Miller. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. I see Commissioner Kenshin is present. It's a party now. And we will look to the staff, uh, Ms. Smith, for any adjustments to the agenda. Good evening, Grace Smith with the Planning Department. Staff has, uh, does not have any adjustments to the agenda. We would like to note that legal notice has been executed in accordance with uh, state and local law and affidavits for those are on file in the Planning Department. And staff is here if you have any questions. Thank you. With no adjustments to the agenda, we will move to our first item. Commissioner Ghosh. Before we open the hearing for our first item, I would like to ask that I be recused. My law firm is representing the applicant on that item. Great, thank you. And before we uh, have a motion to recuse Commissioner Ghosh, this is the first item, the Comprehensive Plan Future Land Use Map Amendment. This is case A18, quadruple zero four. Uh, in addition to Commissioner Ghosh's recusal request, I live, I do not live in Forest Hills, but I live nearby and for a future land use amendment change request, uh, a notification is sent out to any neighbor who lives within a thousand feet and I have received a notice myself. So according to the rules of procedure for the planning commission, I will need to recuse myself as well. So we will look for a motion for a recusal of both myself and Commissioner Ghosh. So move. Second. Second. Properly moved by Commissioner Miller, seconded by Commissioner Bryan. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Commissioner Ghosh and I will leave the chamber, and Vice Chair Hyman will now take over the proceeding for this particular case. Have fun, everyone. Good afternoon, and we will give our commissioners an opportunity to leave the space. And we will proceed with the public hearing for item number A180004, Forest Hills. Um, I'm ready for the staff report. Good evening, I'm Carla Rosenberg with the Planning Department. I'm here to present Plan Amendment Case A180004, Forest Hills. This will be a somewhat brief presentation tonight, um, but you have a more thorough summary of staff's positions in your staff report. For this request, the applicant, Mr. Timothy Profeta, is proposing to amend approximately 220 acres of the future land use map from medium density residential to various less intensive residential uses based on current zoning designations. In addition, he proposes to move approximately 320 acres of land from the urban tier into the suburban tier. These changes are intended to preserve past development patterns and existing neighborhood character. This is an aerial map showing the position of the subject area with respect to the current and future transportation corridors. The Durham Freeway, outlined in yellow, is located one half mile to the northeast, and the proposed Dillard Street stop of the future light rail system, outlined in green, is at 0.8 miles. The current future land use map shows that the downtown development tier, shown in white, is located one quarter mile away. The subject area, shown with red and white hashes, measures approximately one mile from north to south and one half mile from east to west. The area is bisected, I'm sorry, the area is bisected by the Forest Hills Park, designated as recreation and open space, the second largest municipal park in the county. Land to the north, west, and south of the subject area is designated medium density residential, and land to the east is medium high density residential. A small commercial area is located to the northeast, transitioning into the downtown design district. When the 2005 comprehensive plan established the current development tier system, it incorporated Forest Hills into the urban tier and increased the future land use density of the entire area, less the recreation and open space, to medium density residential, which is the lowest density designation in that tier. So here are some images showing single family homes located at the interior of the subject area 
In his justification statement, the applicant suggests that the current land use designation of medium density residential and the current urban tier designation ought to be amended because they allow for denser development than what was originally designed in the neighborhood and what is currently on the ground. The applicant also cites the importance of preserving the neighborhood's sense of place, born from its current very low, low density, its circular roadway layout, and its allowance for economic diversity and abundant open space. These are some additional photos of the area. These show the open space of the Forest Hills Park. And then some photos of uh, the peripheries of the subject area, including Kent Street, which makes up the western border of the subject area with large backyards fronting the roadway and some multifamily de development in the southern portion of the site. Staff has reviewed the request against four criteria for plan amendments found in the Unified Development Ordinance. Consistency with adopted plans and policies, compatibility with existing or future land use patterns, that there be no substantial adverse impact, and that the subject area be of adequate shape and size for the proposed use. Starting with consistency with adopted plans and policies, we found that the proposed amendment is not consistent with land use policies in the comprehensive plan, specifically those regarding the urban tier definition, urban tier development, contiguous development, and demand for land uses. The first policy supports access to urban services and provides opportunities for infill and redevelopment. Staff finds that the proposal reduces access to services by reducing density where services and infrastructure are most accessible, and that the request reduces in opportunities for infill by placing additional regulatory constraints on new development. The next policy states that the land surrounding the downtown and compact neighborhood tiers should be designated as urban tier. The subject area is located within one quarter mile of the downtown tier. The third policy supports orderly development patterns that take advantage of existing urban services and avoids non-contiguous scattered development. Under the present proposal, the subject area becomes an isolated area or island of suburban tier within the urban tier. The proposal furthermore reduces overall access to urban services and infrastructure and increases pressures on development growing outward rather than inward. Finally, the fourth policy evaluates projected need for the requested land use in the future. Projected de demands for residential dwelling units across Durham in 2045 is 192,500 units. Currently, 225,000 dwelling units could be accommodated by the FLUM, 60,000 of which would be located within the urban tier. The urban tier currently accommodates only about 28,000 dwelling units, showing that it is underutilized in its capacity for development. So returning to the four criteria for plan amendments, although the proposal may match existing development patterns, we found that it does not match future land use patterns, which show rapid growth, particularly toward the city center. We did determine there to be a substantial adverse impact with regard to infrastructure, environmental protection, and future demand for land uses, all of which are detailed in the staff report. And finally, staff determines that the site is of adequate shape and size to accommodate the proposed residential land uses. The applicant's request additionally includes a tier boundary change, moving 320 acres of the current urban tier into the suburban tier. There is a set of criteria set forth within the UDO to address tier boundary changes. We found that the proposal did not meet the first criterion for tier boundary change, which is that the site be contiguous to the proposed tier. These are the criteria for tier changes. Um, and so the requests do not meet all of the necessary criteria for plan amendment or tier boundary change, and staff is not recommending approval of any portion of this request. So I will be um, happy to take any questions that you have. I'll be over um, with my supervisor. And um, I also have, um, we have the sign-up sheet, which I can give to. I do have it. Thank oh, you. you. Do have it. I am ready to open the public hearing. I have a number of people who have signed up to speak. I have 15 people who have signed up to speak for. So I'm going to, our normal time is 10 minutes per side. So I'm going to need. Madam Chairman, I move that we give every speaker, regardless of whether they're for or against, uh, two minutes. Second. Second. 
it's been moved and properly seconded that we give each speaker two minutes um, to speak. So thank you all in favor of this motion. Let it be known by the usual sign of aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you, and we will proceed. Uh, the first individual is uh, Mr. Bryan. Thank you very much, Madam Vice Chair. <clears throat> Good evening, Vice Chairman Hyman and members of the Planning Commission. My name is Bill Bryan, and I'm an attorney with the Morningstar Law Group here in Durham. Uh, tonight, I am representing a group of neighbors in the Forest Hills community called Durham Neighbors Together, who have filed an application for a FLUM amendment uh, for the entire neighborhood. I know this is not an ordinary application for you all, but Forest Hills is not an ordinary neighborhood, and it presents compelling reasons to change the FLUM. Everybody from DNT, stand up, please. Thank you. As planning commissioners, you are aware of the planning department's plan to revamp the comprehensive plan in the coming years. The need for this is clear. What you see here is the development tier map, which is the centerpiece of the current comprehensive plan. The map was done primarily, primitively to fit a planning concept based upon a series of concentric circles emanating from downtown, which you can see here. The idea is that each of the successive circles is a little bit bigger and a little less dense with the last. While this might make sense if you're starting with a blank slate in a green field, the problem with this approach is that it does not take into account the built environment of the city. And in Durham, the built environment, the existing neighborhoods is very important to the character of our community. Forest Hills is one of the first neighborhoods in Durham that was built specifically as a suburban neighborhood. However, our current comprehensive plan puts Forest Hills in the urban tier. You can see here, the FLUM designation designates the entire neighborhood as medium density residential. This calls for a density of at least six units per acre and as many as 12 units per acre. This is what 12 units per acre looks like, multifamily, multi-story. This is what six units per acre density looks like. Clearly, neither is consistent with any part of Forest Hills. And Forest Hills is not alone. This slide shows a number of historically suburban neighborhoods that are on the current planning policy should be, be redeveloped at six to 12 units per acre. What you see outlined here, I think somebody on my side will yield me an additional minute. I'm almost yes. done. Okay. What you see here, where, where were we? Uh, this slide shows a number of historically suburban neighborhoods that our current policy says should be redeveloped at six to 12 units per acre. Some of them may be your neighborhoods. Um, what you see here outlined in purple is the current zoning map for Forest Hills neighborhood. One thing to note is the unique way in which the streets are laid out. Would somebody design an urban density neighborhood in this manner today? There's no way. This is not only one of the unique features which went unaccounted for in the 2006 comprehensive plan. The main ar artery coming through Forest Hills is 15501, but it is only two lanes and cannot be widened without tearing down existing homes. Also, there is no transit system in Forest Hills. Medium density residential or six to 12 units per acre simply does not make sense in this area. What will we end up if the flum is not changed in patches of very high, what we will end up if the flum is not changed is patches of very high density development as some large tracks redevelopment with no adequate transit system or road system to serve them. And they will be entirely inconsistent with the existing neighborhood. So the flum designation that we've determined that makes sense is to use the existing zoning. Our application, therefore, requests the FLUM designations that roughly match the existing zoning in the Forest Hills neighborhood. It's important to note that our request will support more density, and we've listed here on this slide what it does mean and what it doesn't mean. But we're, what we see here tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is a group of people who are trying to seize control of the planning process for their neighborhood, and that's a healthy thing, especially in a community like Durham. Therefore, we request that both that you approve the request and that you do vote tonight. We would oppose most strenuously a continuance. Thank, Thank you, you for wrapping up your comments. Mm -hmm. I'm going to call the, I want to know the name of the individual to defer the time, and then I'm going to call the next four individuals to speak. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, so Sandy Hurd, um, I, if I butcher some names, I apologize. Correct it when you get to the, the mic. The name was, is it Silva, Sylvan Robarge? Am I close? 
Tom Clayton and George Vaughn. Okay, that's the four. Okay, Sandy. First of all, thank you for hearing us today. My name is Sandy Hearn, and I've lived in Forest Hills for 25 years, and my husband and I have also had the pleasure of raising four kids in Forest Hills. Clearly, we're all aware today that we are not here to talk about the Pinecrest development, as that's going to be addressed in a subsequent meeting in the near future. However, I would like to say that despite the many unsettling moments over these past few months, I'm actually really grateful that the Pinecrest issue arose when it did, because it served as a super powerful wake-up call for me and for a lot of people in this room who realized that we desperately needed to educate ourselves about the flum, a seemingly arbitrary map that actually has the power to irrevocably alter neighborhoods like Forest Hills and the lives of those who live there. Uh, when we moved here in 1987 and I was returning to North Carolina having grown up here, we made a conscious decision to live in Durham specifically because of neighborhoods like Duke Park, Trinity Park, and Forest Hills. We felt thrilled to be in a place where we could lovingly restore an old house, be just minutes away from our jobs, and very importantly to us, meet an eclectic and diverse group of people, not just from our neighborhood, but from all over Durham in the Forest Hills Park. Please know that we are not opposed to growth. As a matter of fact, many of us who have been here as long as I have actually consider ourselves the early innovators who laid the groundwork for Durham's current vitality. So how could we be anything other than happy about where we are now? We're so proud of Durham and fully support its continuing trajectory. We'd just like to see our city continue to grow in an intentional and not arbitrary fashion, and in such a way that it takes into account the myriad benefits that preserving neighborhoods like Forest Hills has to offer, not only to Forest Hills residents, but to all of Durham. And we think gaining approval of our Flum Amendment is critical to making that happen. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next speaker, and please state your name. Did I? I I'm Sylvain Roberge, and I have lived at 1515 Hermitage Court since 2008. And I'm going to talk about a few comments about Forest Hills as a, as a historic area. Forest Hills neighborhood is a national historic district. Forest Hills' principal historic significance is its ensemble of landscape and architecture. The neighborhood was designed in 1917 by noted landscape architect Earl Summer Draper. It was the first subdivision in Durham whose design created parkland along the lowlands and whose streets followed the contours of the hills rather than a rigid grid pattern. Forest Hills contains varied residential architecture. There are both large and small houses and well-preserved period revival and modernist styles. Some houses were designed by noted local and national architects. Others were, bu were built from plan books or ordered from Sears and Roebuck. Forest Hills epitomizes the desire in Durham's strategic plan for thriving and livable neighborhoods. Forest Hills is now entering its second century as a neighborhood. Please support the Flum Amendment so the citizens of Forest Hills may have the time to thoughtfully plan for the neighborhood's future via the NPO process. Thank you. Uh, Tom Clayton. Thank you. Um, my name is Tom Clayton, and I've lived at 1016 Homer Street uh, for 32 years. In a vibrant, diverse city like Durham, our future la uh, land use map as currently configured does not make sense. No one with such a variety of interests, needs, resources, and perspectives would choose to live in hom hom uh, homogenized concentric circles, and indeed we haven't. All across Durham, folks have developed a patchwork of dwellings and living patterns of every type. We all are fortunate that a distinctive feature of our city is the number of extraordinarily beautiful and stable neighborhoods close to downtown. As an educator, I can appreciate the principle behind the flum as an ele uh, elegant theoretical con uh, concept, but in reality, we humans are wonderfully unique. Artificially imposing standardization by drastically increasing density throughout the flum's urban tier will never work, and it shouldn't. What the future land use map ought to resemble is a fully realized quilt. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. George Vaughn. 
Hi, I'm George Vaughn. I live at 1022 Westwood, and I've been there for the last 10 years. I support the Flum Amendment, and this is why. When we learned of the rezoning at Pinecrest, we discovered that Forest Hills was vulnerable to changes that were not in keeping with the neighborhood. This is because of the 2005 Comprehensive Use Plan and the Flum. We had no idea what these documents would allow in our neighborhood. We discovered that the Flum would allow a density of 6 to 12 dwelling units per acre in our neighborhood. There are 21 lots in Forest Hills that are one or more acres, and this totals 31 acres. The Flum would allow between 190 and 368 houses to be built on these houses, lots. Some are vacant lots, others have existing homes. The economics of today's housing market would make it worthwhile to tear down existing homes and rebuild using the much higher density. This would destroy our neighborhood. Teardowns and inappropriate infill have happened in Raleigh. There is neighborhood support for maintaining our existing density. Recently, our neighborhood submitted an application for a neighborhood protective overlay. The JCCPC approved it or advanced it on a vote of four to one. The density limitations in our NPO are the same density limitations that we are seeking in the FLUM. Our NPO application was supported by 64% of the members of the neighborhood, and we have signed petitions to support that. And we gathered those in under four weeks. And I believe this shows a very high level of neighborhood support for our density, existing density. The FLUM will likely be revised in the next three years. Our amendment will protect our neighborhood while the planning department does their job. And I thank you, and I ask that you decide in favor of the Flum Amendment tonight. Forest Hills needs protection now. Thank you. I'm going to call the next five people. Nita Faraday, uh, Sue Watson, Brent Wolf, Lawrence Baxter, and Tim um, Profeta. Profeta? Okay, thank you. Ready? Okay. We're ready, thank you. Good evening, thank you for hearing us this evening. My name is Nita Farahani, and I live at 1544 Hermitage Court with my family. We're a bit of an odd uh, family to be representing and requesting that you approve the Flum Amendment tonight because we're one of the families who moved in to Hermitage Court and had a house deconstructed there. We were uh, excited by the neighborhood. We loved the character of the neighborhood. We loved the history of the neighborhood and sought to move into the neighborhood. It's a challenging neighborhood to move into because it's such a popular one. We found a house that we hoped to renovate and discovered sadly was in such disrepair that it could not be salvaged. Instead, we had it deconstructed over a number of months by Habitat for Humanity and had a home built there with an architect who's notable to Durham, Phil Shostak, but who built a very different kind of home than is the kind of home in Forest Hills. We built a modern minimalist home. That home was built with an architect who recognized, and us, who recognized the beauty and the unique character of Forest Hills. He spent months studying the neighborhood, choosing a setback that was consistent with all of the other homes in the neighborhood, choosing a roof line that was consistent with all of the homes in the neighborhood, choosing white painted brick to echo the history of the neighborhood, white stucco to echo the history of the neighborhood. That kind of thoughtful development led to a neighborhood who embraced our change. The Durham neighbors together recognize the change is inevitable. Some homes may have to be torn down. Some homes may change. But that kind of thoughtful progress in a neighborhood that has such a deep history is the kind of progress that we all hope to see. Homes that can be preserved, homes that may need to be changed, architects who recognize the unique character and wish to celebrate it and integrate it into the neighborhood rather than destroying the neighborhood and installing multifamily homes there instead. We were shocked to discover that in the place of our home, there could have been six instead. Thank you, and we ask that you approve the Flum Agreement. Thank you. Um, Sue Watson. Hello, thanks so much for hearing us. Uh, and hearing our opinions. I'm Sue Watson, and I've lived in the Forest Hills neighborhood for 35 years, along with my husband, Paul Sabre. He's here tonight. Um, we had two kids and raised them in Forest Hills, 
and our present house looks out onto the park. So we do a lot of neighborhood watch on the park, including litter and chasing off teenagers that are up to no good. So we're very invested in, in um, keeping our eye on things. Um, we've lived in, I said we've lived in two different houses, but, and we've been on East Forest Hills the whole time. We fully support the flum change to match the reality of Durham. Um, it's craggy and hilly and crooked, and nothing about Durham is concentric circles. Um, I also, like many of you in this room, have served on other nonprofit boards in this town. And the thing that's so great about Durham is that everybody gets a vote. And we are so used to letting everybody talk and give up their opinion and hearing them and taking all stakeholders' opinions to heart. And I really, really do appreciate the planning committee doing that for us. Um, so again, we support the Flum Amendment, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Is that Brent? Yes, Brent Wolf. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, I believe Tanya Voich had signed up ahead of me. Maybe she's on the list twice, if twice. it's all right. Her name is here twice, so I marked it, one out and moved it down to. Would it be all right if she went ahead of me? Yes, that is fine. Thank I will you. move her back up to the spot that I moved her from. Thanks much, and I apologize, apologize for the confusion. My name's Tanya Voich, and I live at 1014 West Forest Hills Boulevard. Um, I've lived in Forest Hills for nearly 10 years, and I support the Flum Amendment. This amendment will ensure that Durham remains the special and inviting place it has become, thanks in no small part to the patchwork of uniquely leafy established neighborhoods close to a vibrant downtown, Durham's population is exploding. Ironically, the city must now balance accommodating this growth with the very reasons for it. Tonight, I'd like to focus on the unique and vital natural and recreational resources that Forest Hills provides all of Durham. These include its park, its green open spaces, and perhaps best of all, its mature statuesque trees. People from all over the city flock to the park, stroll its streets, run in our streets, in fact, in case of the of Durham's numerous road races, and want to make Durham their home because of neighborhoods and trees and green spaces like the ones in Forest Hills. When I tell people where I live, people will say, I love that neighborhood. It's got that big park and all the trees and cool houses. I play Frisbee there, or I take my kids trick or treating there, or we love to walk our dogs around there. So you see, Forest Hills doesn't just matter to me. It's special to many people beyond the neighborhood. I therefore urge you to amend the FLUM so that growth is accomplished in a responsible way that appreciates the unique character of the neighborhood while protecting an important and irreplaceable resource for the city. In other words, please amend the FLUM to make sure that we keep Durham Durham and don't risk the very things that make Durham the desirable place it has come to be. Thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you. And now, uh, Brent Wolf. Thank you very much. My name is Brent Wolf, and I live at 1412 Kent Street. I live in the Long Meadow neighborhood next to Forest Hills. Uh, I come in support of the Flum Amendment for Forest Hills because the neighborhood is an asset for the whole city. I, uh, people come not just for the park, but also to walk and run and bike the streets lined with beautiful homes and mature trees. Uh, the neighborhood also welcomes city residents for events like Halloween, it's a Halloween celebration, various charity runs and road races, and of course it has one of the best sledding hills in the city and people come from all over for that. Uh, requiring urban tier development could lead to the disappearance of distinctive architectural styles and tree cover. Durham needs density in the urban core and affordable housing but it also needs neighborhoods like Forest Hills that are accessible to all city residents. Great cities have older neighborhoods like Forest Hills that give them their unique character and tell the story of how the city came to be great. I urge you to preserve this part of Durham's unique character and to do it this evening. Thank you. Thank you. We have Mr. Baxter. <coughs> Thank you, Chair Hyman, and thank you, Commissioners, for the opportunity. I'm Lawrence Baxter. I live at 1010 Homer Street. 
Uh, before that, I lived in another part of Forest Hills, Oak Drive. And I want to focus uh, briefly on something that has not actually received a lot of attention except in a tangential remark by the head of the planning department. That is the infrastructure. Um, we're probably all familiar with University Drive. Uh, it is a congested road that is often extremely difficult or dangerous to get onto out of either East Forest Hills or West Forest Hills. It is a main artery for the city and it is not yet able to handle the current traffic, let alone uh, the uh, future traffic. Uh, the Durham Area Transport Authority doesn't even run buses on it because of the danger of running such large vehicles. When I lived in Oak Drive, uh, I often experienced the situation where there'd been an accident or some other obstruction on university. And when that happens, the smaller, minor streets throughout Forest Hills become very congested because vehicles take their alternative way there. They spill out even onto little streets that are not fully paved, like Cedar, and certainly onto Kent. And then at the end of that, those roads spill out back onto university. So the existing flum, after uh, 13 years, has not yet seen infrastructure developed to manage the kind of growth that it would allow. And for that reason, I would urge you to consider uh, supporting, uh, uh, voting in favor of our petition for an amendment to the flum because it doesn't reduce a thing, contrary to what was presented to you at the beginning of this meeting. It simply puts in place what we have now and then requires developers until a new infrastructure is created to demonstrate how they are going to manage that infrastructure. Again, I support the petition and uh, would urge you to uh, vote in favor of it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tim Profita. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to all commissioners for your time and consideration and for hearing the request today. I'm Tim Profeta. I live at 1014 West Forest Hills Boulevard. I've been there for the last nine and a half years. And I wanted to actually circle back uh, clearly as a signatory for this request to talk about what today's request is not about. And it's really not about the Pinecrest development at all. Others have claimed that we are asking for the flum to be amended to fight the proposal to develop Pinecrest. That is wrong. Actually, we hope we can anticipate a smart Pinecrest development that can be incorporated into our flum amendment. This commission is in receipt of our offer communicated to Pinecrest developers regarding their development. I think they will acknowledge that we've engaged them in good faith to find a mutually agreeable resolution. And in fact, three of my neighbors and I were at the Pinecrest developer's office until past 8 p.m. last night trying to work out a resolution. I also anticipate that some may suggest that last night's last minute negotiations were too last minute and they need to be given more time. First, the fact they were last minute seems to have awoken the possibility of a resolution. But we at Durham Neighbors Together have been asking for the same key terms, a set number of units and support for this flum amendment since we first met with the Pinecrest team in the spring. And second, there is nothing to prevent us to continue to negotiate in pursuit of a mutually acceptable plan even if this flum amendment is granted. Now our request today has nothing to do with Pinecrest, other than that the development woke us up to the flum's implications for our beloved neighborhood. What today's request is about, as my friends before me expressed, is changing the default assumption about our neighborhood's growth to one that respects its character and current development patterns. Is not arguing, may I finish? Yes, please. Is not arguing for nothing to change. Our negotiations with Pinecrest verify that but it changes the signal to developers about what we want Forest Hills to look like in 20 years. And the mo then the most appropriate means to dig into the details of everyone's passions, views, and beliefs about our neighborhood's evolution is the detailed neighborhood planning process, which we initiated through the NPO process. What we're asking for today is until that exploration can happen, please pass this Flum Amendment so we can have the time to wisely how to to wisely assess how to evolve this jewel of a neighborhood that is Forest Hills. Thank you. Um, Christy Ferguson, right, you still have, you gave two minutes or you still have one minute. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, so the next individual, Tom. I think it will go by fast, thanks. 
Beg your pardon? Okay. So, Christy? No, she's, not, she's, she's yielding it to rebuttal. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, I, did, I missed that part. Thank you. Um, Ian, um, Ian Nidal, Nidal? Okay, and the last, well, that's it. Those are all of the individuals that I have who have signed up to speak for. So that means I have two individuals then who have reserved their time for rebuttal, two minutes each. Okay, now I'd like to call those individuals who have signed up to speak. Now, first of all, have I missed anyone who signed up to speak for? And I do not have your name. Vice Chair. We'll get this gentleman over here. Yes. Come on up. Back up. If, to the mic and give me your name. Ooh. All right. Hello. Uh, my name is Josh McCarty. I live in Longmeadow, and I would like to speak in opposition. Name and address. Uh, 1613 Vivint Street. Mm -hmm. I'm dealing with the individuals who are speaking for. For the proposal. Oh, I want to speak against. Well, there will be time for yeah. that. Right. Okay. Okay. So um, I have a list of individuals who have signed up to speak against, and I'll give you an opportunity. Where do I sign up? Come here. Once again, I'll ask the question, have I missed anyone who wanted to speak for the project? And at this particular time, if I have, I will conclude all of the individuals then based on the signatures that I have, and I will move to the list of individuals who have signed up to speak against. Thank you for my list, please. That's all right. I'll call the next four individuals, James Seaman, Ken Spaulding, George Stanzel, and Jay McLeod. James, yes, James Siemens is first. Thank you. Um, my name is James Siemens. I own the property known as Pinecrest at 1050 West Forest Hills Boulevard. Um, I've not contributed to, nor am I a member of the DNT group. I'm not represented by Morningstar Law Group. Um, the proposed Flum Amendment would prohibit planning development at, planned development at Pinecrest. I understand the neighbors um, supporting the amendment are in discussions with the developer regarding proposed development at Pinecrest. I simply ask that more time be allowed for those discussions to continue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ken Spaulding. Good evening, uh, Madam Chair and members of the Planning Commission. My name is Ken Spaulding. I represent the applicant for Pinecrest. I also want to say good evening to the Forest Hill residents that we have been working with so hard over the last year and uh, appreciate you being here, I think and I hope. Uh, now, all joking aside, I, I want to say they have worked extremely hard with us as we have tried to come up with um, something as it relates to Pinecrest that would be do two things. Number one, be consistent with our current comprehensive plan because when the developer came in to talk about it, uh, the planning staff indicated that this is the way you're going to have to go based on your comprehensive plan. When we went to the neighbors, the neighbors pointed out uh, they didn't know that that type of density was allowed, and this was, as I think you mentioned last night, a wake-up call. And uh, so what we have been trying to do over the last few months is to find a way of being consistent with the comprehensive plan and at the same time reducing the density. And we had to end up shrinking our actual, uh, it had been 12 acres, we shrink, shrunk it rather, uh, to 9.1 acres and were able to get it to where, quite frankly, um, we had been at about 57 units when we started. 
and we worked down to uh, 48 and 45, and now we have given our absolute best, and that's 38 unit uh, for the development. Uh, we had been told previously by some residents that 40, 40 units uh, or 42 units would have been uh, acceptable. Uh, then there's some that, that wanted uh, to have a fewer amount, and we understand that too. Uh, this is an ongoing process. We hope uh, we're asking for tonight for there to be a, a deferral of this for 60 days. The reason for that is, is that um, we come on the calendar for, for your agenda on uh, September the 11th. George waves the time. Uh, we, September the 11th, uh, we come before the Planning Commission. Uh, any one resident opposition or anyone could move and request that uh, uh, there will be a 30-day um, delay by right. So that would put us into October. So if we were able to have the case here deferred on the flume uh, until um, October for 60 days, we will be able to be there together. What's the importance of being there together? We very much would like for there not to be a vacuum that you're in or that the residents are in, where each and every resident here tonight would fully understand what we're trying to do, how, not only how hard we have worked, but where we actually are. It is crucial to us that we be good neighbors in Forest Hills and that we, be, that we represent Forest Hills as it exists today. And I have never worked as long as I've been doing this for 30 years in Durham. It's hard to try to make sure that we blend together what the new development would be and to make sure that it's consistent, compatible, and the density is one that is acceptable to the residents. And so we look forward to hopefully an opportunity to, to continue to work with the residents, with the group that we met with last night, DNT, and others to try to be able to have a win-win situation. I do want to point out that we did uh, present and make a proposal for compromise about uh, two, three, three months ago. We did not hear back until, I believe it was Wednesday of last week, and I talked with the lawyer about it, and he explained the reason why, and we understand that. Uh, and when he did get, uh, they did get back with us. My client jumped in his car, came back from Atlanta uh, to be here for a Monday meeting. Uh, one more of my people. Uh, and so that we could have that Monday meeting. We did meet from five until nine, I believe. Uh, and, and we've been making progress. And in the process of, of making progress, uh, it's not just for this development, uh, but it's for also Forest Hills itself. So we're asking for the opportunity to continue to work and to, to create a win-win situation and to create something that will be a hallmark for Durham, as the residents of Forest Hills have indicated to us. We might not be able to get every single person to agree, but we want to get the majority or consensus, if at all possible. And I think as people have seen what we have done, the meetings we have held, we even recognize that the first meeting that was held, quite frankly, I felt, and so did Mr. Stangell, that Forest Hills had not been appropriately respected. And we changed the team of how we were going to address it. And we addressed it in the way that Mr. Stangell and I have done for the last 30 years. In conclusion, I would like to say again that I hope we have an opportunity to help create a win-win situation. I hope that we will have an opportunity to, to continue to work together and I look forward uh, to that. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that was both uh, Mr. Stangel and Jay McLeod gave up your time as well. Is that correct? No, Mr. Stangel didn't. Right. It's Jay McLeod. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Um, I had a presentation. Is it, how do I bring that up? Does anyone know? Loaded on here, and that's not it. Yeah. Got it. Sorry. Yeah, we do. Um, 
Good evening, my name is Jay McLeod and I'm a professional planner with Stewart where I work with uh, local governments and residents across the state to craft comprehensive plans and future land use amendments and updates. Um, and I wanted to discuss a little bit the, uh, the application for the Flume Amendment. First off, it is um, regressive in two respects. It downgrades the tier of development as well as the density. If this was commonplace, Durham would still be farmland. Uh, this isn't the way that future land use maps work, and it's, I'm sure it's not the way that it was envisioned in 2006 when it was created and adopted by the residents of the community. Um, the Forest Hills neighborhood, uh, if developed, if changed the tier and density, would create a gap, as staff said, in the development pattern. Um, and it would be in opposition to the adopted future land use policies in the comprehensive plan and lead to leapfrog development, place growth from the city center and reduce housing opportunities close to the city center and lead growth away from that area. Um, the Forest Hills site is indeed urban in location. It's about a 10 or 15 minute walk from here. Um, the stated policies and the comprehensive plan to support that would look to encourage infill development uh, and as well as it is within about a 10 minutes walk from you know, the downtown of a city of almost a quarter million people. Uh, as a sizable number of the parcels in Forest Hills are vacant. Those are the light pink color as opposed to the purple, which are occupied. Um, that's almost 10% of the area, excluding the park. Um, two homes per acre, I think, is quite easily, arguably not the highest and best use of vacant property this close to the city center. Uh, and even staff has noted that parcels along Kent Street are an opportunity for redevelopment. Uh, and to conclude, these are following uh, some additional goals from the comprehensive plan that were adopted that uh, are in opposition to the Flume Amendment. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to call the next um, four individuals, uh, April Johnson, Connie Siemens, Dick Hales, and Chris is it Woods. Okay. So April Johnson. Yes, good evening. My name is April Johnson. I'm the Executive Director of Preservation Dome. Um, the, the Forest Hills neighborhood is, and Pinecrest are valued and important historic places and land use policies and decisions that affect either are important to Preservation Durham and our members. We have studied the issues, toured the property several times, and have met with the developers. We've, we've heard from neighbors who both support and oppose the development on various aspects of it. We are pleased that the development plan commits to preserving the historic structures and pays for it with an infill density of less than four units per acre but we have abstained from officially endorsing or opposing the specific plan to give the primary stakeholders space to work um, with each other on the details. We understand that the two sides are getting closer to a decision. We are here tonight to speak to a related but larger issue that could derail those negotiations, the disconnect between our future land use map and the existing density in Forest Hills. This is an issue of great concern for us which affects many of our historic inner ring neighborhoods, many of which lack the protections offered by NPL, a neighborhood protection overlay, or a local historic district. We support infield development that adds density where appropriate, but not at the expense of these historic traditional neighborhoods. We believe that this is a larger issue that deserves more serious study and public input as part of a comprehensive plan update, a process we now understand is just beginning. We ask the commission to either to we ask the commission to defer action on the proposed changes to Flume this evening. A rush to either approve or deny a Flume update doesn't solve the larger policy problem, and it could undermine months of negotiation on the Pinecrest project. Thank you for your consideration. You. I'm Connie Siemens and Dick Hale. Good evening. My name is Connie Siemens. I live at 1514 Hermitage Court. I've been a resident of Forest Hills for 12 years. I'm a Siemens family cousin. 
I'm a supporter of historic preservation and a proponent of smart urban development. As you know, Durham has been propelled through a decade of rapid revitalization and extraordinary success. However, this has not come without serious growing pains, including increased suburbanization, loss of rural buffers and natural habitats, increased traffic issues, and immense housing pressure. The comprehensive plan is designed to help us with this growth in a way that protects the viability of our city and controls suburban sprawl while protecting the quality of life which has drawn so many to our beloved town. As you know, we are also um, experiencing an extremely, extremely limited housing inventory. This has spurred gentrification both in middle class and aspiring middle class neighborhoods within the urban core and, quite, uh, and neighbors of Forest Hills. This exacerbates affordable housing for our most vulnerable citizens. While I appreciate the intention of the Flum Amendment to protect the integrity and character of my neighborhood, I do not think this is the best way to accomplish that goal. I strongly believe that we can put measures in place that can protect the quality of life of Forest Hills residents, along with its historic integrity, while also accommodating smart urban infill in carefully planned density. These goals do not have to be mutually exclusive. Indeed, thoughtful development and planned density can not only support fu uh, the future and character and integrity of our existing housing and life of its residents, but also be a leader in improved living conditions and a more vibrant, diverse community. I do not feel like the proposed Flum Amendment is the, is the best and correct approach to future development or historic preservation. I urge you to um, rec uh, not to recommend this proposal, but work with Forest Hills and the greater community to revisit the Flum, its goals and existing conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hales. Good evening. My name is Dick Hales. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Uh, Would you please state your address? Yes. My address is 100 Briarcliff Road in Durham, in the Forest Hills neighborhood. Uh, I appreciate your all service and uh, to the community. In note, uh, commissioners Brian, Miller, and Gibbs were on the commission when I left the planning staff uh, 14 years ago, so especially single them out. Um, I was a 24-year employee of the Durham City County Plan Department, where I was over a Greensboro Plan Director, where I returned home. I also work as a planning consultant. Um, in addition, I recently convened a meeting uh, this past Sunday of some of my immediate neighbors um, about concerns with the uh, Langes map request. Um, I live in a part of the neighborhood. I term it Southwest Forest Hills. Um, uh, it's a long university drive and some of the connecting streets. Um, the majority of the lots in my neighborhood, and just from spot checking, I would say 75% of them, um, are less than a quarter acre in size. That means the density of the lots, and I consider this the heart, heart of Forest Hills, but it's not the larger lots down by the park, um, uh, range from, um, 7,000 to 10,000 square feet, a quarter acre is 10,890 square feet. So the current nature of our part of the neighborhood is greater than four units per acre. Um, accordingly, we oppose the future land use map designation of this area to low density residential, which is less than four units acre. It doesn't fit the developed portion of our neighborhood. Uh, we do support designation of this area as low, medium density residential, four to eight units per acre, which does fit the existing character of the area. Uh, and because of some of the confusion on this and also other lots that I didn't have a chance to look at, I would recommend that uh, a proposal be brought back that looks more carefully either with the applicant or the staff at appropriate boundaries to make sure that other properties aren't being pushed out of um, Flume designation, if we're going to fix this, let's try and fix it right. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Um, Arthur Rogers, Ray Williams, Andrew Jacobson. Good 
Good evening. My name is Arthur Rogers. <clears throat> I live at 1535 Hermitage Court in Forest Hills, and I've lived in the neighborhood for 23 years. I agree that the future land use map is not perfect. I also believe that the Pinecrest development has merit. Therefore, I simply ask that you delay this decision so, so that both the future land use map change and the Pinecrest rezoning can be co considered together. Thank you. Thank you. So Ray Williams and Andrew Jacobson. Okay. Um, my name is Ray Williams. I live at 1709 Wallace Street in Longmeadow. Um, and I fully understand the concerns of the current future land use map having unintentional consequences on uh, what is successful in built neighborhoods. Um, the way I perceive it is that, or what my concern is, is the goal is to circumvent unintentional consequences of, uh, of dense development uh, within low density areas. And it, I would like to see the future land use map addressed holistically, equitably, through all neighborhoods in Durham. Um, I think when we look at it as all neighborhoods together, uh, rather than peeling off certain neighborhoods, um, will correct uh, what is wrong with the flum um, uh, more successfully. Thanks. Thank you. And Andrew Jacobson and Josh McCarthy, um, we're ready for you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Andrew Jacobson. My family and I lived for about five years at um, 2304 University Drive. Um, I hate density. Actually, it's the, it's, I think it's the term density that I dislike. Um, the word density is often used in a negative context. It's a bugaboo, right? It's the equivalent for many adults of a monster hiding under a child's bed. It's used often equated with clear cutting, um, ugly building materials, inappropriate buildings, um, increased environmental effects or pollution, um, even reduced uh, safety. But I think density is, density, much like other terms in, in housing and development context, is a loaded term. However, density uh, is often re only recognized when it's done poorly. Densities uh, sensitive to uh, neighborhood characters are achievable using techniques like high quality uh, construction, high quality design, retention of green space, um, matching existing building characteristics to the neighborhood, things like that. When done properly, higher densities can blend into the neighborhoods and are accepted. There already exist within Forest Hills substantial variations in density. I, su I support increased housing densities in smart locations uh, adjacent to city services. Increased density and diversity in housing types increases efficiency of city services. Dense and diverse housing types can mitigate housing choices and challenges. And in almost in many uh, environmental issues, such as water quality, climate change, increased density is environmentally beneficial. The proposed uh, Flume Amendment directly challenges the ability to increase the density and diversity in neighborhoods surrounding downtown. I've read the staff report, and I support its recommendations. I think it would be wiser not to carve out an exception for Forest Hills and, and instead address issues of housing density and affordability holistically through the comprehensive plan process that's forthcoming. Thank you. Thank you. And Josh McCarthy. Hello again. Uh, sorry about before. Josh McCarty, 1613 Bivens Street again. Um, so what, what gets me worked up enough to try to skip everybody in line is that uh, uh, I'm passionate about uh, walkable, dense, mixed-use neighborhoods. I'm pa passionate about good urban design. I'm passionate about a lot of the things people have articulated here that have to do with design more than they have to do with an arbitrary measurement of how, how we measure a place, right? density. You know, they showed some couple, a couple pictures in that first presentation. Uh, was it uh, six units looks like this? 
12 units looks like this. Wow, 12 units can look like a lot of things. You'd be surprised how dense places like, uh, a lot of places that, that people have mentioned is uh, uh, being good places, like uh, uh, parts of Charleston, Boston, places like that, even, you don't even, not even have to go right in the core of them, get further out. Uh, density doesn't have to look like, like what you're imagining. So that's what I'm passionate about, and I get really nervous when I hear, uh, when I hear efforts to try to restrict uh, the ability to, to do development, to, to uh, you know, all the great things that, that folks have been talking about, the park, uh, all the amenities. Uh, I, don't, I don't want those things to be exclusive. I want Durham to have enough space for everybody. And part of that means that all the neighborhoods that are urban have to accommodate that space. And so, so let's talk about this map, because I'm a map guy, and this map doesn't make any sense to me. So, so this is what I got in the mail. And you can see, like right here, uh, there's downtown. Right, and so so this is this is right now it's urban, and this is going to become suburban. I think uh, somebody called it regressive. So I, I I've been thinking of it as a past land use map, because if you go back to 1950, this was probably the edge of well no it was it was the edge of town. Um, well that was it was a long time ago. So the edge of town has moved, uh, and then right now this is smack in the middle of Durham. I mean it's it's not it's it's central. It's close to downtown. So. Um, it just doesn't make any sense to me to, to create this suburban island right in the middle of the city. And then, you know, what, what does that say? What precedent does that say set for uh, the other neighborhoods that are inside of this that, that you know, decide that they don't want to uh, go by the uh, comprehensive plan? Thanks. Thank you. Um, I spoke to two individuals, uh, Christy Ferguson, and Tom Weisloff reserved time to look at this. Next slide. Yeah, Bob Chapman, you skipped the slide. Did I skip you? <laughs> well, I apologize, and I am going to give you your time at this time. My apologies. Thank you very much. My name is Bob Chapman. Um, I'm the one who thought it was a good idea to lecture everybody uh, at the first meeting. Considering that uh, you all are so highly educated and many professors, uh, I thought a lecture would be appropriate. And I talked about Earl Sermon Draper, and I talked about John Nolan, who is the father of the New Urbanist Movement, which I'm part of. Um, I, too, with Josh, was, a, was sort of astonished by the pictures of density. When you have bad design, density makes bad design worse. When you have great design, it can make it better. Uh, when, I, when the Siemens, uh, when James Siemens and Margaret Rich called me and said, because I'd been a longtime friend of their family, they wanted some advice, uh, I went out and recruited the best designer in America, Lou Oliver, and one of the best builders, Bill Clark. Um, I think when you look at the actual area, uh, the proposal was to build 4.8 units to the acre, which is in the low to mid range density. Uh, that was the 57 number. Uh, that's 9,100 square feet per house. 552 of the 1,378 houses within the radius of Forest Hills, which is 3,250 feet, uh, are smaller. That's 40%, excuse me, the lots are smaller, higher density. 20% of the blocks in Forest Hills, uh, Josh McCarty did a map and showed it to me, are at a higher density than being proposed. Um, I think it's very important, and I would ask you all to support the comprehensive plan. There were over 50 meetings, public hearings, um, uh, wh whatever they were called, various get-togethers uh, <laughs> to prepare the plan, and it makes sense. And if we start taking it apart piece by piece, Durham will not be able to provide the housing that's necessary, and every house that's not built at Forest at Pinecrest means that another house is going to be displaced somewhere else in Durham. It could be West End or, or East Durham. And in the real estate development business, the value of the land is 20% of the sales price of the house. Every time you cut back a house, you increase, the, you have to increase the price of the house to pay for the land. If you had more houses and they were beautifully designed, after a certain number, the land is free. So everyone you've cut out 
requires the houses to be bigger and more expensive. And I don't think that's the right way for us to go. Thank you. Thank you. Let me clear something up, Mr. Chapman. I did not have your name on the list. Um, were you speaking? Yeah. Is there Chair Hyman. List? Chair Hyman, we had two individuals that signed up on the wrong sheets. Oh, okay. So, um, Thank Mr. you. Mr. Chapman had actually signed up on a different case, and we had Thank another you. individual that had signed up on a different case. Thank you so much. So we'll get you later tonight. <laughs> okay. Okay, and there is another individual that I have on this second list, uh, Penny. That's the right one. This one? He is not. Okay. Let me double check to see if Chris Woods is here because I did hear that Mr. Woods was no longer here. So you are. <laughs> okay. I think you're on the wrong sheet. Yeah. Okay, so Mr. Townsend, if you will come forward, I will put you on the correct sheet. Now you are four or? Thank you, I, I think I'm four. Okay. I know I am. I'm, <laughs> or am I against? That's what was very confusing today. I'm against the plume, so you can you can call. How do you want to describe okay. that? Okay. That would be. Yes. I, sorry, I apologize. Mm -hmm. My name's Doug Townsend. I live at 21 Oak Drive. I appreciate the opportunity to quickly get up here and speak to you all tonight. I'm first of all very pleased to hear that the Durham neighbors together and Phil Clark are talking. I find that great. I find it good for all of us. At the same time, I want all of you to know that there are many people in our neighborhood who don't have an idea what a flume is. Uh, I want to speak to the side of I have originally very much against this, but the more and more I've looked at it and looked at what Phil Clark's history is and the responsible development he does, I think 13 acres in an urban tier is very unique. It won't happen much around here. We have got to focus on quality builders that have plenty of capital behind them and can come in and do cluster development so that we can protect the trees and things that we have in this neighborhood. I'm not at all afraid about what Phil Clark will come in here and do in this neighborhood. I think he will be a great thing for Forest Hills. I just want all of you all to know that there are very many, a lot of us out here that feel very strongly that he will do good quality work for our neighborhood and we're very much supporting what he wants to do. So thank you very much. Thank you. Now, once again, I have completed the list, but I did have one individual who deferred time for rebuttal. Madam Chair, there were two individuals, Mr. Metzloff and Ms. Ferguson, who deferred time for rebuttal. Yes. And I'm going to take that time. Okay, Mr. <laughs> Bryan. A little bit of it, at least. Okay. Uh, th there are a couple of points that I think that, are, that need to be uh, addressed here that we'd like to say uh, in, in light of what the comments that have been made. First... The notion that somehow that there can be no, con we really didn't want to talk much about Pinecrest, and I don't want to talk about Pinecrest now, but, but the reality is, is that we'll, I was there last night and we'll be there tomorrow night, or whenever it is we can get together to meet again. We can continue meeting. Your vote on this will have no impact on that whatsoever. And uh, I would encourage you to go ahead and vote and, and, and be confident that, that it is going to have no impact whatsoever on our ability to have a conversation about this going on, uh, about the Pinecrest project, which will be before you in 60 days or 30 days, whenever it is. Um, the one thing I would like to point out, and, and except for Mr. Chapman, who I, I, I must admit is, is unique in this regard, nobody has come forward tonight to support the comprehensive plan as it stands now. And there's a reason for that. It makes no sense. There is, there, that for this area to be in 6 to 12 units, the official policy of the city and county of Durham right now is, is that all development and redevelopment in this area has to be a minimum of six units per acre. That's what the official policy of the city of Durham is right now. That makes no sense. It makes no sense for the city. It makes no sense for the, for the, uh, for the, for, for the neighborhood. Um, we have moved to try to bring this issue to a head and to move the, the issue forward. 
and we can talk about how the planning department is going to be addressing this over the next three to five years, but we don't have three to five years in the, in the, given the way the market is moving right now. We have plenty of open space. There's plenty of spaces that are up for redevelopment, and we're very concerned about that. And we want to be able to move forward now to address this, this uh, comprehensive plan future land use map issue. And as a result, we request that you support, that you vote in support of the Flum Amendment on the one hand, and on the other hand, that you vote. Putting this off is not going to make it change. It's not going to help. It's not going to do anything but, but drag things out. We're here to move forward. We would like to move forward. Does anybody else have anything they want to say? If not, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Bryan. That completes the list of individuals that I have to, who have signed up to speak. Um, once again, if there are no other individuals who wish to speak for or against, it is time for me to close the public hearing and give our commissioners an opportunity to ask questions. Now, if our commissioners uh, would like to ask individual uh, uh, a question of a particular individual, then they will have an opportunity to come forward and then speak to the commissioners. Otherwise, no other questions can be entertained after I close the public hearing. So I'm going to close the public hearing and give our commissioners an opportunity to ask questions. I'm going to start to my right. Okay. I'm going to start with Commissioner Al Turk, followed by Commissioner Johnson and Commissioner Bryan. Okay, uh, thank you, Vice Chair. And thanks to everyone uh, here for coming and for the emails and for the input. Uh, it's a, it, I think it's a good sign that we are all interested in how neighborhoods grow and how Durham grows. Um, it, it makes me a little anxious, but it uh, because we have to vote on these kind of things. But I, I, it is um, um, it is uh, it, it's a good sign of of, uh, of how things are going in Durham. Um, I have a, just a few questions: one for the applicant, and then a couple for staff, and then a few comments. So the question to the applicant: uh, we have here. In the staff report, some information about the meeting that you had in February. So, is that is that the only meeting that you had, the only public meeting that you had? And can you, is this the map that you showed at that meeting? It is, and okay. we uh, we held the public meeting in accordance with the requirements of the UDO at the uh, Episcopal Church. We had two meetings. Okay. And uh, we had about, I'd say, 50 people, maybe. Okay, but there were no alternative maps or there was no discussion about, you know, were, were there any conversations about which uh, parcels should go in which uh, category in terms of the flum? I mean, was that discussed? The proposal that we, that we floated at the time is the same proposal we floated today, which is to match the, the zoning <coughs> designations to the flum designations. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question for the transportation folks. Um, you know, someone mentioned that, uh, you know, University Drive is really congested. I looked online today. Um, it looks like, according to NCDOT, there's 18,000 uh, trips a day. Do you know what the capacity is of University Drive? And then I have a couple of follow-up questions, if that's, that's okay. We usually have these in the staff reports for rezonings, but I think for a plan amendment, we don't, so. Uh, yes, Bill Judge, Transportation. Uh, no, for plan amendments, we don't typically look at it, so I'm not exactly sure which uh, section of University Drive at 18,000. Um, it was right, right by the park, I guess. Um, or, you know, right there. So yeah. yeah. Uh, typically a, uh, a yeah, two-lane uh, road with uh, turn lanes, with the left turn lane at major intersections. Uh, is a has a capacity of um, I believe it's seventeen thousand seven hundred. Okay, so it's right, right a capa at above the capacity. capacity and right yeah. okay. And is there anything to preclude? I mean, is from an in infrastructure perspective, why are there no buses that go down? I mean, aside from whether uh, Go Durham wants to have buses go down there, is there something about the road itself that 
makes buses go down, you know, um, not a good idea down that road. On university? On university, yes. Uh, no, I mean, it is uh, business 15501. Um, the state has designated it. Um, there's a number of things that go into transit routing, and um, we're constantly looking and adjusting routes, but, yeah, there's no, no known prohibition. Okay, so in the future there could be public transit there, be. There's no, and, and there could be road improvements that would yeah. increase the capacity of the road? Is, or is there something about the, again, the, something about the road that would preclude that? Um, yeah, I'd have to go back and review our um, comprehensive transportation plan to see whether or not um, a pro widening would be proposed on university. Off the top of my head, I don't recall that, that it has been. Um, as part of that, they, I guess a determination has been made that, that uh, the existing cross-section, other than I think it's probably just got safety improvements, bicycle lanes, sidewalks. I see. Um, but not necessarily a widening to like a four-lane road. Okay. Thank you. Um, so that, so I, I also want, if you don't mind, Carla, I just have a couple of, um, so the map that we've been shown in our staff report is the comprehensive, it's the flum, right? It, it is the future land use map. Attachment um, one. I'm sorry? Are you referring to attachment one? Yes, attachment one, right. Uh, but there's no, there's no zoning designations on that map, right? But when, so again, I, I went online to make to, to check the zoning designations and most of the lots are zoned RS20, RS10, and RS8. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And so by, by just an estimate, I think half of the lots are RS10, RS8, which allow for somewhere up to four and maybe more units per acre. Is that correct currently? And then a third, I would say, are currently zoned RS20, <clears throat> which would allow up to two units an acre. <clears throat> right. And so there are only about 20 lots I counted that would allow for apartments and duplexes currently, it, which are the RU5 would allow for condos or and, and uh, duplexes. Down in the southern And portion. in the southern portion, that's right, yeah. where Summit and Roxboro intersect more or less. Um, and those, and there are already apartments there. Right, I mean, those have been built, I think those were built in the 1970s and 80s. Um, so, so it seems to me, well, let, I guess let me ask you another question. So if someone was to tear down a house on a half acre lot and wanted to build two units or a duplex, they would, they would not be able to do so under most, under an RS-20 designation, correct? They would have to come to us and the city council to get approving for, approval for a rezoning. That's correct. That's correct, right? So in almost every, for every, almost every parcel that we are under consideration here, if someone wanted to build something a little bit more dense, they would have to come and get approval for a rezoning, right? Right, okay. But part of the problem is if they do that, they would have to be consistent with the comprehensive plan, which says you have to have at least six units. And I think that's where there's some of the frustration. But having said that, so, so there is inconsistency, but having said that, um, the, the impetus is still on the developer to show to us and to prove to us that it makes sense to have something more dense in Forest Hills. Is that because they would have to come here and, and, and ask for a rezoning? Okay. So, you know, I, I guess I mentioned all of that to, to say that we that again, the impetus is still on the developers to show us that more density is appropriate for this neighborhood. I'm, I'm just very hesitant to vote in favor of an application that decreases the density of the flum this drastically. Um, you know, I, I think the proposed de decrease from six to 12 units an acre to less than two units an acre in most, or in a third of Forest Hills, and to less than four units an acre in more than half of Forest Hills, where it's orange right now, just seems too drastic of a drop uh, to me. If the proposal was to, to, to go from 6 to 12 to 4 to 8, uh, which is the medium density, res or sorry, the low medium density, which is something that Jake mentioned, right? I think that would be a, it's, that would seem to me like a compromise between the flum, which seems maybe a little out of place, and the current 
zoning designations of RS-20 and RS-10. So, you know, the FLUM, as the name implies, is forward-looking, and I think that we should allow for some increased density in this neighborhood. As, you know, Durham grows, every neighborhood is going to have to bear some of the burden. Um, and I'm not suggesting that 6 to 12 units make sense in this neighborhood, but I do not think that less than two units an acre makes sense for a good portion of it, and less than four units an acre, you know, it makes sense for more than half of it. Um, I also, just a couple of things about process. I don't see the urgency in this. Um, I, um, I looked at the county tax records, and I think there have been 16 new developments in Forest Hills since 2005. That's approximately one a year, and they're almost all of them are single-family homes. The, it, it does not seem to me like there are these, you know, these developers coming in and building high-density apartments in Forest Hills, and that it is threatening the, the character of the neighborhood currently as it stands. So for me, the urgency is not there, and I'm not suggesting that it's not going to change in the next 10 to 25 years. Um, and I'll just, again, just, just, I, I think we should proceed cautiously. A number of people have said this, that rather than focus on density, we could focus on design, like some people have mentioned, like um, I think Connie and Josh mentioned. And this, I think, can be done through the NPO process. I voted for the Old West NPO, not only because of the contents of it, but I think because of the process. There were multiple meetings, it was a multi-year process, and there were compromises made. I think there is, you know, people here for it and against this flum, and I think that we need a, if we're going to make a decision about, you know, a considerable portion in a, you know, 220 acres and make this drastic cut, I think it needs to be a longer process, both with planning staff and with you know, multiple meetings, and, and, and I think for that reason, as it stands right now, unless I'm convinced otherwise, I'm, I'm, we'll probably vote uh, against this. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, uh, Vice Chairwoman. Um, so I, I'll start by saying that I concur with uh, almost all of the, the comments that uh, my colleague here just made. But let me start by just thanking everyone for coming out and sharing your thoughts and perspectives on the application that is before us tonight. Uh, I, want, I have a, a series of questions, but for, uh, for the sake of allowing uh, my colleagues here to chime in before one starts falling asleep, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll make a comment and then and pose a question or two to staff. Uh, I want to start off by saying that uh, from both the proponents and opponents of this uh, application before us tonight, I think it's fair, and to my, to my colleagues on the commission, I think it's fair to say that this is not a conversation about directly about affordable housing. Uh, I would even be pressed to, stay, to say that this conversation and discussion that we're having tonight is not about workforce housing. This is a unique situation about a higher echelon neighborhood in Durham, North Carolina, that is looking to either preserve or maintain a quality of life that they have come to value. So there are tangential uh, uh, implications regarding affordable housing, as was stated uh, by one of the commenters, um, that for if if someone is looking to put a high a high price house somewhere in Durham and Forest Hill, which is a repository of such houses, is not a viable option. It's going to go somewhere in Durham, and that's going to take a space for a potential affordable housing or. Uh, or a workforce housing unit here in Durham. So there are implications for what this discussion is about affordable housing, but it's not about affordable housing for this farm change. Uh, so I'll just pose a question uh, to staff. Uh, a number of the commenters tonight noted, uh, you know, issues about maintaining the aesthetics, uh, you know, the feel of the Forest Hill community and neighborhood. And so my question to you, just for clarity and correction of based on some assumptions that I may have, is that will changing the FLOM as proposed tonight create any barriers or restrictions in regards to the aesthetic nature of what could be developed on land? Carla Rosenberg, Planning Department. So um, our Unified Development Ordinance uh, provides infill standards for new development. Um, 
within existing neighborhoods um, within the urban tier. And so those infill standards regarding setback, um, building size, et cetera, would need to be met. Um, they don't specifically address um, materials um, and such, but those could be addressed for multifamily development in the future. Um, we don't currently have infill standards that address um, those factors, but we could um, develop those in the future. Um, we also have other tools, such as local historic districts that allow, it's an overlay, a zoning overlay, that could um, be used also to protect specifically the historic character. Thank you. So, and just so I can confirm that I heard what you just said, so. Uh, may I if, clarify one thing for the record, Mr. Yes. Johnson? Yes. So we, we the state, um, our enabling legislation from the state of North Carolina does not allow us to regulate um, aesthetics on single family. Right. Now, you may or may not have seen in the past a development plan that's come through that may have design standards for such. That is totally a voluntary proffer that a developer could make, but just run of the mill, straight standard UDO language or everyday unified development ordinance regulations does not address aesthetics for single family. Thank you very much. So I'm just sorry to stay there. You may. So just so I'm hearing, uh, confirming that I hear you correctly. If we were to vote in favor of this flom request change request tonight, we still could not leave here and ensuring uh, members of the Forest Hills community that stucco or roof lines or whatever it is from an aesthetic standpoint or you know what makes it Forest Hill from a, beyond the density would be a guaranteed outcome for whatever comes onto a lot that's torn down and rebuilt or an empty lot now. So am I hearing you saying that there are other processes or check boxes that must be met beyond meeting the flum or com uh, complying with that in order to ensure that that is a, a, an outcome in this community? So Carla Rosenberg, Planning Department, um, the flum does not dictate anything about aesthetics. Um, if somebody were to uh, choose to develop something and would need, require a zoning change, then they could um, have a development plan associated with that zoning change and then proffer certain um, things regarding aesthetics or um, building size or anything. There are a lot of um, factors that could be addressed in a development plan. Thank you very much. And so um, in my concluding comment, I will say that one of the concerning um, outcomes from this request tonight is the reality that what is being asked for is actually a reduction in the density for this particular community. And when we're, we're looking at where Durham is going, in 2005, no one, I, was, I, was, I came to, back to Durham in 2012, but back in 2005, I don't think anyone would have foreseen just the rapid growth that's happening uh, in this city, across this city. And so the reality, my, my take is that we all, no matter where we live in Durham, have to be willing to share in what it means to grow. And so the question becomes, where is the give and the take in regards to the density issue if you're asking the commission to vote in favor of reducing what could become a part of the Forest Hill community versus, and I agree, the, the, the flom as it stands could be seen as a little extreme with the six to 12, but if you was asking me as a test question, where would be the middle ground? It wouldn't be below the starting minimum. It would be somewhere in the, in the middle, and that's something that's concerning to me. And, and with that, I'll see my time. Thank you. Commissioner Bryan, followed by Commissioner Satterfield. Thank you, Madam Chair. I also want to thank everybody for coming out tonight and for all your messages. In fact, I don't think I have an email folder that's ever been this full. Uh, I have some, well, one of the things that concerns me is that although I know most of you didn't come down here tonight to even consider Pinecrest, unfortunately, this request for the tier change and the uh, Pinecrest thing do seem to be tied together. And that bothers me because we've heard your side. I would like to hear their side. Uh, 
I've heard a little bit about it, but I haven't heard the full thing. I don't know for sure exactly what they might propose, what might be on a development plan, et cetera, et cetera. And for me, in fairness to the effort that they have put in, I would like to hear what they have to say before I would vote on what you've asked for. That's just me. Uh, but there's some other things too. Uh, I think that uh, the suburban tier that you're asking for may or may not, well, first of all, I, I think the boundary that you have proposed might need to be looked at. I heard what Mr. Hale said, what you're proposing doesn't fit with the part that he lives in. We've received emails from a number of people who say we don't, we absolutely don't want to be a part of it. If they're on the edge of what you could exclude them. Uh, and one thing that bothered me a little bit is that the letter I got from a law firm representing a property owner saying that the owner don't want to be in this. Uh, that made me wonder if you, if it was approved, would somebody turn around and sue you? But I don't know. Uh, another consideration for me is that I'm, I'm not sure that you're aware, perhaps, of what can be done in the suburban district. Uh, I've lived in, I live in a suburban tier of Durham, and I've seen development go on very close to me. If you care to drive down to where NC 54 and Barbie Road intersect and take a look around, you can see something about what I'm talking about. That's possible in the suburban tier, and I don't think some of it, the way it's done and where I live, would really do anything good for Forest Hills, but it would be allowed in the suburban tier. And I think that you need to give that some thought. Uh, in terms of infill development and residential developments, I've looked at my copy of the UDO, and for both the suburban tier and the urban tier, the infill standards uh, really a, apply to multifamily development on a site that's less than four acres. If somebody puts together a piece of property that's more than four acres, then presumably these standards, you know, they're out the window. And the second paragraph under both suburban and urban is that you can make neighborhood specific modifications to add further protection through the NPO. And quite frankly, I think the NPO is really the best way to go in this case. Now, I also agree with Commissioner Al Turk. I'm not sure that I see the urgency of this matter either. Uh, I don't really want to vote tonight because if you really want me to vote tonight, I would also probably vote no. I would rather defer this. Now, I know that a lot of you don't want to think about having it deferred, but it is part of the process. The last time as a private citizen, I was involved in uh, a de the development process. I think all told I made seven trips down to city hall before we finally got the matter resolved. Uh, so if you're really keen on what you're doing, you may have to accept the fact that you'll be here a few more times, not necessarily before us all the time, but also before council. Uh, and then I think there's a larger issue here as well, uh, as Mr. Bryant showed in one of his slides. There are a number of neighborhoods like Forest Hills in the sense that they're really suburban in the way that primarily suburban in the way they've been developed, but they're in the ur urban tier. Uh, what do we do about them? I mean, it, it looks like when we started drawing circles on maps, you know, these 
the neighborhoods got included in those circles. But did we really mean to say that uh, ultimately these neighborhoods are going to be urban densities? And I would like to say I don't think we did, but to be honest about it, I don't think we gave the matter that much thought. And I think what's lacking uh, to support the flume in, in this instance is that we don't have policy in the plan. And if we don't have policy in the plan, we may not have much in the UDO. Uh, we just don't have the policies to tell us what to do. So I would also encourage you to think about potential policy changes that might be made to help protect neighborhoods that are in this situation. And uh, I think that's about all I want to say right now, but uh, I'm, when the appropriate time comes, I will be, if asked to, make a motion to defer. Commissioner Satterfield. Um, thank you, Vice Chair Hyman, um, and thanks everybody for coming out and taking the time to speak on this issue, which you're very passionate about, um, as you should be. Um, though the Pinecrest question has prompted the Flume Amendment request, uh, to me, I see them as really two different issues. Um, and so um, I would probably not be in favor of a deferral because I think this sort of issue really is applicable to a lot of neighborhoods in Durham that aren't looking at a Pinecrest potential development. Um, but to protect natural resources and for other reasons, I believe we need to encourage and fill in higher density development where we have the infrastructure and services to support that. Um, I also believe that it's important to preserve the unique character of our historic neighborhoods. Um, but in balance, I don't believe that a flum amendment is the best solution at this time. I really um, believe that a neighborhood protection overlay or a local historic district is a much better tool um, for doing those kinds of things. I realize that the Forest Hills neighborhood is in a National Register Historic District, but that does not provide the kinds of protections that the neighbors are, have expressed um, that they're concerned about most tonight. Um, I heard that the uh, Neighborhood Protection Overlay District is being explored, um, but I wasn't clear as to whether um, the alternative approach that's mentioned in the staff report, the local historic district designation, is being explored, and so that was my question to staff um, as to whether that was also uh, on the table as a potential strategy. Okay. So, um, Carla Rosenberg, Planning Department, uh, we have received a neighborhood protection overlay application, but we have not received any request or petition for a local history district. Thank you. And I think that's all I had to say and ask. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner um, Durkin. I think my thoughts have been expressed by my fellow commissioners so far. I would agree that if asked, I would defer the decision. And if asked not to defer, I would vote no. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start on my left. Any other commissioners would like to speak? Um, I'll start with Commissioner Miller, then Commissioner Gibbs. Anybody else? Okay, and then Commissioner Kitchen. So I'm going to go very briefly, uh, and I want to use the time I've got actually to talk to my fellow commission members, but I want to talk to you folks first. I try very hard to respond to everybody that sends me a letter or an email. Mm -hmm. I didn't get to you all this time, and I apologize. If you wrote to me, in the last couple of days, I tried to go back and forth and, and read everything and, and respond. And I hope I responded to a lot of you. But I don't think my position on this is a mystery. I am for you. There is a problem here that's got to be fixed. I am also very interested in seeing the appropriate development of the Pinecrest property. And so I like what the developer has shown. And so far, I'm for the Clark proposal too. I want to be able to solve both problems. And I don't think voting tonight on the Flum thing uh, 
is the way to go to get both of the things I want. And so, uh, and I've said that to you in emails uh, over the last few days. So I want to now talk to my fellow commission members and say that I agree with Mr. Bryan uh, that our comprehensive plan is a mess. It's an ass. And here's why. It doesn't make sense. And, but I think it doesn't make sense on a lot of levels. First of all, if you read our zoning code and don't look at the maps, you see that we have a tier system of increasing of decreasing density from downtown it makes sense and we then then if you read our UDO uh, we have created zones zones with R I mean zones with uh, with a U in them those are the urban tier zones and zones with an S in them those are the suburban tier zones and so that makes sense too we've got these concentric circles and in an abstract sense it all makes a lot of sense and you read the comprehensive plan, and it's got provisions for the urban tier and a vision for the suburban tier. And then you look at what we put on the map. And we did it at the exact same time that we adopted the comprehensive plan and the UDO. We did it all at one time. We created a system that has a certain, uh, somebody said, elegant uh, sort of uh, beauty to it. And then we immediately ignored it. And we didn't explain why. We put neighborhoods that are developed as suburbia in the urban tier, and we zoned them suburban, even though they are in the urban tier. I think there are good reasons to do that, but we didn't say why. And not by not saying why, we set our policies against each other. I've been calling it a policy dis dissonance that has to be resolved. We cannot finish the business that you folks have begun without a resolution. Now, whether it is a, a, a tier amendment or a flum amendment, that's one way to go. Uh, the staff, it obviously disturbs the staff. They don't like the island. I have to say I don't like the island either. Uh, but I understand that you didn't want to speak for anybody except for you, Forest Hills. I get that. Um, and so connecting the island to the other tier might have been an overreach beyond your, uh, your writ and beyond your ability to pull off. I get that. Uh, I want to fix this, and there are lots of ways to do it. I'll point out to you, it's not, we've been calling this a flum amendment. This is way more than that. It's a tier change amendment, too. And why do we have to change the tier? Because you can't just change the map. There is a table in the comprehensive plan that sets the minimum density for the urban tier at six units an acre and allows it to go up from there. That six units an acre is unsatisfactory to you when you discovered it. It was unsatisfactory to Mr. Clark when he discovered it because it wasn't the Pinecrest development that he had in mind when he started uh, uh, drawing plans on a map. Uh, and he has done everything he can in order to game these rules in order to get the number of units down to something that you can accept. You're very close. I applaud you for the meetings. I believe you're going to get there. So I want to see you in the next 30 days, 60 days, however long it takes, however long you're willing to give it, to reach that agreement and come up with something for, that gets the Pinecrest rezoning done. These are two issues that should be separate but aren't separate. You can come and say, we care about the future of Forest Hills. Well, so does... Mr. Clark, but he cares about the future of his Pinecrest project. So it may be a separate issue to you, but it is a, it is a fully engaged uh, uh, pig bacon sort of issue with Mr. Clark. And so uh, it can be, you know, the, the chicken is involved with the egg, but the pig is committed to the bacon. Um, <laughs> and so I would like to see you settle your deal with, with Mr. Clark, and then bring this whole issue about the comprehensive plan, not the flum. That's too <coughs> small a concept. The comprehensive plan and your neighborhood and my neighborhood in Watts Hill and Dale and the neighborhood next door at Long Meadow and Moorhead Hill and Duke Park and Trinity Park, all <coughs> the neighborhoods that are in the urban tier that are zoned with our suburban zones. We've got to have clear policies in our comprehensive plan that's, that create the, the quilt 
that Mr. Clayton talked about, because it's not a blank sheet. It's not, we're not starting from scratch. We have a built environment that is dear to us and defines the Durham that we know. We have to be able to protect it. Our comprehensive plan falls way short of that. It is a mess. I urge you all to look at the comprehensive plan for Winston-Salem. It talks about all the issues we say we care about in our comprehensive plan, but then it goes on to talk about how we do not have to sacrifice one thing in order to obtain another. We can have both. We can thread needles if we have to. And they have a whole chap chapter on neighborhood preservation. Now, I've heard people talk tonight about how the real solution here is an NPO or a local historic district. Well, those would be great. And when you bring your NPO to us, you'll have my full attention. But it doesn't solve the problem of the comprehensive plan and suburban neighborhoods in the urban tier. It doesn't fix it. And if all we do is put an NPO on this and not fix the other thing, then we have failed. We have failed in our duty here. You have failed in your duty out there as citizens because you are now all deputies in the planning process. <laughs> uh, no. and and. <laughs> and Durham plans best when its citizens engage in a knowing and meaningful way. And that's what's happened here. This is the big plus in this, because we have now have people who have crossed the threshold in terms of commitment. Uh, so let's, commission members, join me in deferring this for 60 days. Let these neighbors make their peace with Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark isn't interested in six units an acre. He's actually on their side. They just have to resolve their case. Let's all come in together uh, and then deal with this issue straightforward, whether we change the flum, whether we change the tier boundaries, or whether or not we write pro-neighborhood policies that explain what we meant when we said a neighborhood that we zoned at two units an acre should be zoned for six units an acre. We haven't resolved that. Uh, I agree. I don't think that we meant that that neighbor that urban tier suburban neighborhoods should go away but we without explaining what we meant when we did that that's the implication that we have created uh, and it worries me because that's not that means that every time somebody wants to do a rezoning in your neighborhood they have to come in at a density that's going to be unacceptable to you the cat fight will never stop the fur will fly for years why do that if we believe that forest hills and Watts Hillendale and Moorhead Hill and all the other neighborhoods similarly situated are worth pres preserving and worth keeping because they're on the ground and they're functioning and they contribute to the fa fabric of our community, well then let's create policies and our comprehensive plans that says this is what we're going to do with these neighborhoods. We can do that. We're that smart. If they did it in Winston-Salem, we can do it in Durham. So let's vote to give this 60 days and come back, uh, get, get the rezoning done, and get this thing fixed, get this big issue fixed, and still talk about local historic districts and still talk about MPO. Thank Vice, you, Vice Commissioner Miller, uh, Commissioner Gibbs, and then Commissioner Kitchen. <laughs> well, I'm certainly not going to follow up with any recipes on how to cook a chicken and, and pork. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, there have been some really good comments tonight, and I love Forest Hills. Uh, I know the, the, the developers and the early designers there, and I'm not bragging about my age, but <laughs> I, I am glad to be talking about it. But I, I do go along with... Uh, Putting this off for for 60 days, uh, there is this overarching concern, and I think it does need to be addressed more broadly uh, with the FLUM and our comprehensive plan. Uh, when they drew the concentric circles, that was, you know, that's a, a quick way of looking at things. I'm sure when it was drawn, uh, there were things that could not be settled at that time. And, and, and you were reminded earlier about you, you may not want to come back another two, maybe three times. Uh, 
but part of the process in uh, in in making headway in making our flum more applicable, uh, fairer, easier to understand and work with uh, is going to is part of the process, and it's going to take some time. Uh, well. Every, I agree with just about every comment that was made, uh, my colleagues up on the, the dice here. Uh, I may have disagreed with a thing or two, and the same thing with you folks. But we do have, even though it's not an agendized uh, subject, we can't overlook the elephant in the room, which is Pinecrest. And it cannot be settled until this is. Uh, if it were to be approved, which I, we'll just have to wait and see how the votes go, then that eliminates Pinecrest in its present uh, proposal. And it is a great plan. If y'all haven't seen it, I do hope it, it becomes public somehow because and, and but at any rate uh, I would I would I do think that uh, a 60 day deferral would really help communication it would certainly help me to understand more about how this thing can be done and there is no hurry nobody is going to overrun Forest Hills uh, you can't build anything on either of the parks. It's in a flood zone. Uh, nobody's going to build a whole bunch of... I don't think there's anybody here that's going to sell their property, get together and sell their property so that some kind of gigantic uh, development can be done. That means they're going to have to fix the roads all the way down. That's not going to happen. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to stop with all these details because it's, uh, I just would like to have more time. And I think we all need more time to negotiate, to uh, come to some conclusions, uh, because I, I, I agree with Commissioner Miller. I, there is a solution, and, and we're almost there. But anyway, thank you, Mitch. Thank you, Commissioner Gibbs, um, Commissioner Kitchen, uh, Commissioner Williams. Yes. Um, first and foremost, let me say thank you for coming out. Um, I read every single email, both for and against. And I am a lifer in Durham. Grew up off of Barbie Road. Forest Hills has always been one of my favorite neighborhoods. Um, that and Hope Valley. And I hear you. I hear you loud and clear. I hear what you're trying to protect. I understand why. I am um, I'm a fan of architecture, but it's not about aesthetics. It's about in the fall when the leaves change, being able to drive down University Drive and to walk outside of your house and see the leaves change and what that looks like and having that change. I'm also a student of Durham. I took the opportunity to learn about Mr. Spaulding and his history in Durham, and also uh, Miss Seaman, the departed, and who she was and what she meant, and to know that her neighbor is one of the Dukes and one of the founding members of Duke University. And that history is not to be compromised on any platform at any way. And I understand growth in Durham is happening. I, I get it, but at what cost? Durham has not seen growth before like this that hasn't happened. Unfortunately, many of us were not alive when it happened, but it did happen before. And then the downturn hit. And then we were stuck with houses that nobody lived in, and now we're revamping them, and now we're talking about gentrification. My mind is made up on this issue, whether we vote now or whether we vote in 60 days. But understand, Forest Hills, I hear you. These, these are my comments. I hear you. I do think that a compromise from coming down from 
possibly 60 to 50 to 40, and now 35 to 38, that's huge for any developer to be willing to do that. It takes a lot of consideration into terms of how you guys feel, the respect that you have for your neighborhood, and what you're unwilling to compromise on. I think that that is a substantial starting point, and I think it, it takes some consideration. I think that looking at it, being willing to understand that Forest Hills will remain Forest Hills, at least for what is being proposed right now. And I understand the need to come in and to say, well, we don't want six to 12 homes on an acre. I don't. I don't want six to 12 homes on an acre where I live. And I live right off of Highway 55. So I couldn't imagine what that would be like. But at the same time, I think that you have to be willing to bend, not for the sake of the fact that Durham is growing, but for the sake of a developer that's willing to put in the work. And from the standpoint of someone who designs homes for a living, that is impeccable. You can't you won't find that anywhere else. You won't find another developer that's gonna come in that's willing to take this much time to hear you and be willing to compromise. You might, but who knows? I don't think that some people will be willing to bend. And I think that if it comes down to a vote of whether or not it takes more time and you're willing to go to the mat, then I think it should be considered. I think it's worth the wait. But I definitely understand and I applaud you for your efforts because this is not easy. This is not easy by far. This is a, a very time consuming process and there's a lot of you all who are invested and who are here. It's not like it's five or six people. It, there's a lot that's here. And I think that if you've come this far, then I think you could go a little bit further and we can find the compromise. And I think that we can fix it. I think that if you come to us with more than, if we have to consider an NPO, or if we have to consider tier changes, whatever it takes, I'm about Durham. I'm not about a neighborhood. I'm not about a developer. I'm about Durham. The Durham I grew up in, the Durham that brought people here. People didn't move to Durham because houses were $450,000. They moved to Durham because of what the characteristics are, and I think that we have to preserve that. And preserving Trinity, and preserving Forest Hills, and the characteristics of what takes it, and understanding who Mr. Spalding is, understanding who uh, the department seaman is, is a part of what Durham is. And I think that you guys are on the right track. I just think that it's gonna take a little bit more time. It's gonna take a little bit more effort. And if you guys are willing to do that and to keep going and not just depart what, what you've done, I think that you, you'll get there. You've got some good people on your side and there's a lot of character in those emails. So those are my statements. Thank you, Commissioner Williams. Let me double check to make sure there are other commissioners who would like to speak. Uh, Commissioner Johnston. Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, just a follow up to comments made by um, Commissioner Miller. Uh, in your urging uh, and encouraging the members of the commission to vote for a continuance, um, are there what is it that, are you assuming, or are you hoping, or is there something that you perceive that we'll be seeing differently in regards to this particular request in 30 or 60 days that could potentially change the conversation somewhat? Or in, in your acts, what, are, what will we be seeing different in regards to this as we consider the pine crest that could be something that could influence how we're thinking today, whether for or against. So thank you for the question. What I see we can do with the time, we may not, we may fail, but I don't think we will. Uh, I see uh, the Pinecrest neighbors and the Pinecrest developer working out their vision and coming together on a vision for the Pinecrest property. Uh, that then will, if they do that, for that to be meaningful, there will have to be an adjustment somehow to the current uh, tier boundary change and flum request change. So that's one change that will have to occur in order to accommodate whatever agreement that's made. Uh, it's also time to consider some of the other issues that came up with the flum change. But the main thing it does is it 
turns the developer from somebody who has to argue against his neighbors in order to preserve his ability uh, and his vision for the Pinecrest property, it takes him out as a, an opponent to the Flum request. And then we can talk about the Flum on its merits without having to worry or without having participants, not necessarily on the commission, but in the audience of what the Flum request's implications are for a particular development project. Uh, I would love to, right, we've talked about this as being two separate issues. It's not. I can assure you to Mr. Clark, they, these issues are deeply intertwined. Uh, if we can take his anxiety away so that he becomes a, a Forest Hills neighbor and not a Pinecrest developer, then I think we can, uh, we can narrow down and drill down on these comprehensive plan, suburban tier neighborhood issues. Uh, and talk about ways to fix it. It also, I hope, will give our staff an opportunity to begin a conversation to talk about the shortcomings of the comprehensive plan in this area and to propose to us perhaps other ways to go. Uh, if we get to a place where we protect uh, neighborhoods in the urban tier, I don't care how we do it, uh, whether it's a uh, a change of, of lines on a map, or whether it's new text in the comprehensive plan, I'm interested. Uh, but right now, but I will say this, that I'm not going to rest until we do make those changes. Um, I think it's bad policy to have no policy, and I will reject any attempt to have a policy that says, because we have a minimum density figure of six, uh, traditional historic neighborhoods in the urban tier must in time go away because they do not represent our vision for the future. I see our historic traditional neighborhoods in the urban tier as part of our future. Follow up, follow up. Thank you. And I feel this is important because we may have the cart before the horse here is we are urging for a continuance, but we've heard from the presenters of the request tonight that they would not like that as a option going forward. So my question to uh, Mr. Bryan, one is, it's a um, multi-part question. One is, what would be your response to that? Secondly, you, were, you noted that an NPO application has been submitted and what is uh, acts as a flaw in this tonight is what's in the NPO. So how does that impact uh, what your West Bend acts? And let, let me take the second question first because I think y'all need to understand the NPO process a little bit better. Uh, the staff hates it, and the staff has tried to fight us on the NPO all the way down the line. Uh, and if you look at your staff report, uh, the NPO wasn't one of the options that the staff suggested. Uh, it was our efforts before the Joint City County Planning Committee that caused the JCCPC to prioritize mm -hmm. our NPO Otherwise, the staff would have buried it, and we wouldn't have had an NPO for the next two, three years. And as it stands, we probably won't get into the 2019, 2020 budget for the NPO process anyway. So our NPO process is probably two years out. Mm -hmm. It's going to take that long, uh, especially if we have to, with due respect to the staff, who I work with all the time and I like very much, but the reality is is that they, they despise it and they are fighting us at every single step of the way. So the NPO isn't gonna happen anytime reasonably soon to, to, to solve this problem. Uh, in the meantime, there are many sites that are ripe for redevelopment. Uh, the ob most obvious one is the old Peterson House, uh, which can be torn down and turned into many, many, many lots. Uh, and so um, th this, is, this is a problem which exists throughout Forest Hills. And if the policy of the city is to demand a minimum of six units per acre, it is a serious problem and it is an imminent problem given the heat in the market right now. You're right, if the market collapses tomorrow, then uh, nobody will want to build anything. So <laughs> it won't be a problem. So th with regard to your NPO, that, that's the answer to that question. With regard to the, the, the request for deferral, um, we have heard what you've said and your desire to have us have this discussion in a context where everything is still pending rather than something has moved on. 
and uh, my instructions have have changed, and we are not we we do not oppose a deferral for sixty days. Mm -hmm. So if you all choose to defer it, we will we will accept that. I mean, we accept we have no choice but to accept it. But uh, we would be we would support that if that's what y'all want to do. Uh, we're anxious to try to deal with Pinecrest as well and try to get it to a place where everybody can learn to live with it. Um, and God knows we've spent a lot of time talking about it with folks, uh, and a lot of a lot of shouting has gone on, but that's part of the, the deal. Um, but I, I would like to pick up on what Mr. Miller said. It's it's extremely <laughs> this, this this I was. Uh, Maybe some, some of you were here in 2005 along with me, and I remember when they did this, I was on one of the, I, I was back here back in the 90s when we did the 2020 plan. And I was on one of the subgroups that worked on the 2020 plan. And, you know, in 2005, nobody paid any attention to the comprehensive plan because the comprehensive plan was a, a very theoretical document. Um, it wasn't hooked into the zoning ordinance in any meaningful way. Nobody had to make any consistency statements or anything like that. Um, and it was it was a very gross thing. Nobody participated in any of the, Nobody even knew that there were hearings going on. Nobody even knew there were meetings going on. Um, and, you know, we had a very, what I would call, very elementary process that we went through. The 2020 plan was all about compact neighborhoods for, to build that we built for to try to encourage development around places where trains were going to come but never came. Um, and the, you know, and then this plan was all about trying to revitalize the urban core in this very crude way by drawing circles around it and saying that's the way it's going to be. It's, it's not the way to plan a city like Durham. Durham is a quilt. It is a patchwork. We need multiple urban cores. We need multiple suburban cores. We don't, it's, you can't, this is not Kansas where we're just going to start off in the middle of downtown and then we're going to build it straight out from the edge. Um, and so uh, it, is, it is essential that we address this. We tried to address it by hooking the existing, hooking the, the, the land use plan to the existing zoning of the tracks that were there. It doesn't prevent anybody from coming in and rezoning. It doesn't prevent anybody, and you know this, you see this all the time. It doesn't prevent anybody from coming in and doing a comprehensive plan amendment to change it to a different tier. But this this almost rigid this rigid, uh, almost religiosity about the plan that somehow we can't we can't change the, we can't create an island why not? Durham is full of islands. They talk about the, the distance between Forest Hills and downtown. That's true, except that there's a major river that runs through the middle of downtown, separating Forest Hills from downtown, called 147. It's not like you just walk on over to downtown from Forest Hills. And these, these major impediments are things that, that need to be taken into account in terms of planning, and it needs to be planned on a neighborhood-by-neighborhood, on a, on a neighborhood, area-by-area basis. If, if getting us together so that we can work things out with Pinecrest, hopefully, will, 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 will bring us to a point where we can do, make meaningful changes for Forest Hills in the future to help protect that neighborhood, we're willing to take a 60-day deferral. I hope that answers your question, sir. Thank you, Vice Chairwoman. And with Thank that you, comment, Commissioner I'm... Johnson. Commissioner Bryan, did you also have comments? Yeah, I just wanted, well, first of all, it's been a long time since I've run into somebody who worked on the 2020 plan. <laughs> 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 um, I just wanted to make a comment about the MPO, and I'm sure that staff is not going to like hearing me say that, but uh, you guys need to keep the pressure on. Uh, mm -hmm start with the Joint City-County Planning Committee and keep the pressure on. The last MPO that we actually considered on this commission, to me, one of the shortcomings is, is that the application had been filed at one time with a lot of signatures on it, but by the time they started working on it, about half of the people were no longer part of that neighborhood. So keep the pressure on. Thank you. There are no other comments. I'd like to make just one brief comment. I'd just like to thank all of you for your participation and for your very thoughtful participation in this process and your professional decorum around this very passionate issue. Uh, it is my task at this time to call for a motion. Madam Chair, if I may. 
I move that we reopen the public hearing that you previously closed and that we continue it for uh, for two cycles or until the commission's meeting in the second Tuesday of October. Second. It has been moved and properly second. Are you ready for the question? Because I did see. Yeah. Yes. Can we have a discussion on that? Or can I, because I, I wanted to ask the applicant a question and then, or did, have I lost my chance to do that? It's okay if, it, if I have. I'll ask him. Well, if there's some unreadiness as far as your. Yes, there is some unreadiness. On my part. Then I'm going to. <laughs> I'm going to be ready now. I want to be ready. I would request that you, if you are going to continue the item, that you continue it to a date certain, not just two cycles or 60 days. And that I did continue it to the commission's meeting in October on the second Tuesday. The That's 9th. a date certain. The 9th. I just wanted to make sure we got that on the record that it's October 9th. I didn't hear that, so excuse me. I apologize. Uh, staff, well, let me ask a, another question at this time since I have some unreadiness for the vote. Do I need to have the motion withdrawn? To start again, I do have some unreadiness on the part of one of our commissioners. Um, and he can ask the question. No, he can okay. he can ask his question if 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 Mr. Miller. I have no objection. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm All sorry right. about my about my unreadiness. Just keep it short. Okay, I'll keep it very short. So the last thing that you said, Mr. Bryan, is that, you know, you you want the deferral if it means that you want you can negotiate with the Pinecrest developers. It sounds to me, and it sounds to me like from other discussions that I've had from with others is that it is about getting them to agree to a certain number of units and, and other things. Do you envision in the next two months that you are going to revisit the application itself, your application, or is it just that you want to come up with some settlement well, with the Pinecrest developers? Yeah, no, I, I actually, we, <laughs> we, we what we what what I've what we've heard is that you want us to come together and, and you want us to take sixty days to talk to the Pinecrest developers. That's what I've heard the, the board say. That, that, that's not no, well. That's what other people on the yeah. board have said. Now, with regard to your question, um, I think it's a the uh, the answer is yes. I mean, there, there's no if 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 what if to make this a more palatable and more effective um, planning tool. What we need to do is address some of the areas around the edges, or uh, otherwise, uh, you know, increase, you know, the the, the density to four uh, an acre, whatever the you know, to, to the medium density residential, or whatever the case may be, okay. in in certain areas. Okay. We, uh, you you have to understand when 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 we started this process, we did so. With, with the intent of not violating anybody's existing rights, anybody's existing land use expectations. So we didn't go in and say, well, down here by the park, we think it ought to be denser. And, and without, you know, and, and like try to in, engage in a long discussion of, and, and try to up, increase people's density down there or to deal with other things. So everything that we've done matches the existing zoning. Some of the some of what's built may not match the existing zoning. But what we did was we tried to create status quo in order to create uh, to to recognize the status quo in order to create a um, the a policy impetus in, in that would require developers to to come in and explain why they should go against the status quo rather than a policy impetus that it, Suggests and in fact encourages redevelopment at four to at, at uh, six to twelve units per acre. If you see what I'm saying, which is what we have now, and to to uh, to us, which makes no sense. So, given uh, given that situation, if if other people would like to come in and say we would prefer our neighborhood to be something different than what it's zoned as, uh, we wouldn't have a problem listening to that and would be willing to consider yeah, that. I believe I think that's a fair statement. Okay, so we're open, wide open for that type of discussion. Thank you. Now I'm ready. <laughs> All right. Thank you. For then um, we do have a motion by Commissioner Miller, uh, and it was second by Commissioner Bryan, that we have a 60-day continuance with a specified date, which is? October 9. October 9. Um, we'll have a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Alturk. Yes. 
Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Bryan? Yes. Commissioner Satterfield? No. Commissioner Durkin? Yes. Commissioner Hyman? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Kinchin? Yes. Commissioner Van? Yes. Commissioner Gibbs? Yes. Commissioner Williams? Yes. Motion carries 10 to 1. Thank you. I'm going to ask that we take a two minute recess to allow individuals who were here for this issue to clear the room. Thank you so much. Ah. We defer. And for Mills comment. I don't mind being a lone wolf. Hey, I've, 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 been, I've been the lone wolf, so He's don't worry. He is the lone wolf. <laughs>
Thank you. We're going to return to order. If you are planning to stay, please get a seat. If you are not planning to stay, if you could take your conversations into the lobby, that would be appreciated. This is what we do. And I do want to thank Vice Chair Hyman for facilitating the last agenda item. We are moving on, and our next item is case Z17-0034. This is the Carrington Woods proposal. And we will start with the staff report. And let, let me say, actually, before we start the staff report, just to remind people, I know some of you were in the hallway earlier because the room was full. If you are interested in signing up to speak on any of our remaining items this evening, please come to the table to my left and put your name down. You can mark if you are for or against the specific proposal that is in front of us this evening. Thank you. Mr. Wiggins. Thank you, Chair Busby. Uh, Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. Um, as you all may recall, um, the Commission heard this case on June 12, 2018. Um, so I will be somewhat brief in my presentation as there's been no modifications to the request since that time. Uh, so just as a reminder, this is a request in the city's jurisdiction. This is for an approximate eight and a half acre site. The current zoning is residential suburban 20 and the applicant is requesting residential suburban 10. Um, the proposal does not accompany or is not accompanied with a development plan. So any single family residential use is permissible in the RS10 district would be allowed here. The case area is highlighted in red. Um, the, the property is located at 833 Clayton Road. Some aerial photos. Um, these are also in your staff report. Um, the top left corner is an, a view of the site itself. Um, and the three other photos are from the surrounding neighborhoods that connect to this property. Uh, the zoning context map, as I noted, this property is zoned RS20, as you can see on the left-hand side, and they are proposing the RS10 district. Um, as you can see on the right-hand side, that would match the adjacent properties surrounding this site. Uh, the current future land use map notes that this site is designated as low density residential. The RS10 district fits within that, those parameters. And the low density residential category is the predominant use in this area. Some RS10 standards, lot, lot area, minimum of 10,000 square feet, obviously. The lot width of 75 feet. Street yards, 25 feet, side yards, 12 single, 24 total, and your rear yard is 25 feet in this district. Comprehensive plan policies reviewed as part of this request. You can see there were two key policies and the future land use map. The request was found to be consistent with these three items. And overall, staff determined that the request is consistent with the comprehensive plan, applicable policies and ordinances. And I'll be happy to answer any questions the commission may have at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. At this point, we will open the public hearing, and we have one individual signed up in favor for the proposal and three individuals signed up against. We will start with uh, the proponent. This is Ms. Penny Sadalko. Sadaklo, I'm sorry, I, I got this wrong last time as well. Hello, yes, sir. There's a little misspelling there. It's actually Sakadlo. Great. Okay. Uh, my Thanks. name is Penny Sicadlo, 9220 Fairbanks Drive in Raleigh, North Carolina. And yes, we um, did discuss this a couple of months ago at your uh, meeting in June. And since then, uh, we had a meeting with the neighbors uh, at a location that they chose, uh, which was at the library on uh, Highway 98. And we sent out um, letters to the same addresses that the um, city sent out the original zoning request. There were 22 people in attendance at the meeting. Um, I think we had a healthy discussion. I can't say that I came away with any absolute concurrent um, uh, conclusion to that uh, meeting. It ranged from some people understood that the uh, reason we wanted to go for the rezoning was because when we, when the when the client purchased this property, 
I traveled out there with them and we uh, toured the surrounding neighborhoods. We saw the street stubs into this property, we saw the surrounding neighborhood, and we thought it would be nice to match the existing neighborhood. And to do that, we needed to rezone it from RS-20 to RS-10, which gives us the same criteria that the existing neighbors um, are under. Um, we also acknowledge that the three stubs to our property would give us sufficient traffic um, access, and so that's what we're proposing. I think the staff uh, will require us to make the connection to the three stubs on the east, west, and south of our property. And so although some people understood in that discussion that matching the existing neighborhood is a reasonable request, there were still some people there who were concerned about traffic, and there were some people there that um, I dare say would like to see it not be developed at all. Um, and so that's an honest opinion from, from some of the neighbors. Um, I will uh, respectfully request that you do approve this. It is in keeping with all of the comprehensive plan. It's in keeping with the surrounding neighborhood. It absolutely matches the current zoning that we're adjacent to, and we would like to um, have an affirmative vote from this council tonight. Uh, I'll reserve uh, any time I have left and see if there's any other comments from the people who were in attendance. Thank you. Thank you. And the three individuals who signed up to speak against, Quincy Ratcliffe, Ponce Mercer, and Natalia Russell. And if the three of you don't mind coming up, you can come up to the microphone, and if you can state your name and your address, and then collectively, the three of you, uh, just like the proponents, you'll have 10 minutes collectively to share your thoughts. Thanks for joining us. Good evening. My name is Quincy Radcliffe. Thank you all for the opportunity to speak tonight. I live on 3219 Woodland Park Road at the, one of the corners where the main entrance of Carrington Woods is going to be. Um, tonight we had three of the neighborhoods here, but due to the length of the last meeting, some of the neighbors had to leave, and it was Twin Lakes, Knollwood, and Meadow Crest. Um, my concern is not, I'm not totally against it. My concern is the length of traffic and the density of, of the homes that's going to be built in that area. And due to the traffic that we have for that section, um, I don't think it has been totally observed. There hasn't been, all of our neighbors were not notified about the meeting that was has take the meetings that have taken place, um, so a couple of us of us within the neighborhoods have gone out and tried to notify our neighbors about this development. So um, we can come. Some of us can come on and speak because I was unable to attend all the other meetings, but I did watch the initial meeting from that took place here. Great, thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Natalia Russell, and I live at uh, 3301 Woodland Park. Um, we've been living there for 15 plus years. And I, I have severe concerns regarding the traffic. Um, the last meeting I did, I was in attendance, and we requested that DOT come out and assess the area before um, development actually starts because there is a high school there. And there is actually, which we didn't discuss at the meeting at the library, there's already already an existing um, development going up, which is, um, I don't know the name of the new one, but it's across from Stone Hill, which is off of Freeman Road. And there are two uh, very sharp curves. Um, there's one that's right before you get to Woodland Park, which is um, at the corner of Freeman and Woodland. And then there's, a, there's another that's right at the curve where Meadowcrest um, which is another neighborhood that will be impacted by this development. And the, the concern is we've already had, we've already have had some um, accidents that have occurred with the existing neighbors that's over there. And there's, uh, like I said, there's a new development going in, and I don't think that that traffic influx was taken into account along with this one. There's a lot of neighborhoods off of Clayton Road already, 
Um, we also requested um, if this development was to go into place, um, if they would have access um, directly onto Clayton Road without that uh, additional traffic coming through Twin Lakes. Um, my neighbor that just spoke, Ms. Radcliffe, is on the corner of Woodland Park and Derry, and I am across from her on Woodland Park. So we would be severely impacted uh, by the additional uh, traffic flow, which they're going to have to come past our house because there's no other way for them to access Clayton Road. Um, so I guess I don't know if you know this is going to take place regardless of what we say here tonight. I definitely um, have concerns about um, zoning for additional houses. Um, our understanding was that she had um, already gotten approved for 23, so we're not sure why the, the additional the zoning is required. Um, we have concerns about them putting more than the 23 that she's approved for. Um, again, everything is with traffic and safety. We really don't think that that has been assessed properly for the neighborhoods that are out there now. The homes are very nice. It's not about the homes not being nice. It's just about safety and traffic flow. And thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Mr. Mercer. Uh, good evening. My name is Ponce Mercer. I'm at 3215 William Park Road. Um, my concern is not so much building of the houses as um, it was recently spoke. It's the amount of houses they're going to build. I've been at my location for 25 years. When I originally purchased it, I was under the impression that no one could actually build behind me. So I'm not sure what changed from when I purchased my home until now where they're actually able to build behind me. So that was something I'm not quite sure. Maybe she can address when she actually comes back up here. Um, as well as with the traffic, another issue that we actually have, I would understand if she could actually have an entrance off of Clayton versus having to come through Whitman Park because we have a lot of other neighborhoods that surround us that actually cuts through Woodland Park. So there's much more traffic there now than it was, say, three years ago. And I don't think we can actually accommodate additional traffic. And I wonder how, if there's any kids, how will the school bus actually be able to come in and actually pick up the kids to actually get out of the neighborhood? Because I don't think buses can actually turn in the area where she's building. And maybe she can address that. Great. Thank you very much. You do have remaining time if you'd like to make additional statements or to answer any of the questions from the citizens. Uh, yes, and, and we, we discussed this in the meeting, and I'll discuss it again. Um, I did do a little bit more research when I got back after having the discussion with y'all. Um, the, the frontage of our property is about 500 feet. The distance between two existing roads, which is the um, Meadow Crest and the road that comes out of Twin Lakes, is about 760 feet distance between the two inter current intersections. And the dilemma of putting any additional road in there would not be approved. DOT requires a minimum of 600 feet between any additional intersections and there's not enough distance there. The city of Durham transportation, um, you may have someone here from transportation that could confirm it, but they say that they don't require an additional connection if the current pattern allows connections within a quarter mile, which is 1,320 feet. So we, we definitely meet all of those criteria. It's not, as an engineer, it's not a good place for me to recommend adding an additional connection out to Clayton Road. It would be too close together. What it does do is the Metacrest entrance is a dead end scenario with a stub into this property. It will allow those people to get have a secondary access in case of an emergency or an accident at that intersection. They now have a way out, which right now they don't. Um, all of our streets will be built to city standards School buses will be able to travel on them. It will provide interconnectivity. It will provide good traffic patterns, including for emergency uh, school buses and just the people that live there. We're talking a very small amount of people. Someone asked about uh, traffic count on one of the main roads. If you go to exhibit six or attachment six, it shows here 
that the current road, Clayton Road, has a capacity of 11,400. Even uh, the current um, traffic on there is 7,600, and our impact will be 164. So we're talking a very small amount of traffic in the realm of what we're discussing. So again, I ask for your approval. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item? Yes, sir, please come on up. Again, if you can come up to the microphone and let us know your name and your address. And I, I believe there are still a few minutes left for those speaking against. Uh, my name is Kenny Wiggins. I'm at 14 Meadowcrest Drive. And I think the last time we were here, I think we talked about her having a development plan and kind of some things we were told to maybe ask her for. And uh, we went to the library meeting. Uh, she didn't say, she said she couldn't have the development plan at all and that she wouldn't have it. And we were like, well, what are you going to do with the property? And she couldn't tell us. And so I'm just wondering, like, my concern is how many houses are going to go in there and what she plan on doing with the property. So that's pretty much what I want to know. Because she doesn't have a plan, and she's not telling us anything about it. And everything we asked her for, she said she couldn't get, but she won't go and have. So we don't know. We asked for a development plan. She said, I'm not going to have it. And we asked her, are you going to do 32 houses? Because we were here the last time. I thought they were already approved for 23 houses. And we said, it looks like you're going to try to put more housing in than that. And she was like, no, I couldn't put 32 in, in there if I wanted to. But she didn't have a development plan that would lock her in to a number of houses to do. So we didn't know. So we left with, I thought when we left here, she was already approved for 23. So with the zoning that they had. So now she wants another zoning. But we, don't, we can't figure out why she wants the new zoning if she's already approved for 23 houses with the zoning that it currently has. So that's the kind of the questions that we had. Like, what is, what is, what's she planning on doing? How many houses are going in there? And what's the plan? We really don't know. Great. Thank you, Mr. Wiggins. If you don't mind, actually, could you come up here and we'll just have you sign in? Uh, just, just put your name and address and we'll have you on the record. Okay. Anyone else who'd like to speak on this item for the public hearing? Seeing none, we will move to close the public hearing and look to the commissioners. Any questions or comments from the commissioners? We'll start on my left. I went right. I know they went right last time, so I want to go left this time. Anyone <laughs> on my left? Commissioner Miller. So I have a question for you, uh, Mr. Codlow. Who's going to do the land planning for this? Thank you, pardon? Have you got a land planner for this? I, I, I would do that land planning. Okay, and have you figured out if if you put as many units as you could under R10 in there, knowing that with three stubs to connect to, that's a lot of roadway. That's more roadway than you would need, perhaps if the stubs weren't there. As a practical matter, what is the maximum number of R10 lots you can get in there? Uh, the maximum number of R10 lots that I, I have been able to get fit in there is 23, and I'm not quite sure I can get that many. Um, we have crisscrossed this property with numerous streets. It, it's not just one street. Well, yeah, because you've got yeah, one here, one, one, here, there, one, and there, one, one there, there, and one there, and they're not exactly in the perfect spot, but I can make it work. Um, I think the current zoning allows... 15 or 17. I get, depending upon if you have to connect to those stubs, that's where it, I can't, my guessing goes away. I was coming up with 17, but that was, yeah. that was on the high end. Yeah, I think my sketch is about 15. I did take a sketch to the meeting at the library um, that showed the 23-ish, the um, but uh, stated that it's not a development plan. I'm not authorized to state that it is. Let me ask you this. Uh, it's my understanding from having spoken with Jacob that the wetland that shows on the map that, that engineers have told you that that can be uh, eliminated. Correct. Um, I have a um, documentation. Yeah, that's um, fine. 
um, I North believe Carolina. It. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that, that, that we were working with that assumption. Um, Mr. Judge, can you tell me your traffic counts are based upon an algorithm on pure R10 or on an understanding that there's going to be 23 units? Uh, the calculation was based on a uh, assumption that 80% um, of the land could be built at the 10,000 square foot lots. So, no. Probably uh, comes in around 23, doesn't it? Uh, I, yeah, I don't remember the exact number, but that's generally right. how we do it when it's... Yeah, yeah and you reserve that other 20% for odd corners and roadways. Exactly. Thank you. Sure. Those are my questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Williams? Uh, yes. Um, I don't feel any differently about this uh, proposed zoning change than I did when it first came before us. And even more so, having recently been right at Southern High School at one of their busiest times when they just recently had a football jamboree where people were parking, parking in adjacent neighborhoods to find somewhere to go for the games because obvious reasons and the traffic out there was horrible. So you're not dealing with an elementary school where once the school closes and everybody leaves at about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, you can pretty much take a break from traffic. You have football practice and volleyball games and basketball games, and Southern High School is now a school of sustainability. So their hours are a little bit different, and the way that they function is a little bit different. And I think that by adding more capacity than what it's already zoned for only enhances that issue is going to contribute greatly to the problem that is already existing in terms of traffic and travel. Even though if there is an accident on Clayton, you may be able to cut through this other neighborhood where other people are already trying to leave and go different places. Now you've got the traffic that would have been on Clayton diverting through this neighborhood. So it's not really easing the ability to go anywhere. You're just creating another way for water to flow or for traffic to flow that's still going to be a huge impact on the people that live there. Where if there's an accident on Clayton now, if you know where you're going, you go. If you don't, you don't. But I don't, I don't see where increasing the capacity to 23 homes or 23-ish, if you will, is productive for this area. I, I, I just don't see that is going to ease the concerns of the neighbors, and I don't see where this is going to help the capacity of that particular area in any way. It's not like, is there a grocery store off Clayton near there, or what is it? It's on uh, 98, right? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, um, and then I think the adverse of that is what, Stalin's Road? Mm -hmm the other access point of leaving to try to alleviate traffic, but then you pick that up as 98 is becoming a popular route in order to travel to Raleigh in order to pick up 50 and 540. So 98 hasn't been addressed yet, but in time when that is widened, then I think that that will ease the stresses, not to mention some of the issues that you have with Stallings Road and um, a couple other areas where flooding is a massive concern. So those roads shut down in heavy rains. And then coming in and backfilling or filling in a wetland area just for the sake of building, I'm against that as well. So that's my standpoint. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Van? Yes, thank you very much. Um, uh, first of all, I, I would certainly thank um, both um, sides for having the opportunity to come back as um, we had requested and to uh, have conversations around this. I think uh, it's important and uh, I'm, I'm glad that happened. Um, but, um, but it does lead to, uh, you know, a few other questions I guess I would have in my mind. You know, I travel through this area at least um, three to four times out the week. Um, sometimes taking back roads when I'm leaving North Carolina Central and on the way home, take the back roads, uh, which sometimes leads to Clayton Road and all those areas. And I, I see the impact. I also see those who are fleeing from uh, Durham, going back to other places um, like Raleigh, um, using Highway 98 and other areas, um, Stalins and all those roads, and, and I know the traffic I, 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 because I'm in it. Uh, and so, um, so I always wonder about, you know, when we talk about these traffic statistics, whether or not they actually match with the actual realities of those who live there and who have to experience that. And you have to take that into account, uh, at least I do. 
Um, and so while on one hand, um, I, I think what you have proposed here, um, you know, kind of punches all the buttons, no doubt. Um, but at the same time, um, for me, I have to always think about um, the question of impact, whether it was this neighborhood or any other neighborhood, about the impact uh, that it might have on those who are what I call the legacy residents, those who have been there uh, and been there when no one else was there. And so um, for that matter, um, I always also think that you have to sort of think about what's a good fit um, and whether or not, you know, um, the, the impact, again, getting back to that question of travel for those who are already overly burdened with the traffic patterns out there. Uh, and so uh, with that being said, I would, um, and I will certainly, um, um, I, I will oppose this uh, matter. Uh, I'm sure it might get approved, but I'll, I'll oppose it because uh, I live out there and I know um, the impact that it might have. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Van. Commissioner Kenshin. Uh, yes, thanks so much. Um, I'm concerned because I think, um, you know, I see the students who are walking along those streets and they're not paying attention, they're horse playing, they're doing what kids normally do. And I have real concerns about the safety, um, not so much the traffic, the cars, but the, the foot traffic, the children, the students who are walking up and down the street. You know, we've turned down, uh, we've uh, not approved things on the other side. My daughter went to Jordan High School and we turned down one at Garrett and 54 and they have way less traffic um, than what we see over here by Southern. So I would not be inclined to support this because um, I'm just real, I have real concerns about the safety of the students who are up and down that street all the time. And I just worry about them because um, it's traffic, like Commissioner Van said, there's a lot more traffic um, up and down those streets and there's no sidewalks. Um, I, just, I just have a real concern about the safety of the students who are attending um, Southern High School. So I'd be uh, inclined to not vote in favor of this proposal. Thank you. Commissioner Durkin. I just have a question for staff. The adjacent neighborhoods are zoned RS10, but are they built to RS10 or are they collective at a different density scale? Uh, Jacob Wiggins of the Pine Department. Um, that is correct, yeah. If you look on attachments one in your packet, you'll see the zoning context map. Kind of tan or taupe color is the RS10 zoning district. Um, and it's my understanding that most of those lots, if not all of those lots in that area, are built to the RS-10 standards. Great. Any additional questions? No, no additional questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Bryan. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of comments for staff. Uh, just on page three of the staff report, top of the page... Southern High School was found just to the northeast. We established two months ago that it should be southeast. And on attachment five, uh, on the staff analysis of policy 2.3.1A, if approved, the request would per permit up to blank residential units, I think you need to plug a number in. Thank you. And uh, I have a couple questions for Mr. Judge. I heard what the applicant said about the distances. You know, they got 500 feet of frontage on Clayton Road. The other two roads that come out are 750 feet, something like that. So I'm taking it that you guys would not permit, or NCD, NCDOT would not permit uh, length access to their property off of Clayton Road. Is that correct? Uh, Bill Judge Transportation, we have not had direct contact with NCDOT about that question with this site. I would say, in general, if they can see that otherwise adequate access can be provided via those existing <laughs> hubs, they likely would prefer the connection not to be there. Um, if there were a connection, there would likely be a turn lane required based on the volume on Clayton Road as well. And uh, there's a street to the north. I'm drawing a blank on the name that it would like near the uh, western property line of the site that they would likely have to line up so it wouldn't necessarily be centered up in the center of the property, mm -hmm. um, assuming that DOT did permit it. But. And 
since we have these three streets, or I think one of them is just sort of a stub, coming to this property, are they absolutely compelled to connect to all three of them? Yes, the existing unified development ordinance would require connections at all three of them, although there are um, options at the site plan stage where if they can show environmental features, steep slopes, or other topography reasons why those connections are not feasible, that they could request a, a waiver of that. Okay, and final question. Um, if they connect to the stub off of Metacrest, and a lot of traffic goes out through Metacrest, they're coming on the Clayton at what appears to be one of the bad curves. Uh, could transportation infrastructure improvements be required of this development at the site plan stage to make that curve and that connection safer? Uh, highly unlikely for the existing, if they otherwise have uh, the three points of access that would essentially be in existing condition that um, that would have to be addressed. Okay, thank you. Um, just some comments. Uh, I agree that asking for the RS-10 makes the zoning in this area consistent with the surrounding zoning. Uh, and with all the streets that you're going to have to connect to, uh, getting 23 lots on there uh, might be iffy, as you said. Uh, and for the benefit of the uh, neighbors who spoke, the number 23, and I may have been the one that threw it out at the last consideration of this, actually comes from the zoning map change application in which uh, 23 single family lots is what was written on the application. Now, since we don't have a development plan, we can't hold them to 23 lots. Uh, what I don't like about this is, is the fact that you are having to connect two streets that would send your traffic through other neighborhoods. And I agree with the comment that was made about you know, it makes it more difficult for the school buses to have to go in and out and, and that sort of thing. And I worry about the lack of infrastructure improvements on Clayton Road. And I, I think the, the traffic concerns really bother me. And at this point, unless somebody can come up with a good reason, otherwise I'm probably against this too. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bryan. Commissioner Johnson. Uh, thank you. Um, so, to uh, Miss, let me make sure I can say this almost correctly. Sadalko? Sakadlo? Oh, we got a D wrong. Right. No, I'm sorry. Um, um, would I be um, accurate in my assumption that the goal is, while you say th 23 single family lots, the ideally, an ideal situation, you would put as many. Uh, units on this this uh, parcel is as feasible. Thirty-four. I'm saying, from an engineering standpoint, it's not feasible to maximize the number of units that the zoning would allow. Right. And so, in response, if we woke up tomorrow and some amazing technology uh, was before us, and it allowed 23 units to become 27 units. Would that move you to con consider viably putting 27 units on? And this is just hypothetical, me, me speaking here. I, I admitted in the meeting at the library that I am known for putting as many units as I can on a piece of property with and meet, meeting all the criteria, mm -hmm. but I can't see that magic happening. Okay, okay, that, that's, that's fair. Um, and so to an uh, uh, earlier question, I think it was from, I don't know who it was, one of my colleagues asked what was the basis of the transportation uh, analysis. So my peer uh, over on this side pointed out on uh, exhibit three, if I'm correct, it's based on 30, 30 units being on, on that site. Uh, so I think we were thinking it was 2015 versus 23 or something, but it's 30. So if you, so 
maxing it out, doing my rough work, comes to about 34 units, 32 to 35 units. Taking the 20% off to use his algorithm gets it down to about 27, 26, so, uh, right, depending so. upon where it all lands. And so um, if we're assuming, based off of what I've heard from, from transportation, that the three stubs will be basically required to be the connection points, um, one, could, one could assume, but since it's not committed, that the maximum number of units would not be able to be programmed on that site. But we, that's my hypothetical question, which leads me to the quality of life issue. So one thing that I, and I apologize to the neighbors, is that I tend to take trips during different times of the day to see what it looks like, and I didn't do it for this, for, for this application. So I'm, I'm thankful to my colleagues who pointed this out because that sways my thinking on the issue of, of basically upzone, basically upzone it for, for higher density because if there are uh, people in general, but kids walking in that, I drove it today, and if there are people walking on that, the, the roads, that I, that's an issue. Like, and I don't see anything ha coming over from a transportation improvement on uh, the Clayton Road or in that area anytime soon. So with that being said, I am uh, inclined to not be, to be in opposition of the request here uh, for higher density on this. And even though the map make, looks from a visual standpoint, it makes sense visually. Uh, but when you incorporate the quality of life thing, I'm just not uh, comfortable voting for it. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Any other commissioners who'd like to speak? Commissioner Miller? So I have, a, when we talked about this in June, I was gently urging people to look at a development plan. And, and if you're going to do your own land planning, uh, it seems to me that you would be in a position to do a development plan. Uh, this unit count and its consequent traffic impact uh, question and, uh, and perhaps some other issues uh, that could be resolved to give greater uh, certainty to the neighbors, it seems to me, especially since you're in a situation where you don't have to pay somebody else to do a development plan, it seems to me that the short route to success here, um, and at, you had a meeting with them where they talked about a development plan. I had a meeting with them where we talked about what might be accomplished in a development plan. Uh, I agree that this RS-10 idea is not a bad thing. Uh, I mean, it's a logical match, but it is an unusual situation where, where a new subdivision isn't connecting to the main road that serves it, but is depending upon filtering its traffic out through other subdivisions. Now, it's it's... I mean, that's, to me, that's less than perfectly satisfactory. Uh, I understand the provision for connectivity and, and the requirement for stubs, and I'm not suggesting that it's a bad thing. But when we do that, instead of also connecting to the main road, it, it, it rubs me the wrong way. Now, it would be a matter of considerably less concern if we had a development plan that said that, that RS10D, the maximum number of units, will be... Uh, 20, 21, 23, something like that, then I would, my own anxiety about how you might maximize the development potential of the property would go away. Um, and while at site, while we do require stub connection, we also have a provision in the code, code as Mr. Judge uh, told us, that with the right circumstances, you can apply for and be relieved of uh, the obligation to connect to one or more stubs, environmental uh, concerns are one of them, and I note that this wetland uh, that I know that you can make go away is right there where the Alpha Drive stub comes in. So, um, because there's no development plan, and because uh, I, I have a tenant, I would prefer to want to see a development plan that's that gives everybody the certainty here, and it doesn't seem to me that this would be the most, a very complicated development plan. So uh, without it, I'm voting no. Uh, if you told me that you would 
wanted to, to somehow work out a development plan and fix that number of units, uh, then I might change my mind and may and urge the council to, to uh, get, make a conditional recommendation to the council to approve it with an appropriate development plan. Not stopping it here, not another delay, but going forward, knowing that you, that you would make a development plan and fix that number of units um, and uh, settle this issue of how the traffic impacts are going to work. Commissioner Gibbs. <clears throat> Well, I feel somewhat the same way without a development plan. It's, it's a little up in the air, but uh, in looking at the other uh, d development around here, that they're all interconnected. Uh, and this is a very small, comparatively speaking, small frontage, uh, small in, in area. Uh, even though there's not a development plan, uh, it's something that, you know, I don't think it should be controlled by uh, what little bit I think it would contribute to any traffic flow on, uh, on Clayton Road. Uh, this is another one that it's, it's hard to come up with uh, a definitive yes or no. Um, right now, without a development plan, uh, I'm, I would have to tend toward not approving it. Uh, that's it, Mr. Great. Thank you. Are there any final comments before we have a motion for approval? I or? have one more question. Commissioner Miller? Uh, for this is for staff. Based upon your experience uh, with a residential development of this size, will uh, a certain amount of this property have to be taken up with some sort of stormwater BMP? Uh, Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. Um, yeah, I mean, they will have to provide either a BMP or other means of mitigation for this property. All right. That helps. Thank you. Right, thank you. So at this point, we'll... Take a motion, a reminder that motions are in the affirmative, and then we will vote for or against. And again, we are advisory body only. This will move forward then to the city council. Commissioner Ghosh? Okay. Well, I was not ready to make a motion, but if that's where we're at, that's where we're at. Sorry, I thought I saw your hand raised, but I will, I will take a motion from whoever would like to make a motion at this point. You want to make Mr. Chairman, I move that we send case Z17-00034 forward to the city council with a favorable recommendation. Second. <clears throat> Motion made by Commissioner Miller, seconded by Commissioner Bryan, and we will have a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Alturk? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? No. Commissioner Ghosh? I'm gonna vote yes. Commissioner Bryan? No. Commissioner Satterfield? No. Commissioner Jerkin? No. Commissioner Hyman? No. Commissioner Miller? No. Commissioner Ketchin? No. Commissioner Van? No. Uh, Commissioner Gibbs? No. Commissioner Williams? No. And Chair Busby? No. Uh, motion passes, a uh, motion fails two to 10. Thank you all very much for your time this evening. We will move to our next item. This is case Z18-008, 6919 Herndon Road. We'll start with the staff report. Again, if you are planning to testify, please sign up.
Carla Rosenberg, Planning Department. Um, this, I'm here to present zoning case Z18000869 um, um, Herndon Road. The proposal, um, excuse me. The proposal is put forth by the City of Durham. The site acreage is 2.201, located within the city limits. The rezoning request is to change plan development residential PDR to residential suburban 20, RS20. The specific request is to construct a new fire station for the city, uh, accommodating an 11,000 square foot building with drive areas and parking. Because no development plan is included in this application, no commitments can be made, and therefore any uses allowed in the RS20 district could be built here in the future. In addition to approval of this application, the fire station use would also require a minor special use permit from the Board of Adjustment. So this is an aerial map of the subject area, which is highlighted in red. It's located along Herndon Road, just south of its intersection with Massey's Chapel Road, less than one mile east of South Point Mall. And it's in close proximity to several suburban housing developments. These are some images of the vacant site and surrounding parcels, which contain single family homes. This is a zoning context map showing residential uses to be the predominant zoning in the area. The map on the right shows the subject area proposed to be rezoned to residential suburban 20, which matches nearby zoning districts. And this is a future land use map showing the use of low density residential across the site and surrounding parcels. The proposed RS20 district aligns with the low density residential future land use category. This table shows the dimensional standards for new non-residential structures to be developed on the site. It will require a minimum street yard of 25 feet, a minimum open space of 10% of the gross area, a minimum single side yard of 10 feet, total side yardage 20 feet, 24 feet. Um, minimum rear yard setback of 25 feet, maximum building coverage of 60%, and a maximum building height of 45 feet. So in terms of the proposed fire station use, non-residential development in residential districts requires commercial level buffering, which equates to a 20 to 30 foot vegetative buffer. So the slide, uh, staff reviewed this item against uh, applicable comp comprehensive plan policies as seen here in an attachment five of your packet. The proposal was found to be consistent with all applicable policies. And finally, staff determined that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and the applicable policies and ordinances. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Great, thank you. We will open the public hearing, and there's nobody signed up to speak, so I would ask if there's anyone here who would like to speak during the public hearing. Seeing none, this doesn't happen often. <laughs> we, <laughs> we're gonna go with it. We're gonna, we're gonna move to close the public hearing. Any commissioners who have questions, comments? Commissioner Johnson? Just a simple question uh, for staff. Is that a particular reason why, um, let me make sure I'm asking the right question, yeah, no development plan was um, provided with the application? Just curious. <laughs> Carla Rosenberg, Planning Department. Um, the option was discussed with the applicant. Um, however, they elected to not use a development plan. Um, any specific reason? Uh, it would probably be better, uh, Grace Smith with planning, it would probably be better for the applicant to, to, to elaborate on that, but it was our understanding that the, the project is not in the design phase yet where they could nail down the specifics and doing this type of zoning would leave the property still zoned for a compatible use in that area if they did not build a fire station. However, I think the applicant needs to address that question and not us, but that was our understanding. Okay, quick follow-up. Uh, Two-part question. So uh, when we say applicant, um, I'm assuming we're saying city of Durham, 
So who is uh, the human right, being that you, uh, office that you would there, There's a representative getting? from the Department of General Services here that could answer any questions about that. Right. Mm -hmm. And who owns the land? Does the city currently owns the land? Own the mm -hmm. <laughs> if you, yeah, you can come to the microphone. Please give us your name, your address. And we appreciate you taking time to answer our questions. Yeah, no problem. Hi, I'm John Pottis Wiles, um, in General Services. I live at 713 West Club Boulevard in Durham. Um, so your question was about the development plan. Uh, I think that it just didn't seem appropriate or didn't seem necessary. Uh, project is not in design yet. We don't have any. We don't have any uh, civil engineers under contract to work on the project. And I'm sorry, one more. And so, is there a possibility if you can? give me on a scale of one to 10, that this proposed site could turn out to not be the site, even, even after the request tonight. I can't imagine a scenario where that would happen. This, the site was specifically sought for a fire station and it's perfect for the use. So that's, that is 100% the intended use. Thank you. Commissioner Bryan. Uh, before the gentleman leaves the podium, uh, a couple uh, questions. Uh, this is a new fire station, not a replacement for the Parkwood fire station. <clears throat> if you can come down to the, the main microphone, that'd be great. Thank you. I'm uh, Andy Sinipley with the City of Durham Fire Department. So yes, it is uh, the current station when we consolidated we started temporarily using the fire station that's within the Parkwood neighborhood. We try not to use fire stations inside of a residential neighborhood because of where they're located and having to get out of there. That station was never designed for continuous human occupancy uh, when it was first built uh, back in the 70s by a volunteer fire department. And it's been retrofitted and it's not really up to a city standard. And so we um, acquired that property with the intent of building a fire station there. And in, in addition, uh, it's not the station location for the old Parkwood station isn't in a great location if you look at our entire response uh, guidelines, so. Okay, so this is replacing the Parkwood, that's? Yes, sir, we don't actually own that station where we lease it from the county. No, I understand that, okay. but I mean. Yeah, it's a rip. This, this one will appear and the Parkwood yes, will sir. disappear. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, the one other comment I would make, uh, I know a, a request was made for a five foot bicycle lane and without a development plan, there's no way for you to respond to that uh, or commit to that. But my feeling is if this bicycle lane has been documented and it states that it has, and Durham is one of the groups, it's Durham, Chapel Hill, Carborough, MPO, uh, if, you, if it's documented that way, I expect the city of Durham to live up to what is in that plan. And I'd like to see a bicycle lane. I would agree with that. Um, if it's certainly if it's a requirement of of the UDO of the of the project we're planning, we'll abide by that. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. So my own view on this is we need to replace the Parkwood station because it's not performing. It it increases response times. This is a 2.2 acre piece of property. You, even if you built a 20,000 square foot fire station on it, it would be a pretty damn low intensive use. Uh, you could put four houses on it, zoned in the zone the way they want it, and you can put uh, probably uh, uh, more than six on it the way it's currently zoned. If they don't use it, it's gonna jump down to RS-20. It's unlikely that somebody's gonna put four houses on it there. They'll probably wanna rezone it. So I don't see, I think we've got fail safes and safeguards. Uh, the area needs a new fire station. Uh, the height limitations and all those things that, that obtained for the RS-20 zone will obtain here. Uh, I'm gonna vote for it. And I don't think it needs a development plan. And you, you actually heard that fall from my lips. <laughs> We're just going to pause for 10 seconds and let that sink in. <laughs> Any other questions or comments from other commissioners? If none, I'll entertain a motion. 
Mr. Chairman, I move that we send case Z18 quadruple 08 forward to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. Second. Moved by Commissioner Miller, seconded by Com uh, Commissioner Williams. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Good. Unanimously passes. Unanimously passes. We'll move to our next case, uh, Z18 quadruple 07, Weaving Water. Thank you, Jacob. Okay, we'll start, we'll start with the staff report, uh, Ms. Sunyak. Oh, uh, while Jacob is setting up, I just wanted to clarify for the record that the Carrington case was 211. The vote was 211. I didn't bring my notes up here. Sorry. <laughs> 211 instead of 210. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you. Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. Um, this is a request for a case titled Weaving Water, um, which is located at 3912 and 3920 Rivermont Road. Um, <clears throat> the applicant is Ms. Danielle Brestil. This is a request to rezone approximately 12 acres from residential suburban 20 to plan development residential 1.964 or PDR 1.964 um, with a proposal of 24 single family units with a four bedroom rooming house. The subject site is highlighted in red in front of you. You can see its location along Rivermont Road and the property is just south of the Eno River State Park. Um, Rivermont is accessed from primarily from Coal Mill Road, and you can see this area is just to the west of the Orange County Durham County line. Some area photos starting in the top left hand corner, you can see a, a photo into the site itself. Um, on the right hand side, you can see views of Rivermont Road as well as access to a trail. Um, this is located just a little north of the site. And then on the, on your left-hand side at the bottom, or I'm sorry, on the bottom left corner there, that's the entrance to a subdivision across the street from the subject site. I'm looking at this property from a zoning context standpoint, um, RS20 is the predominant zoning district in this area, as you can see on the yellow in your map, with RR located to the north. Um, there are a few pockets of PDR zoning, um, just to the southwest of this site along Cold Mill Road. Um, on the future land, uh, future land use map, as you can see, this site is designated as low density residential. That is the predominant um, land use category in this area. There is also some residential open space. And we'll note that the, although the EAR is not complete, it will, there will be a couple of additional parcels that will show up as this residential open space. If you can see them on, on your screens there, this parcel will be designated as ROS, as well as these two parcels north of Rivermont Road. Um, and this bulky green area up here comprises a large part of the Eno State Park. Proposed conditions, this is seen as the development plan in your packet. Um, as I noted, the applicant is proposing 24 single family residential units with one ingress and egress point off of Rivermont Road located in the southwestern corner of the subject site. Summary of some of the key committed elements, as I noted, the 24 residential units, the four bedroom rooming house, the one side access point, and a maximum height of 35 <coughs> for all units. Comprehensive plan policies reviewed as part of this request. There were two key policies as well as the future land use map, and staff found that the request was consistent with all three of those policies. And generally speaking, the request is consistent with the comprehensive plan applicable policies and ordinances, and I'll be happy to answer any questions the commission may have at this time. Thank you. Thank you. So we will move to open the public hearing. I will tell you in advance, there are a lot of names crossed out and a few folks who put a question mark if they were for or against, so just work with me. We'll figure this out. I think some of these folks actually may have signed up for an earlier hearing on this sheet by accident, but at the moment, I believe we have two individuals who are signed up to speak for the proponents, and we have two individuals signed up to speak against, and three who gave a question mark. So we will have those come after the individuals who are, who are against. 
Uh, so to start, again, each side will have 10 minutes. We will start with Daniel Brestel and Katie Hamilton. Good evening, commissioners, and thank you for having us. Um, my name is Katie Hamilton, and I'm here representing Stuart. Um, Danielle is the applicant in this case, and I'm going to let her speak first, kind of speak about the intentions for this neighborhood and what she sees Weaving Water really becoming. Hi, good evening. Maybe a little. And if you can start with your name and address, that'd be great. Uh, my name is Danielle Brestel. I live at 2031 Hillock Place. I am the applicant for this rezoning request. Uh, I currently live in a single family dwelling about a mile northeast of the site. Our property backs up to the Eno River State Park, a state park that I love and where my family spends a great deal of time. My interest in rezoning this property is to reduce the environmental impact of the current RS-20 designation. This is my first development project. I decided to develop, to develop a co-housing community to provide a better quality of life for my family and others. My parents moved to Durham two years ago to be close to my family and especially my daughter. They struggled to find a one-story, modestly-sized home in a natural setting that would fill, fill their desire to age in place. We also struggled to find accessible housing with a sense of community, where neighbors looked out for one another, like Eno Commons or Solterra. We're seeking to rezone in order to cluster our houses into multiplexes with a maximum of four units. Um, this is something that may be different than what the commitments currently state, and Katie will get to that. Um, and also to provide clustered parking areas near the property entrance rather than driveways with parking at each residence. We're interested in stacking units to provide some accessible homes for those with limited mobility. For example, my family plans to live in a single floor unit above my parents' single floor accessible unit on the ground floor. Um, we plan to group two to three units of modest size footprint prints ranging from 800 to 1800 square feet in a building. Each building would look similar to a single family dwelling, which is consistent with the current neighborhood. Our desire to develop intelligent two-story housing solutions and clustered parking is deeply connected to our desire to minimize impervious surfaces, preserve water quality and forest coverage, and encourage interaction between neighbors. Compared with the current RS-20 zoning, our plan greatly reduces the negative impact on the watershed, maintains a forested environment to maintain the Eno River State Park experience. Several Nord Several neighbors support this project, including our neighbors to the east, who are Michael Meredith and Wendy Jacobs. We are providing original solutions for housing needs and expanding Durham housing choices in an environmentally, environmentally responsible way. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So um, as Danielle alluded to, based on some recent, um, thank you. Some recent meetings we had, um, we decided to modify the development plan text commitments just slightly. Um, so I wanted to kind of highlight those changes from what were in your staff report. Um, what we've decided to commit to, we realized we had made a slight error in our you know, wording using the term single family units. Um, we'd wanted to differentiate between the rooms and the boarding, rooming house, not boarding, rooming house, and the dwelling units. Um, but calling them single family would have required us to do lots. And we really want this to be, as uh, Danielle said, more of a community that doesn't have people having lots, but their two parking spots on their lot and very traditional subdivision. So what we've changed that to is to say that we were gonna have a condominium form of ownership for single family, two family, and multiplex units. Um, this is exactly what we communicated to the neighborhood when we had a neighborhood meeting on March, Mar sometime in March, um, it was a Saturday morning. So they are aware that that's what was coming before them. We just had used improper 
terms in our development plan. And we, we had a hard time hearing you. Do you mind just repeating the okay. actual of uh, the commitment right before you talked yeah. about the neighborhood meeting? Yeah, so the commitment itself will say the property will be developed as a series of single family, two family, and or multiplex units and support buildings in a condominium form of ownership. All land area not directly beneath an individually owned dwelling unit shall be held in common open space owned by the homeowners association. So that's the exact text commitment. Um, and then the other text commitment we decided to add based on some feedback from the neighbors who are concerned about the impacts of a different building typology and a different residential typology on them was to commit to preserving the existing evergreen vegetation along Rivermont um, as shown here in the development plan. Um, oops, sorry. I'm going to use this graphic since it's a little bit easier to see, but this is the strand of evergreen vegetation along Rivermont Road that we have committed to not tearing down to protect the neighbors to the west of us. Um, we kind of wanted to go over why we think changing to the PDR is good, as far as Danielle was saying, with environmental considerations. This is our preferred scenario. Danielle has reached out to conservation agencies um, to see if we can. As you see, the existing conditions, there's two parcels, and we're only proposing to rezone 12 of the 22-ish acres. The rest of it we'd really like to keep in conservation area, and even if it cannot be conserved, it's mainly non-developable due to steep slopes, which you can see here in gray, and the um, stream buffers that are on the site as well. So we wanted to look at what would really happen with the existing zoning and what could be there versus what we're proposing. Um, so the existing zoning for the entire project, done with a cluster subdivision, and forgive us, we got a little overzealous at Stewart and put an extra lot on there um, for this plan, but would allow for up to 42 units and reasonably that the site could accommodate that. In comparison, if the PDR only has 24 lots within it, it's 12 units or 12 acres, the rest of the PDR zoning would really only be able to support another 10 units. So immediately you are getting a reduction of eight units um, off the bat, which we think is appropriate for this area and this context right along the Eno River State Park. Um, I think, so here's a, a little bit more on the M PDR impacts. These are again in your staff report. But another thing we really wanted to focus on is this impervious surface. We're greatly reducing our impervious surface allowance. 70% is what's allowed in RS20. And we're only going to allow 20% on this. So we're, we think we're really starting to respond to the environmental sensitivity of this area um, and continuing to preserve the uh, environmental features in here that are so vital to Durham's um, success. And with that, I think we're going to preserve the rest of our time to respond to any comments that opposition has. Great. Thank you very much. There are two minutes left that we can reserve. And we had, actually we had three individuals who signed up against, and I'll read off all of your names and I'd ask you to come up. James King, Charles Cozart, and Evan Koresh. And then we also had three that signed up, just so we can make sure you're here. Uh, Michelle Smith, Craig Hudson, it looks like, and Jonathan Bennett. But again, if you can come up and give us your name and your address, and uh, you have 10 minutes combined. Okay. We could reset the clock, please. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm James King. I live at 12 Grayley Drive. And uh, there's uh, maybe one of the explanations for all the question marks is um, I, I think most of the neighbors realize that there's no stopping to the development. Um, it's just how it's done and um, maybe have some sensitivity to some of the, not only the, the, the state park, which I think they have gone out of their way to do, but I think some of the concerns that particularly I have is, is some of the limited infrastructure that the, uh, the neighborhood, um, particularly Rivermont Road, has to uh, the development. Um, 
we, uh, uh, as I said, I live on Grayley, which is just west of the property, um, which we use Rivermont to access. We have 26 neighbors right now along uh, both Rivermont and Grayley. Um, potentially, we could double the amount of people that live along that corridor when we, we go with um, another tw possibly 24 units on the, on the property. Um, we're concerned because there's that basically that even in the, I noticed in, in the change report that they addressed Coal Mill Road when they did the transportation calcs, but not, nothing really considered what effects it would have on Rivermont and those of us living on Rivermont. Rivermont is, is 18 feet wide or narrow, however you look at it, and 1,800 feet long to the property. Um, and it's not a lot of room, and, and it, it's, it's taken quite a beating. You know, we've lived there for about three and a half years, and in, in the, even in that short time period, um, it's, it's, it's pretty rough. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's basically a collection of, of patched potholes and unpatched potholes, um, and, it, it, and it needs quite a bit of repair. Um, so our concern is that, you know, with this growth, this development down there, that, um, that some attention be given to the street for safety reasons. Um, we have a lot of families that live there. People like to walk their dogs. We don't have sidewalks on Rivermont, so everybody walks down the middle of the street, which is usually okay, um, but doubling the amount of traffic on Rivermont um, would cause me some pause. And so I just, I wanna make sure that it's, it's being done with some respect to the neighborhood. And um, uh, again, not, uh, not, a, not a against progress, because it's gonna happen. Something's gonna happen on that site. Uh, I just I just want to make sure it's done right. Great, thank you. Charles Kozar. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry that that he did leave. If if other individuals are still here that would like to speak, please come up. Um, we have Evan Koresh. Good evening, uh, Evan Karish. I live at 7 Grayley Drive. Um, in contrast to the many people who have lived here for decades, I have lived here for six weeks. Uh, I came here in part attracted to uh, the low density uh, of, of the neighborhood. I, came, I was attracted to the open space, the green space, and the forest that I moved to Seattle 35 years ago when it was a small, sleepy town that nobody had ever heard of. Uh, it exploded. The nature and character of the city, because of unregulated, not growth, but unregulated, unplanned growth, really did destroy the nature and character of what many people moved to Seattle for. So it gives me great appreciation for the role and responsibility that you have in terms of, excuse me, the future of Durham. My concerns are three. First of all, uh, the information that was provided to you by the city does not represent, um, in fact, what uh, is planned for the site. So all of the analysis and decisions that were predicated on the information provided apparently are, are not correct. My second consideration has to do with the nature and character of the planned development vis-a-vis -vis the existing nature and character of, of the homes in that area. And the third is an issue of safety, uh, specifically for the people who live along Rivermont. Um, this is a, a, a neighborhood of single-family homes. Uh, it is zoned RS-20, and the plan is to put multifamily, multi-story housing with separated, separate parking lots on that parcel. That is vastly different than the nature of the single-family homes which are currently in that neighborhood, and that kind of the, is, is the kind of construction that you see in condo complexes adjacent to shopping centers. That is not the kind of development that you see in single-family homes. Uh, my additional consideration, and it was alluded to, is, is the safety issue. Rivermont is, is approximately, as we heard, 18 feet wide. Uh, you can get one car on it. In some spots, you might be able to get two cars um, passing, not in all of the spots. There are no sidewalks alongside Rivermont, and there are ditches on either side of the road. At any point in, during the day, there are a great many people who are walking down Rivermont who are pushing strollers down Rivermont, 
uh, who are walking their children down Rivermont. And with traffic, there is nowhere to go uh, if there's more than one car on the road at a time. There are no sidewalks. There's nowhere for people to move out of the way of, of traffic. And I have concern for the safety of the people who live along Rivermont, as well as those who are accessing Eno State Park. So for those three reasons, the nature and character of the plan development, which is inconsistent what which, what which was provided to the city, considerations for the multifamily, multi-story, high-density housing, which is inconsistent with the single-family nature of the neighborhood, and the third, my concerns about the safety of individuals who live along Rivermont, and the fact that that road is really not built to handle the kind of traffic uh, and the nature and pattern of traffic that would result. Those three reasons caused me to speak against the motion or against the plan rezoning. Thank you. Thank you for your comments and welcome to Durham. Thank you. Michelle Smith. Great. Please come on up. I'm Michelle Smith. I live at um, 14 Grayley Road, uh, the first house that was built at the end of that cul-de-sac. I've lived there five years. Uh, we moved to Durham. We chose it um, after visiting numerous times over the years when our son went to Duke. Um, I love the community I'm in. I love the residential area I'm in. We are single family homes. Um, we are on, we have, we back up to the Eno. We chose that lifestyle. I took two years to find this home because of the lifestyle that we live there. The Eno that Danielle likes, uh, State Park, is the same thing we do. I appreciate that she is thinking green and all of that. It's just that, and that property will not stay vacant forever. I mean, I miss the goats. If I had my choice, I would take the goats back, but you know, as I've heard all night, there's, I'm not the only one that's chosen to do. There's lots of people moving here. Every neighborhood has to make room. I just don't understand a multi-urban, very urban, urban sort of environment plunked right down in the middle of a very rural area. And um, the traffic we get to the Eno is a lot. A lot. It's a very popular place to hike, to bring children and all that, and the road just is not going to support that many families living there. It's just, I know you have some um, mathematical things that you put together that you figure out how traffic works, but for those of us that live there, and maybe this is not important to you, but it is to me, we have a variety of wildlife, and that area they want to build in is a traffic zone for all the deer that we have there and we have fox and we have uh, fox we have um, all sorts of birds we have um, rabbits I mean there's we're trying to live with them as harmoniously as we can but that area is their their, their space so thank you okay, thank you Craig Hudson, I bet I got that wrong, but please come on up and let me know what I got wrong. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> yes, my name is Craig Hudson. I actually am uh, the developer of Grayley Drive, uh, Eno Falls subdivision. I have been living in Durham 55 years. I was born here. Uh, I don't know that uh, I am necessarily against the project. I understand something can be put there. Um, no one would want to pay taxes on the rest of their life just to look at it. I, I understand that. So I'm a little bit torn on the fence of it. Uh, I think as a developmental stand of it and the way it's looked at, I'm not so sure that either any of you or any of your parents would want to go to the furthest house or dwelling and then let them off and then drive back and then walk in the rain or push a wheelchair back to the furthest one. Uh, I understand we have a parking... Please continue. Parking area. Um, am I done? No, you can keep, please continue. Uh, um, but, you know, I, and again, I, and, and if this is the most ecologically friendly thing that we can put there, it's like I've kind of told a few people, um, we have to pick our poison. And 
I, I do understand that something's got to be there. I just really would like you all to make sure that uh, that you have looked it over as best you can, transportation-wise, impact-wise, ecological, um, you know, water runoff, develop, developmental aspect of it, just to make sure that this is the best thing that can be done. And uh, you know, and and again, to not beat a dead horse, Rivermont is a complete travesty. I just called up. Took me like three times, but I got like 20 potholes fixed. And um, I think that road deserves more. And I think the people that live there deserve more than what is that. Um, so just, there's a lot of ways and a lot of impact on a lot of different things. So that's the reason the question mark you saw is on my name. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. We have one final individual signed up to speak, Jonathan Bennett. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Jonathan Bennett. I live at 3804 Rivermont Road, which is uh, uh, three lots down from uh, one of the lots that we're talking about tonight. Uh, I've lived there for 11 years now uh, with my family and my children. Um, like uh, Craig, who just spoke, I don't have a, a very strong opinion either way about this particular development. Uh, other than the following, uh, and that is, and it's been emphasized by a couple of speakers, that Rivermont is a narrow road, and there's a lot of potholes, and people, literally, there are no sidewalks except for a very short strip, uh, and people walk with their families up and down that road, and we are talking, if we go with the numbers that, that were quoted earlier, about basically doubling the number of families that, that use that stretch of road. Um, that's not reflected in the report that was given to you all. That, that looked at the traffic on Cole Mill, but Rivermont is what you'd have to go down to get to the development that we're, that we're talking about. So I do have a concern about the traffic uh, and about the safety of, of people walking, and it is a, a family neighborhood. People use that road all the time. Every evening you'll see people walking up and down the street there. So that, that's my biggest concern about, about uh, this, and I would ask that you uh, consider that carefully uh, and make sure that, that the safety issue and the transportation along Rivermont is attended to. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I know the proponents, you had an additional two minutes, and we, we let the uh, opponents and those with some concerns have a little additional time, so I invite you back for a few more minutes. Okay. Thank you. Um, one thing I would like to highly point out is that we are not requesting additional density for what it is, what the property is currently zoned. Uh, as we pointed out earlier, we could put just as many homes on that property in its current zoning as we are proposing. So as far as the traffic load goes, it's not significantly impacted. Um, the other thing I would like to address uh, is the unit type. Um, I know people are scared of what multifamily looks like in a neighborhood, and Grayley Road, which is um, the newest development and where many of these people live, have homes on them that are between 3,000 and 4,000 square feet with attached garages. Our homes will not be larger than that. They will just have two or three units within them. So. When you look at the property, it will look like nine or 10 buildings which have additional units within them. So it will still maintain that feel of what a residential area looks like. And I'd like, I'd like to speak to the issue of Rivermont Road. Um, and this is hearsay, so take it for what you will. We did speak with a couple of residents along Rivermont Road. That is not a true right-of-way. It is currently a right-of-way by maintenance. The state park actually owns the majority of Rivermont's true roadway. They do not want it paved. They have fought against the DOT in getting it paved in the past as the DOT has tried to come through and make improvements on Rivermont. And the state park did not want them. This is my understanding through hearsay, so take it as you will, but that's um, based on a neighbor who lives on Rivermont near Valley Springs, who's been there for a few decades, and his recollection of what occurred. So I just wanted to address that. Great. Thank you all very much. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak in the public hearing? Yes, ma'am, please come on up. 
Again, if you can give us your name and your address, we would ask that you be brief in your comments. Um, hi. Sorry, I wasn't planning on speaking. <laughs> My name is Jennifer Strobel, and I live at 3704 Rivermont Road, which is snap dab in the middle. If you're turning onto Rivermont to head towards that property, I'm probably the middle house on the right-hand side. So I, the area photos that I saw that you had put up don't really reflect going into that area, um, like cutting through that neighborhood. And just like the, the neighbors that you mentioned on the Valley Spring side, that's on the other side of the development. And that also is not paved. That's all gravel back in there. So our end of the street is actually paved. And safety is a huge issue, especially when you're looking at however many families are gonna be pulling into that development. They're pulling off of Coal Mill on <coughs> Rivermont where the lane splits, Sorry. but it's not, there's a light there, but it's past Rivermont. So you're looking at stopping traffic back there. And then with schools and school buses, both my children, um, I've been there for 19 years too, by the way, on the street. Um, my kids have grown up on this road and we are the people who are walking. My dog patrols the street. If you're speeding, he will, he will run out at you. If you're driving the speed limit, he will not. <laughs> but um, you really, I, safety is a huge issue and that intersection is a big deal especially if you're looking at a minimum of 25 cars. If there's two cars per household or whatever, you're looking at 50 vehicles going in and out of there, a minimum. And you've got the narrowness of the road, the potholes as well that are horrible that they fill, but then the next day the gravel's all out of them again. Um, and it's just a different, both ends are completely different. Was there any consideration given to Baldwin being an entry point to that development other than Rivermont? No, just across the creek. Great, thank you, ma'am. Actually, if you don't mind, if you could come and fill out uh, this form for the record, that'd be great. We are now gonna move to close the public hearing. Thank you. And commissioners with any questions or comments? We'll start on my start on my left this time. <laughs> Commissioner. All right, Commissioner Williams, and then Commissioner Gibbs. Um, I have more of a comment, if you will, um, in terms of your design process and what it is that you're attempting to do here as aging in place is a huge thing um, that not many people are addressing. And I think that your consideration of rezoning to reduce the amount of actual properties and addressing the capacity of um, having, even though it will be multifamily, but multi-story, but it has a single family appeal to it. And the need of having, if you're gonna address the issue of aging in place, then long driveways and attachments aren't necessarily um, beneficial to what it is that you're trying to do. And I think that possibly in developing in this area, more attention will be driven towards the roads in an effort to make them better and more habitable. And I definitely understand your concerns in terms of you walk on this road and your children play and it's more of a crossway. My other understanding is if they don't come through with the considerations that they have and because this land is still available, like it was stated before, you're gonna to have to pick your poison because other considerations may not be given. So it may be a higher density and even more of a traffic headache, if you will, or a hazard if someone else comes through and they decide that they wanna develop and they're seeking to develop it as is currently zoned and opposed to reducing the zoning requirements, if I'm understanding this correctly. Um, I think that from your conversation about it, I think that what you're proposing is a healthy benefit to this area. And I think that it will increase traffic, but given what the ideal 
target resident is. I don't think that the traffic impact will be as vast. It won't be as frequent, and it will vary throughout the day, um, especially um, given the targeted areas. Some, I think the maximum is like four persons per multifamily or multi-complex, well, multiplex dwelling. So that's not necessarily significant in opposed to having a facility or a building that is constructed where you have, you know, two parents, two kids, multiple, uh, you got a minivan, you got a car, you got a truck. I don't think that that's where we're going with here. I think that it's, it's similar to what's been proposed. And I think that your, your charrette process was helpful because I can tell by the way that you're looking at constructing these buildings that you studied the area and you looked at it. Um, I also have a concern that it sounds like most of the issues are about the potholes that I don't know that whether we approve or deny this is going to change whether or not those potholes get filled by more than gravel. So I'm inclined to vote for it. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Gibbs. Uh, I'm going to support this too. Uh, I like cluster uh, housing uh, as a concept, a building concept. Uh, you get the ver you can get variable density and and still uh, retain some openness uh, and its applicability for affordable housing and marketing marketable development. I also like the idea, because of my age, I guess, uh, but not necessarily, co-housing investment. I think it's a coming thing. I, we've already seen uh, th about three in the Durham area, and uh, I, I, I think it this particular uh, proposal will work in this area and as far as traffic and getting something done about potholes and paving and all of that the more people you've got there the more influence I hope uh, with the city the county the state or whoever is responsible for that so I I think it would be a plus uh, so I, I'm going to support this I, and thank you for this concept. Great, thank you, Commissioner Gibbs. Commissioner Miller? So I thought I understood this project, but now I'm not sure I do. Um, so if, if one of you could come and answer some questions, I'd be very grateful. So it's your intention to make a co-housing project, but I don't see any commitment to co-housing. Um, in, in the development plan. It doesn't have to be co-housed. Correct, yeah. I mean, we did not commit to that with a text commitment. But I it will be condos. Mm -hmm. All right. And there's a 24-acre parcel that you own, but the rezoning is only half of that. Yes, it's approximately 22 whole acres, and then we are uh, rezoning a little over 12 of them. All right. And, but we talked about the remaining property and putting that in conservation, uh, and the implication of that was is taking it out of development. Correct. That would be but the is there, But there's no commitment to that. Correct. So that may or may not happen. Our goal is to... Um, I understand by, your goal. I'm just trying, no, to, by get, leaving I'm the, trying to understand the, the, the legal limits of what we're talking about. Here. Right. By leaving the RS-20 designation to encourage a... Uh, conservation agency to purchase the land. I appreciate that, but that's so not there is anything. not a commitment. We can't count on that. Correct. Uh, and somebody could turn around and build on the buildable parts of that. Yes, and and so help me to understand if I believe you said if if we were to develop the entire twenty two acres as RS twenty, how many units would that yield? Forty forty two. Pardon me. Forty two. 42, and uh, the actual unit count for the 12 acres that's the subject of this rezoning, Correct. Uh, how many would that be developed as RS-20? Uh, 
Um, so what was mine? 32? Yes. 32. Pardon me? 32. 32, but you propose to put 24 in there. Correct. So that is a, a reduction. Yes. The remaining portion that's outside that, how many RS-20 units could go on that if your rezoning passes uh, but no conservation agency comes in and somebody maxes out the RS-20 development potential of the property? Uh, it's 10. I don't know how many. Yeah, 10, 10 would be the absolute max, and that's using a cluster subdivision. Mm -hmm. So we really okay. did max it out. Right. So uh, so if this is rezoning is passed, and you get to 24 units that, that will be condoed and have some multifamily aspect to them um, on the subject property, and then 10 there, that's 34 as opposed to the 42 that if we didn't do anything at all. So it is a net, if the rezoning passes, even if there's no conservation, there's a net gain. And if you do later get a conservation agency to come and take that, then the, the gain is even better. But that's outside the scope of the rezoning. Correct. Uh, but I appreciate you telling us about it. I, uh, I just wanted to get these numbers in my mind. Um, one of the things that bothers the neighbors is it's not just density, it's form. Mm -hmm. And you have tried to say, well, we're going to build the houses across the, the, the street in, the, in that single shot cul-de-sac. There's some flopping big houses down there. And that you're saying your, your buildings will not be bigger than those, uh, but will just be shared living. There'll be two or three units or maybe four units, I don't know. But you don't have a commitment in your development plan limiting the maximum size of any one of your buildings, except for the rooming house can't be bigger than 4,000 square feet. Correct. We are happy to add a commitment to that. If you put a commitment in there that says, that says no building on your property will be bigger than a certain number of square feet, mm -hmm. uh, that is a step towards your commitment to a single family residential scale that would be at least similar to the top end of the Rivermont, the paved Rivermont community. Yes. Uh, and it might make it, I know I would feel better about your assertion as to how these units will look uh, mm -hmm. if you added that in. I'm not going to speak for your neighbors. Okay. Uh, I also know that you say that there will be no architectural style. It might help if, if you've got a concept for your architectural style or a range, it might make them feel better and trust the, that what is built there will be residential looking rather than non-residential looking if you contemplated uh, a, a, a commitment to a, a one or more residential styles that you feel comfortable working with them. Those are just suggestions. Um, other than that, uh, even though there are not commitments for conservation and there are not commitments uh, for co-housing, uh, uh, I think that with commitments to maximum building size and, and architectural style directed uh, at this, the overall benefit for, in terms of the impacts that the neighbors have expressed concern about is better. Um, uh, and I don't believe, if you did not own this piece of property, somebody soon would be developing it. Uh, and they probably wouldn't be asking for RS-20. They'd be in here asking for a PDR of something even more, another kind of PDR that would allow them also to cope more, more uh, fully with all the, the environmental issues that this property is impacted by uh, at a greater density. Uh, and we would be considering it. Uh, so I'm not sure that, that, that if we rolled the dice again on this piece of property that it would come up with a better number for, for the neighbors based upon the concerns I heard them express. So I'm going to vote for this, but I do hope going forward you will consider those extra commitments. Uh, don't give away more than you can afford to, but if you can give, if you can give away something you're not going to use that makes them feel better, then I encourage you to do that. Mr. Wiggins? Thank you. I just want to clarify one thing there, Commissioner Miller. Um, the 
area that you're referring to for the conservation area is not subject to this rezoning, so the applicant can't proffer any commitments for that area. Right, I wasn't asking them to. Sure, just making that. I, I was making that point too. Commissioner Durkin. I just had a question on the traffic and access to the Rivermont Road. Your proposal will just have one entry point to yes. Rivermont. So if there if the rezoning wasn't approved, then you would have multi, you could potentially have multiple driveways that would go right on to Rivermont. It, the way it is, um, wait, I, can they see this? <laughs> there's an there's an image I can see right here. Yeah, we've got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I guess I just wanted to make the and make sure that I was understanding the point correctly that your plan would limit the access, the direct access, whether or not it would limit the number of cars. I don't really, that wasn't really my point, but just mm -hmm. the impact of directly onto Rivermont would be beneficial, I would think, for the neighbors. Yes. Yeah, and I mean, we did not run the ability to put multiple driveways by transportation or anything. This yeah. is just a layout that was done schematically. Um, right. But we are maintaining the existing driveway entrance with our development plan, so it's really not any new driveway impacts onto Rivermont. Um, Commissioner Satterfield. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think that uh, Commissioner Miller's questions mostly answered my concerns, one of which was whether the development plan was sufficient without any additional tax commitments to keep this from going in the direction of just your typical condominium development as opposed to a co-housing type of a development. Um, but overall, I'm mostly concerned with the um, keeping the density down, but in particular, um, the conservation of that northern piece, even though that's not part of what's being um, uh, requested to rezone at this time, um, as an additional buffer for the park and as an additional amenity for whoever ends up living on this property. So um, even though, again, that's not a commitment that you can make um, as part of this request, I'm hoping and urging you to pursue some strategy for doing that. Yes, we are. Okay, Commissioner Bryan. Thank you. A uh, couple of questions for staff. Um, attachment 7, Summary of Development Plan. Uh, on the required information, it says on the on the summary it's three access points, but we've heard numerous times we're only one access point. And under text commitments, there's a statement about providing a contribution to the Durham Public Schools, and I didn't see that anywhere. Thank you, Commissioner Bryan, for pointing that out and catching that. Um, that was on all. That was in an early edition of the development plan. That is the applicant has since stricken that, so that should not be there. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I also have a question for Mr. Judd. <laughs> is it, I'm probably going to defer to Ms. Thomas, but... <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> it will all be relieved if you do. Uh, is this within the city limits, this area? No, it is not. It is not? Uh, yeah, it is. Sorry, do you, Rivermont Road itself is in the city. This particular parcel has a pending annexation petition, so they, they are proposing annexation. Okay, so Rivermont is in the city, and that leads to the transportation question. If it's in the city, can't the city DOT do something about improving Rivermont? Um, Rivermont is a state-maintained road. Well, can so you... CDOT would be responsible for maintenance. Can you guys uh, nudge the state DOT in any way? I mean, I'm sympathetic to their concerns, but I think their concerns would not be as great if uh, Rivermont was in better shape. That's where I'm coming from. <laughs> and I guess for the applicant, thank you, for the applicant... Is there any way you can push getting Rivermont improved? I mean, if if it's going to remain a bad road, you may not have very many people interested in your development. I don't think it's that bad. I, 
Go ahead. <laughs> Valid concern. Um, I, the DOT is notoriously fun to work with. Um, I think we can try our best. That's all we can really promise. Um, there's, you know, we can ask, I think. But uh, again, a parent, as I said with the hearsay uh, thing, the DOT has tried to improve this road and the state park worked against it. So I'm not sure where, how those two state departments aren't working together on that, but. Um, well, let's start by pushing DOT and see what you get. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Gross. Thank you, Chair. So I have a lot of the same concerns that Tom, um, sorry, Commissioner Miller <laughs> <laughs> brought up um, about the lack of certain commitments despite the representations from the applicant about certain things. So one of the things that um, Commissioner Miller did not mentioned, but what I heard today was um, that there there would only be like nine or ten buildings. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that's something you could add a commitment to. I don't know if that would alleviate any of the neighbors' concerns, but uh, I, I just find it odd that you would have a development plan that doesn't have some of those like, easier commitments that seem to be part of your uh, plan for development of this property in the first place. Um, the other thing is I don't think it was said here, but or said tonight, but I did get an email from uh, Stewart, the consultant group, uh, ab about the intent to preserve that area that is that you own, which is not part of this rezoning. Um, and I guess at the time I didn't realize that it wasn't part of the rezoning and assumed that it was a commitment. And not that I have. I'm not making a comment on, on whether that's good or bad. I'm just confused as to why that is being, um, why that is being offered from the consultant group but not being offered as a tax commitment in, on the development plan. It, it makes it hard to evaluate it because it, it was presented as that's what this project is, but in fact, it does not appear to be that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm sorry if the language was unclear in um, any other communication, but because it's not part of this uh, piece of land, it's not it's not in any way a commitment that we can make. Um, and just to speak, one, there's a financial aspect of zonings are based on the acreage. So to double the zoning acreage would also have a fee that gets doubled. And so when you're not getting any sort of... Um, when you don't need to rezone something, you don't necessarily want to pay a fee that's twice as much to rezone it, even if you do want to commit to preserving it in the future. Um, and I know there was some benefit to leaving it as RS20 as an incentive to actually um, preserve yeah. it. As an incentive to the preservation agencies to show that it could be developed as opposed to when you say it can't be developed because it's a commitment, you then have no value in it. It, it will not earn you any money from a, an agency that would want to preserve it. Well, I, I can appreciate that. Uh, I guess I would say then maybe you should make your communications more yes. uniform because that's not the case I'm right sorry. now. Okay. Um, the, oh, the other thing that I was going to, I think Commissioner Miller did mention this, but uh, we've heard several times that the buildings will be residential in nature or whatever. I mean, there's an opportunity to add architectural conditions, which I think would, um, you know, make that part of this uh, zoning case. I don't know if that's something you guys are interested in or, or you know, what extra tax commitments you would be interested in adding. Uh, I, for one, would like to see them if that's something you guys are interested in. And, and not that I don't support the idea of this case, but I would be interested. I mean, if it's something that you're telling people you're going to do and something that you were willing to put into a zoning commitment, I'd be inclined to continue this matter so that you can add those commitments. Yeah, OK. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to make commitments to the, the building size, the number of buildings, um, calling it co-housing, all of those things. So. If that helps, I mean, it makes me more comfortable about what's committed. That's all. Great. And do you, do you mind 
just repeating for the record and for the staff your yes. commitments? Well, what are the commitments? Well, or what, what you just said? What I just said was I'm happy to make commitments about the number of buildings, okay. the size of those buildings, and the fact that it will be a co-housing community. Can we articulate that? This is Jake Wiggins with the Planning Department. Can you re repeat, if there was a proffer, will you repeat it, please? So, There's not a proffer. No. Okay. There was no proffer? I just I wanted to make sure that we were clear. I think it, it's a proffer for openness of proffering. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a proffer. Do you, do you want to proffer to tax commitments today that are therefore put on our development plan for the next spring? And then you would say exactly what you're offering. I would encourage them to. So you're going to say between? That's a 60 day commitment. Okay. I can so, do that. Okay. So can you say like Continue. committing to buildings of 2,000 square feet or less? Right. right. Like, exactly. So yes, if you would like me to make specific commitments right now, I can do that. Oh. Thank you. Yep. Any other okay. commissioners with questions or comments? Commissioner Al Turk. What are the proffers? Yeah, I want to. Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> so, um, Jacob, are you ready? Okay, and I will just remi remind the applicant that depending upon these proffers, this may be subject to a recommendation for an automatic two month continuation. Oh. <laughs> That's a very long time. <laughs> Um, so how do we evaluate uh, whether or not that continuation would occur? Read your proffers, please. Okay. Yeah. Commissioner Miller. Okay. Well, I think the thing to do is to, is to make your proffers conditional, conditioned upon his response. Okay. I mean, we'll let you unproffer them if, if, if you're not satisfied, uh, if it triggers a delay. No. It may affect how you <clears throat> Commissioner Miller, I'm sorry to interrupt. There, there's not proffering and unproffering. We're either proffering commitments or we're not proffering commitments. Well, um, might I suggest that we give the That's applicant ridiculous. an opportunity to meet with uh, the staff short, like right now, yeah. to talk about some of these and see if they change their answer to whether they're willing to commit to anything tonight. Uh, I do have some other questions, so I think now would be a good time if you can. Okay. Well, Commissioner Ghosh, if you have additional questions, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I did want to address, you guys can, yeah. I did want to ask Mr. Koresh, I think it was, Parish, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, your, you had three points, I believe, and number one was that uh, what is in the city's or the city's assumptions are based off of maybe some incorrect information or something that is different than what is planned. Um, but I don't think you had an opportunity to expand upon that, and I didn't quite understand what the, these disconnects were, and I was hoping you could explain that to me. Certainly. The, the, the development plan that... I saw was the multi-story, multi-building condo complex design with remote parking lots, a very industrial um, suburban shopping center type of, of architecture. What I heard presented by the city at the beginning of the session was a development plan that consisted of single family dwellings. Understood. My point was, that the information on which the city was operating and the information on which this body might be operating was vastly different than the development plan which was in the minds of these individuals and there was a substantial disconnect. Any predetermined considerations or decisions based upon that original design plan wouldn't hold based upon the design plan that was offered here. All right, thank you, that, that, that clears that up for me. So staff, let me ask you all about that. My understanding is that, I mean, the assumptions that you all made uh, were about 24 single family lots and we have heard that, in fact, it won't be single family, 24 single family lots, it'll be 24 dwelling units. Mm -hmm. um, I think most of these assumptions are related to transportation and utility impacts. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any comments on how the change in the product type would change those numbers? <laughs> It'll have no impact. Okay, so you think that in general it would be the I mean, same? The, the, yeah, generally speaking, staff is going to go with the most intense option in, okay. in terms of number generating, um, and usually that's going to be a single family structure. Understood. Mm -hmm. Understood. Um, okay. Uh, I see that the applicants and uh, their representatives are, have taken a seat here, so I assume they may be ready to 
make or not make some proffers. So I would invite you up to the podium to do that or not. <laughs> yes. Um, so we are willing to commit that no structure be more than 4,000 square feet. And um, I'm not sure how to separate the how to separate the homes from the rooming house. If I should just say number of buildings total. Oh, yeah. So I just <clears throat> say twelve. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, and a maximum of twelve structures. Not including the existing barn. Correct. Maximum of 12 structures, not including oh. the existing barn. barn. I should say say primary dwelling structures. How about that? Does that clarify it? <laughs> I don't know. Staff, does that clarify it? Mr. Wiggins, <laughs> Jacob Wiggins is a plain apartment. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't want to have a gazebo end up being, or a play structure. Yeah, I mean, it would be considered a structure, so I would yes. urge you. Yes. Okay. That is a structure. A gazebo is a structure. Okay, so I, I need to figure out how to use my terminology here then. Inhabited dwelling in structures. Dwelling structures. Is that a term? Or I mean, and, you can and, just count that gazebo as one, so you would have, have no more than four. Yeah. Can so, I and then I, Jacob Wiggins is playing apartment. This is the exact reason why <laughs> yeah, staff has be. these rules in place. Yes. So. <clears throat> If we need to wordsmith this, then staff would recommend a continuation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I, I, would, I would recommend it's important to get this right. Okay. And so if, if you are able to do so, I believe it would be appropriate to have this continued for two cycles to ensure that what is brought back before us works mm -hmm. and, and gets at what you're trying to achieve and to make sure that we don't have to then come back again in the future. Commissioner Williams? Yeah, I, I just... I want to know, like, at this very moment, whether or not these text commitments are proffered or committed to, does this affect anybody on the commission's ability to vote on whether or not they want to approve this tonight? Because no. if it doesn't, then it seems like it's unnecessary pressure for them to commit to something if it's not going to affect your vote as it's already been presented. So a delay in this is kind of delaying the inevitable in order to make us feel comfortable about something we either are going to already vote for or not vote for. So interesting. It's a fair question. That's a question. You know. okay. So I'd, I'd, I would ask, this is the opportunity for discussion among the commissioners. I would ask that you address the chair when you're asking a question, but you may ask the chair to ask other members to share their thoughts. So Commissioner Williams has asked the question, and if people have Thoughts they would like to share, please let me know. Commissioner Ghosh. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, exactly that. It would make a difference to me, but primarily because of what we have been told here today and the opportunity. I mean, they have a development plan, so I don't see why they would tell us any of these things if they're not willing to commit to that. That's the only reason. Right. Commissioner Bryan. I agree with Commissioner Ghosh. Other commissioners? Commissioner Durkin. I'm ready to vote. I, I don't think a delay is necessary. Commissioner Miller? Uh, quite frankly, if they're willing to say no structure more than 4,000 square feet, and we know how many yeah. units they're going to build, I don't care how many buildings there are. That's a simple empirical uh, proffer. With that proffer alone, I'm ready to give this project my support. I would love to see an architectural commitment going forward, but I'm not going to delay it for that. Commissioner Van. Yeah, um, you know, I, I agree with um, Miller and Ghosh and all. Um, I, I would just say that uh, I just just think in the future, you know, especially when we get to points like this, you know, you know, I'm a history kind of guy, so I guess I see things kind of different from most of y'all. Uh, but you know, um, I think when you have you're trying to work out some language. Uh, and, you know, and what happens when you rush language, you make mistakes. And these are mistakes that will have impacts, not necessarily on us, it's going to impact you and, and what we do here as well. And so um, I, I just think that somewhere along the line, we got to get this process kind of cleaned up all around. Um, but I also agree that I, I think by now, you, you know enough about what you're going to do, whether you're going to vote or not. And I know I'm ready to vote. If, <clears throat> that's my recommendation. Thank you. Commissioner Gibbs. Let's get on with it. All right. I'm ready to vote. So I just want to make sure before we vote, 
I want to hear from the staff uh, what are the what are the commitments that we have noted that will be part of what we are voting on. Thank you, Jacob Wiggins of the Planning Department. Um, I have three proffers. Um, the first one being two that they showed earlier regarding the unit type, as well as the preservation of the evergreen buffer. And then the third most recent one was that no structure will be greater than 4,000 square feet. And do the applicants agree with, with this situation? So we're all in agreement that these are the proffers that are in front of us? Great, thank you very much. This, Commissioner Van, is a perfect example of we took one extra minute and we all know what we're voting on. So at this point, <laughs> I would entertain a motion for approval with these proffers. Mr. Chairman, I move that we send case Z18 quadruple 07 forward to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. Second. As long as it includes uh, the three proffers which Jacob just reviewed for us. Yes, yeah, second. Great. That is properly moved and seconded. This is correct. This is going to the City Council given the annexation. Great. Uh, we'll take a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Alturk. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Ghosh. Yes. Commissioner Bryan. Yes. Commissioner Satterfield. Yes. Commissioner Durkin. Yes. Commissioner Hyman. Yes. Commissioner Miller. Yes. Commissioner Ketchen. Yes. Commissioner Hornbuckle. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Commissioner Van. Yes. Commissioner Gibbs. Yes. And uh, Commissioner Williams. Yes. And Chair uh, Busby. Yes. Motion passes 13 to zero. Thank you. Thank you all for staying very late this evening and for engaging in the process. Together. So you might think we're done, but if you flip your agenda to the back page, we do have new business. We have uh, the sign ordinance revisions. This is an information item this evening. This is item TC17 quadruple zero two. And, and here's the man with the information. Michael Stock <laughs> is what's between us and going home. You thought you were going home, but lo and behold, oh, I love this. you got some sign stuff to take care of, or at least this is a form about. Let me pull this up quickly. Um, I'm here with uh, senior city attorney assistant. Deputy, is it deputy or si assistant? Senior assistant city attorney uh, Don O'Toole, who has been instrumental in with helping us uh, draft these regulations, and for. Um, some of the newer members on planning commission. Uh, sometimes we like to bring larger text amendments to the planning commission a month or so ahead of time to kind of just brief you before you're just jumping right into a public hearing setting, especially ones that are uh, a little more complicated. Um, you might have questions or you might, it gives you time to even formulate questions between now and the public hearing. Um, if you catch a typo, let me know, um, that kind of thing. But also if you do, after this uh, uh, presentation, if you do have questions, you're more than welcome to forward them on to me and Don and, and we will either be able to respond to you then or bring them with us to the public hearing uh, to address them uh, with the body. Um, this is uh, revisions to sign regulations. I'm so sorry, I keep thinking. Uh, we're just, this presentation is very similar to what was presented to the JCCPC in April and at a public meeting held in May. Um, we're gonna just give a project background how we, quickly how we got here. Um, Don's gonna go over a lot of the legal issues behind it and, and so any of the, the nitty gritty law issues, uh, Don's here to answer or at least look into further if we can't answer it tonight. Um, and same with the ordinance revision overview, just kind of walk you through some of the changes. I'm not gonna go line by line with every change, but kind of highlight the big changes. And if there's something in there that you didn't see I, that I mentioned, but you noticed within the, within the changes, again, feel free to ask. It wasn't meant to be all inclusive. Um, and I don't actually, I'm sorry, I don't know if I have the next steps. And next steps is the public hearing itself. Um, so the background, um, back in 2015, the town of Gilbert, Arizona, went uh, versus Reed 
uh, went to the Supreme Court, and it was a case uh, focusing on non-commercial temporary signs, and it resulted in a uh, overturning of their uh, regulations based upon um, uh, needing to uh, focus more uh, strictly on time, place, and manner uh, provisions. Again, it was focusing on non-commercial temporary signs. Uh, there were multiple, and Don will get into it, there were multiple opinions on it, although they all came to one general conclusion on the case itself. There were uh, multiple opinions issued, uh, so it made it a very tricky uh, signs are tricky in and of themselves with uh, First Amendment free, free speech issues. Um, this ruling was even trickier because of the varying opinions of how to handle signs. Um, so what we did was we did a, a contract with a consultant, which did a, they did an initial assessment and they did a presentation back uh, to the JCCPC Council and Board of Commissioners back in 2017. Unfortunately, were released uh, due to issues we had uh, with their uh, work product and, and uh, responsiveness. Uh, so I got to take it over. <laughs> um, in 2017, it, it felt it uh, primarily Don and myself, uh, Brian Mardell over at the County Attorney's Office also was involved. Um, and other staff too. Uh, we drafted numerous uh, versions and then we finally took it to the JCCPC in April 2018. I was not at that meeting, Don was. Um, but um, the draft you see here is 99.9% .9 generally what JCCPC reviewed. Um, and they had, and, and Chair Busby, I don't know if you were at that meeting also, but if my, from what I was told and you, uh, Chair Busby and Don can also correct me, they saw no issues whatsoever, and they kind of went through it in pretty detail also uh, with it. Uh, we did have a public review in May 2008. Uh, in May, uh, no substantial uh, comments were received. The sign industry was notified um, about this, and they actually did send in comments, and most of their comments were kind of just preferential. You should change some of the percentages of this and that. There weren't any substantive, like, read, like, oh, oh my gosh, you're, this isn't what read says kind of thing. Um, so now I'm going to toss, toss it over to Don to just go over the legal background a bit more. Mm -hmm. Good evening, everyone, and I know you've been here a long time. Try not to uh, belabor things. My name again is Don O'Toole. I'm an attorney with the city attorney's office and I have the good fortune of working with our planning department, which I really enjoy. Um, like Mike said, um, Reed B. Gilbert came out of the US Supreme Court in 2015. Just so you know, the city actually was sort of uh, thinking about thinking about our sign ordinance provisions as early as 2014. There were some like signs that were put up throughout the city that um, were a little bit controversial, so uh, attacking the county sheriff. So there was some thought to uh, eventually looking at the sign ordinance provisions. And actually, a lot of what came out of the Reed case, um, we were sort of anticipating we might need to do with our sign ordinance. The Reed case, this uh, a town in Arizona, and I've never been to Gilbert, Arizona, but it's been described to me as a little bit like Cary for what that's worth. Um, I would argue that this is potentially a case of bad facts or bad regulations or not knowing when to stop um, that sort of led, I won't say bad law, but basically a Supreme Court case that basically is upsetting every municipal sign ordinance across the country. And although this came out, this case came out in 2015, Durham is actually on the cutting edge of sort of getting our sign ordinance up to speed with this, um, with this uh, Supreme Court decision. Let me just uh, read a little bit of some of the facts of the case, just so you know what I'm talking about. The um, town of Gilbert had a bunch of different categories of signs that they regulated in different ways. One category, and that's what was at issue in this case, was what the town referred to as temporary directional signs. And they defined that kind of sign as a sign directing the public to a church or other qualifying event. 
And then um, the case goes on to say a qualifying event was defined as any assembly, gathering, activity, or meeting sponsored, arranged, or promoted by a religious, charitable, community service, educational, or other similar nonprofit organization. So if you were gonna put up a temporary sign in the town and you fell into that category, you then had to follow these onerous regulations and you can judge for yourself uh, whether you think these regulations are good or not. You were permitted no more than four signs, limited to six square feet in size, um, and that size limit applied to any single property. And this was the thing that really, I think, killed uh, or caused the Supreme Court to rule the way it did. The sign could be up for no more than 12 hours before the qualifying event and one hour after the qualifying event. Here, um, Reed was the pastor of a very small church that did not actually have a fixed sanctuary location. So they traveled wherever they could find space. And the church members um, committed the onerous act or, or the egregious act of putting up 15 to 20 signs around the town. Um, the members would go out early in the day on Saturday to put up the signs so that people would know where church service was gonna be on Sunday. And then they would take the signs down by midday on Sunday. And the town of Gilbert decided to Bust. bring down the hammer on them. Um, needless to say, I think if the planning department tried to do something similar in Durham, I think, I think they would have the good sense not to do that. But um, I would probably advise them to be cautious there. So this, um, that sign ordinance that I just read to you is clearly content-based. In order to know what the rules are that apply to that sign, you'd have to read the sign and then you'd know what the rules are. The court said whenever something is content-based, it receives what um, in constitutional law terms is called strict scrutiny. The thing you need to most know most about strict scrutiny is whenever the court says that, it's almost inevitably gonna find that the act was illegal because it's a really hard test. The test would require the government to show that it furthers a compelling governmental interest. So we couldn't have churches put up signs for more than 12 hours and um, take them down by one o'clock in the afternoon, and that it's narrowly tailored to achieve that interest. Like Mike said, one thing that the court pointed out is um, sign regulations that are content neutral that basically regulate the time that it, a, a sign is up, the place that it can be put up, and the manner in which it's put up only receives rational basis review. And basically all that means is the city council has to have sort of a, a good sounding reason for the rule. Did I lose the Okay. Okay, so the, the, this opinion, the primary opinion, uh, the, this current Supreme Court frequently has many different opinions, but Justice Thomas wrote the primary opinion, and he, he sort of gave us three principles. He said there are some things it's okay to regulate that, that would pass, um, that, aren't, that are content neutral. Size of the sign, materials that the sign is made out of, lighting, moving parts, portability. Um, he also pointed out that local governments are free to um, impose uh, regulations on its own property as long as it does so in an even-handed even method. We can't say we like signs by Democrats, but we don't like signs by Republicans. Obviously, that would be a problem. Um, and then the last thing that Justice Thomas highlighted is Signs um, that are narrowly tailored to protect public safety would likely pass strict scrutiny. So signs, um, and, and you'll see this when Mike reviews the ordinance, but things like traffic signs in the right-of-way, um, the government can pretty much say where those signs can be. Um, the really useful opinion, um, and most commentators have said this, was written by Justice Alito. 
because um, I think the justices recognized how um, sort of the effect this opinion would have. And I think Justice Alito wanted to say, maybe the sky isn't falling. There are things that local governments can still regulate. And so his opinion is sort of helpful because it lays out things that he believes still would be legal. Regulating the size of a sign, the location of a sign, where it's located, whether it's lit or not, fixed message versus electronic, like digital billboarding kind of stuff, uh, distinctions for signs on public versus private property. Similarly, um, towns uh, could likely distinguish between signs on commercial and residential property. Um, one of the examples he could gave of um, regulating signs in the right-of-way is a, t a town could uh, theoretically have a limit on the number of signs in the right-of-way. They could say no more than X signs per mile or something like that. Off-premise versus on-premise distinctions theoretically are still legal. So an off-premise sign is a billboard, just so you know. Time restrictions on signs. So if temporary signs are allowed in the right-of-way, saying they can be up for no longer than X period of time. And generally, uh, to sum up what um, Justice Alito said, if regulations fall into the time, place, and manner category, then generally those kinds of regulations would uh, pass constitutional muster. All right, so let's get into uh, the fun part. Um, let's, we'll do an overview, just a quick overview of what this, these changes do and do not do. Um, one big thing that it, do, that it does, um, before I get into the list, is that it does reorganize the section substantially. So I apologize for a lot of the strike through and, and crossing out. I, it was kind of the nature of the beast for this project. So I tried to uh, make it as clear as possible. Um, there's a lot of sections were maintained, the wording was maintained or substantially maintained but just relocated. So I didn't really highlight that in gray. Areas that are in gray I tried to call your attention to as uh, areas that are either new or new wording altogether or substantially changed wording uh, from, from what's currently in the ordinance. So things that really haven't changed or had limited changes, and I keep grabbing this, which is not gonna do anybody any good. Um, it are the list of prohibited signs. Um, that list uh, had some minor modifications to it, but overall has stayed uh, as is. Um, again, uh, most general sign standard, so height, sign area, computation, illumination, everything you see on that list there hasn't changed. A substitution clause is something that has come out, that came out of a, another Supreme Court case, um, um, I'm blanking on the name, um, is it, I think it's Metropolitan, Metropolitan, where it says you can't show preference for uh, commercial speech over non-commercial speech, and you have to allow non-commercial speech wherever you allow commercial speech. So it's, it's, it's not allowing that preference. And almost every uh, reasonable sign ordinance that you find out there is gonna have some version of a substitution clause in there where it says this ordinance is, is not giving preference to commercial speech and, and, and such. Um, and then most sign types that we come to just generally understand and see, the freestanding signs, those pylon and monument signs, uh, wall signs, signs that project from a wall. Uh, we have a whole section on that. Um, and most of those standards really haven't changed. We have tweaked some of those standards based upon comments we've got. So we had a little bit of mission creep uh, with the versus the Reed v. Gilbert issues, but overall those standards have stayed the same and they've just been kind of recategorized. Uh, so what is changing? Uh, the purpose statements, we've we revised and updated them based upon the changes that we did to the regulations and to address uh, uh, the Reed v. Gilbert issues. Um, the definition of signs, um, we took a look at some other jurisdictions and saw their definition and actually we, we, we copied it from, I believe, um, or at least mostly copied it from Greensboro to give them props. Um, we found it a good general neutral definition of sign versus the one that we have that kind of lent, it, lent itself towards 
only considering signs in almost a commercial context. Um, so we cr did create a new exempt sign category. And so this is where we went into a little bit of content-based regulation. And um, we've seen this in other uh, regulations. There aren't a lot of other regulations to compare to. As Don mentioned before, we're kind of uh, doing new ground on this. Even some of the model uh, ordinances out there are kind of like, uh, they, they tried them out soon after Reed came out and then they kind of gave up because it's, it's, it's a real tough topic to uh, deal with. Um, we might be the first or second in the state to be really tackling this head on. Um, but for exempt signs, these are signs that are not going to be regulated by this ordinance. Um, they're either regulated um, by other ordinances or laws, um, but they're primarily also just straight up government signs um, and if they're not straight up government signs, they are still signs that relate to safety or wayfinding. Um, they're not promoting a commercial or any kind of interest, but they're, there's, we feel, at least in our best opinion, um, that these represent a very limited but compelling governmental interest. So we've kind of, the list is limited, um, and we did that on purpose, um, but we give that an exempt uh, uh, category. Um, there are a couple other uh, content-based uh, regulations that we added in there um, for um, uh, the electronic message boards, real-time changeable copy allowed for parking structures um, based upon regulating traffic circulation. Um, again, it's not promoting a certain parking structure, it's just they need to have that changed to be able to say if it's vacant or full. Um, it's very important that, that you get that, um, that real-time information. Um, the other new cat other new things are we set up instead of so we set up categories called temporary or permanent sign sections and it replaces as it says up there this current section called signs without permits allowed without permits and those are the, uh, those signs that read specifically addressed those are all those kind of temporary signs that were regulated based upon what the sign was doing so a real estate sign had a certain size and other parameters versus a banner sign had a certain size and parameters versus a real, um, uh, an incidental sign or an entryway sign. So we categorize them as temporary and permanent sign sections. Um, there's also a section just for right of way, but we took that away and just built in the right of way allowances into temporary or to permanent sign sections. Specifically for temporary signs, we, we developed a sign budget for each parcel with a focus on time, place, and manner instead of type of sign. And actually for single family, and I believe even duplex, uh, two family lots, we allow just an unlimited number of signs but regulated the size of those signs. Understanding that people who live there might have various things they want to say to their neighbors and people who drive by <laughs> and put them on different signs and who are we to say how many signs they should say or what or what they should say. Um, wait, wait, go back, please. What's that? Would you go over that again? Sure. So, under the temporary sign section, for page 31. So, under page 31, uh, under signs located on a parcel, uh, single or two-family residential signs, each parcel shall be allowed an unlimited number of commercial, uh, non-commercial temporary signs with a maximum height of three feet and maximum area of four square feet. Mr. Chairman? Yes. So I'm a little concerned is that we were saying we weren't going to be making commercial, non-commercial distinctions, but we're making commercial, non-commercial. We never said you can't. You can. That's actually one of the things that was left. Uh, well, that's what I thought. Yeah. But I thought you said the Metropolitan case actually eliminated No, those. no. What the Metropolitan says is that you can't preference commercial over non-commercial mm -hmm. in terms of your regulations. Right, because we've always... Right, and this is what it does. It allows non-commercial speech. Because we always had a distinction, and that distinction survives. Yes, yes. Uh, That's the substitution clause. Let, and then... Uh, never mind. Yeah. Go ahead. Fair. And then we do allow some additional signs when something is happening on that property. So if you're concerned about a real estate sign, so when a property happens to be for sale or for lease, you get a sign. We're not telling you what the sign says, 
So if you want to put your sign up for proper, up for um, uh, sale, but you don't want to put a real estate sign up, but you want to take advantage of that, that's fine. You're most likely going to put a real estate sign up, but the avenue is not to focus on what the sign is saying, but focus on the time, place, or manner of it. It's a, it's, it's a play on words, but it seems to work. Yeah. And I've seen it, and it's been mentioned in other references that we've, we've gone over. Um, limited temporary signs allowances in the right of way. Uh, one of the issues um, that was brought up and that the city currently has a policy on are the ghost bikes and other types of memorials. Uh, so we've built that into allowances for the right of way. Um, and then the si other signage allowed in right of way, and Don had mentioned um, the nefarious signs that were up a number of years ago. Um, so we've put in very specific time, place, and manner uh, provisions uh, four signs allowed in the right of way, uh, based upon actually the time period allowed set by the state for election signs. So, and that provision uh, uh, would be, so if you're not familiar with that, you're allowed, I believe, 30 days or so, before, 45 days, I'm sorry, the current ordinance is Before the first day of early days. voting. So, 45 days before the first day of early voting and up to, and I have it in there somewhere, but uh, 10 days after, you can do your election signs we're saying, okay, we're not making a distinction between election signs and other non-commercial signs. You can just have these kind of signs. We have a parameter on the size of them, but that would be it. And those are your sometimes two windows a year. I mean, it's generally two windows a year because you might have a primary and the general election um, when you can have your limited free-for-all for, for non-commercial signs. And then we currently have provisions for sidewalk signs in very specific zoning districts and that was primarily maintained. The sidewalk signs. Uh, like the A-frame signs or the temporary sandwich signs. Sandwich board. Sandwich board signs, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. We maintained that, we relocated that, um, tweaked some of the parameters of when they needed to be removed, but um, otherwise remained the same. There was another whole section in there too that, that related to some additional parameters that just actually didn't make sense, so we just kind of took that out. Permanent signs. Uh, we created a new minimum sign allowance for any property. So any property doesn't have to worry about getting a commercial sign permit at all up to three square feet of signage on their property. Once they go above that, and that takes care of things like home occupation signs and other kind of small commercial type signs that your ADT or CPI type signs or, or that kind of thing that are, um, uh, uh, that require that kind of signage. You don't have to worry about getting a sign permit for it, but once you have signage that's above that three square feet, then all your signage has to conform to the, uh, uh, you have to get the sign permits and, and meet those standards. Um, again, we've maintained most of the current sign types and most of the standards are already time, place, and manner, so we didn't have to adjust a lot of those. Any of the changes that we did uh, were suggestions or, uh, or addressing some issues with those signs, and it was a bit of mission creep that we tried to keep down, but we felt that while we were messing with the ordinance, just take advantage of it. Um, that includes like clarifying the difference between a monument and pylon sign. Um, uh, we removed the wayfinding standards and off-premise non-residential entry signs, uh, thus that was the deletion of the wayfinding sign plan. We're handling wayfinding signs as, as an exempt type of sign. Um, and the off-premise non-residential entry signs that was something that was added in a couple years ago for a particular project, and when we when we took a look at that in detail, it just didn't seem like it could pass muster. Mayor, Mr. Chairman, it's to our yes. opinion, Mr. So Miller, help me understand why a wayfinding sign is not a problem. You have to look at it to to, to distinguish it from the uh, the sheriff is a, is a dirty bomb. Well, why is a wayfinding sign, why can we make a distinction between a wayfinding sign and a sign that's not a wayfinding sign? Why is that not? That's, that's where we are taking and making an assumption um, and making a best educated determination that there's a compelling governmental interest to get people moving in an efficient manner throughout the city and throughout the property. Mm -hmm. And directing buses and... Calculated cars. risk, in other words. Yeah. yeah. There's...
All right, traffic, All right good. Traffic and, yeah, traffic and safety signs, yeah. Um, we relocated the landmark sign section into the actual landmark designation section in Article 13, in Article 3, because it just seems to work better than, that was another Mission Creek kind of issue just to clean up that section. Um, and then we did, as you'll note in there, uh, we made some modifications and additions to some definitions. Um, so some of the things that, uh, these were notable considerations that we definitely brought up to JCCPC and at the, at the public meeting, um, real estate directional signs, and maybe you have received emails and phone calls from uh, real estate folks, and we have met with real estate folks, so this is not something that we are not unaware of. Um, they're currently allowed in right of way. Um, right now, as proposed, they are, would no longer be allowed in right of way. Except for during election period. Ex no, those are, com yeah, those are commercial, si those are commercial, yeah, okay. commercial signage, so they would not be allowed at all. Um, changeable copy, we deleted a larger allowance that was specific for theaters, so we didn't see a compelling governmental interest to allow that, except for the allowance that we made for parking structures for full or, or not full. Okay. We removed uh, a, com uh, a conflicting uh, sign calculation area of aggregate sign area. Uh, we have very specific sign allowances for the different sign types, how much you can have for a wall sign, and it was conflicting with the aggregate sign area. Uh, provision, so we felt that you know what it it seems, uh, and and the default has always kind of gone to the specific when there was conflict and looking at historically how it's been regulated, um, it seems to be working. So we didn't seem to need to change it. So we just got rid of this aggregate sign area calculation, um, and again the signs and br we brought it back to their attention signs within the public right of way. Uh, it addresses those roadside memorials when there was a fatality. We, that was one of the tweaks. We kind of narrowed it down to uh, the type of incident in the um, uh, right of way. And also uh, tried to find that middle ground of not allowing signs in an unlimited basis throughout the right of way and also not going the other way of just restricting uh, signs within the right of way besides, besides state governmental or wayfinding signs in the right of way. Trying to find that middle ground and using the uh, election period as as at least a good middle ground. Um, again, we have spoken to the real estate folks about it. Uh, we know their concerns. Uh, we went over it with them. Um, uh, we also said if they can come up with language that would help us, that would work, we are open for it. We weren't looking to be punitive just to real estate folks. Um, and um, And then also understanding that if city council and the board of commissioners felt their their needs were compelling and they wanted to go in a direction that was beyond the recommendation of staff, that's their wish to do so. Um, just understanding that it might not be, what we're trying to do is put something that's defensible before them, not guaranteeing that it's going to necessarily stand up to a court case, but what we feel is at least reasonably defensible. And in, in July, I don't know about other commissioners, I believe we received a communication in mid-July from the Durham Realtors and the home builders that said that they did have some concerns, but then they would be back in touch with us in the next week or two. And we haven't heard anything back. Has the, has the staff heard any they're, thoughts at They're this working point? on it. Yeah, they, they have not. We, we met with them. When did we meet? We met with them back in May and April. May and April, that time period, and we have heard nothing from them since that meeting. And, you, and your memo says that this is likely coming to us in September. Is, yeah, that, the, is that still likely, or is that? That's the plan right now. If there's something that comes up, we are gonna be also meeting with some city council members. They asked to meet with, with staff, and we're gonna meet next week with them. Um, they weren't specific as to why they wanted to meet with us, but uh, I have a feeling at least the real estate sign is one topic, if not just to get a better handle on it. Um, and uh, I know at least one of the council members we're meeting with next week was also on JCCPC, so he's already heard this. Um, so I have a feeling they just kind of want to get a better grasp of the issues that they're hearing um, from their, you know, through their emails and contacts and such. And if there's, you know, if we get direction to go in a different direction, then we'll do that, and we'll with or without sure wayfinding signs. Uh, right. Yeah. And and you know, again, this is our our. Our uh, best professional uh, opinion as to a defensible ordinance. 
um, understanding that there might be different ways to attack it, and we're open to those options if, if it's an issue. Great. Commissioner Miller? I have a, some questions I'd like to ask just to test my understanding. Would it be a violation of Gilbert if we required everybody who posted a sign in the right-of-way, in other words, on public property, city property, to identify, however small the print might be, who the owner of the sign is to enhance enforcement? Seems to me if we can have a permit requirement, we can have a an identification requirement. Um, it, you can make that as part of the permit requirement. I don't see that as a violation of Gilbert. I think we are steering away from the a permitting requirement because... Um, well, I'm saying for an unpermitted sign. Oh, for unpermitted signs? In the right-of-way, not in somebody's yard or something, but in the right-of-way, especially if you've got a time period uh, and you also know who, know who to cite if you get violations. It seems to me that that is a reasonable governmental interest, or otherwise you don't know you don't know how, who's putting them up. Uh, so that was that's something I'll throw out there. So if uh, I am in the Cherry Lane subdivision, Don O'Toole, City Attorney's <laughs> Office. The one thing I, I could see as a potential objection to that, I, I mean, I think we could have that requirement, but I could see someone objecting to. Um, or an argument along the lines that the government is imposing speech on them, that we're requiring them to put certain language on their sign. I see that. That's why I asked the question. But there are there is a compelling reason. I'm not talking about all signs. I'm talking about the sign in the government's property. Uh, so then the, another question. So I so. The Cherry Lane subdivision wants to put up uh, permanent signs, mm -hmm. either in the right of way or in their neighborhood or in on private property in their neighborhood that says that identifies it as the Cherry Lane subdivision. Mm -hmm. What kind of sign is that, and what are the regs under the new rules? Under the new rules, it would still be a um, actually the, it would take the form of a monument freestanding sign. And those are current regulations now that they're allowed to do that. Um, we reworded it a little bit to make it a little more read friendly. Um, one thing that we did remove was allowing them in the right of way. Um, so right. they would not be allowed in the right of way anymore. And we kind of, and Public Works handles those kind of encroachment agreements and stuff. And they were actually kind of thankful that that wouldn't be allowed in there because of kind of breakaway hazard issues that they cause in the right of way. Mm -hmm. I mean, so. Talk about real estate signs. Uh, the Shriners want to do a fish fry. What happens moving forward with the, uh, the, the fish fry signs that get stuck up in the, in the right of way uh, for a week before the fish fry? They're not allowed. Hmm? They're not allowed. Not allowed. No. Um, Uh-oh. Yeah. Uh, what about what I would call non-commercial message signs? Uh, uh, I want to um, uh, spread the gospel, and so I put a sign in my yard that says, the Lord told me to tell the world that Jesus is soon to come. Go for it. How big? Let's, let's take a look. Yeah. Was, Go with. Yeah. Go with. Uh, is that the three? Page 31. Is that the three square feet thing? Yeah, that's the, yeah. So, uh, no higher than three square feet and maximum four square feet of each sign. So you could list all sorts of proverbs from the Bible that you like. Okay. Uh, what about the right of way? Only during the election time periods. All right. Good to know. That's what things, it seems to me we have a lot of, a lot of fish fries at election time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And so uh, yard sales, those kinds of things. Yard sales, so under the single and two, same section for under 31, uh, single and two family residential. So when there is a yard sale, you can have a sign. We're not telling you it has to say yard sale, but it's when you have a yard sale. And then. Okay. What about in the right of way? What if I want to put it no, down the street? Commercial those, are, those are done. Commercial. 
Oh my goodness, I see that we're going to have to figure out some ways to work on this uh, because those well, th that's I mean, just life. People are going to do that. Well, I mean, quite honestly, a lot of the stuff is illegal anyway when it's put up. I mean, it's put up on utility poles, which is illegal right now. So it's, it's um, a lot of the things were just making it more abundantly clear that it's currently illegal. Um, uh, there's also, I mean, enforcement is going to be what enforcement is. So you're taking a risk if you put up a yard sale sign up in your corner. So that's a strong reason not to put your name on. Right. <laughs> yes. Any additional questions? No, no, no. That's, that's why I asked those. I suspected your answers. So. Yeah. Great. Commissioner, I, I foresee it's not, it's trouble. Not, it's not an <laughs> ideal situation that we're in. We're not arguing that this is an awesome way to go. Um, but it's kind of where we landed right now. And again, if someone has a really good idea that's not overly burdensome in terms of needing additional staff and resources to create a permitting system kind of thing, but is kind of equitable uh, to everything, we, we're, we'll be glad to take those suggestions and see how they work out. So the church in Gilbert, if it was in Durham, would actually be in trouble going forward with this ordinance. Not the moving church. The moving church. Yeah. Yes. So they shouldn't have. Gone. They're going to have to rely on email. <laughs> um, yeah. But just one point. Just uh, you know, I know we're all sympathetic to nonprofit organizations and their need to have fish fries, but that would be a commercial activity. So if we, if city council wants to allow signs like that in the right of way, we need to keep in mind that that's opening the right of way for commercial speech. And then it's also opening the right of way for any kind of non-commercial speech. So if that we can regulate it about how long they can be up and how big they are and where they can go, and, and without that's regard to the content. That as early as 2014, we discussed um, if we wanted to regulate that, that would involve a pretty extensive permitting and enforcement program, and I'm pretty sure that planning doesn't have the staff to take care of that, but. Those are all things that could be considered. Mike can do it. Commissioner Bryan. Um, thank you. Uh, most of the little things that I've marked, I'll try to get sent to you. Uh, thank you. But there are a couple of things I wanted to just mention while we're here. On page 12, we'll talk about, you know, hazardous signs, especially uh, the ones that interfere with the line of sight. And if you want an example of signs that interfere with your sight triangles, come to NC 54 and Barbie Road Saturday morning, and there will be there. There will be about a dozen. Uh, one of the things that I think might be helpful if you can get together with transportation and work up a definition to put a definition of what the site triangles are maybe those are in the ordinance already they are because yeah. i didn't see them yeah there's a there's a section in article 12 that goes well, over maybe you line. should uh yeah. reference it then that's fine sure. and then the other thing that i wanted to mention this is on page 39 really under yeah, yeah. c area paragraph two uh you have this distinction Lots with a frontage of less than 150 linear feet. Sign should be 12 square feet. And then if it's 150 linear feet or more, the frontage, you can go up to 32 square feet. That's existing text. Uh, yeah, well, my point I want to make about it, even if it's existing, I think it's a big jump. If I have a lot, if there's a lot that only has 140 linear feet, Next to one that say it has 160, you know, one guy can only have 12, the other guy can only go up to 32. I, I think I, there needs to be more of a graduation. I, I understand where you're coming from. Um, we tried, I, I, by admission, there has been some mission creep in this where there was some really identifiable where we've already recorded issues with the current regulations and we had an opportunity to clean it up while we were in there. We haven't heard any issues with that at all. Um, so we hesitate to get into the weeds of the specific uh, time, place, and manner regulations that are already existing and weren't causing any problems. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand that. But I understand your concern. Mm -hmm. 
Commissioner Williams? Yes, I would just like to uh, make a motion in the interest of time, if possible, to kind of wrap this up. I, I believe this is informational. You can go. Oh, okay. Well, thank yeah, you. You can leave. <laughs> <laughs> but normally, I would thank you. Yes. <laughs> No, I'm really grateful because this is this is going to be a difficult hearing. I don't want to learn about this in a staff report in 10 minutes on each side. Right. And I assume that's why we're here. Vice Chair Hyman. And I still want to because I had some real concerns about the nefarious signs for so long. What specifically would address those signs in the new language? That they can only be uh, they, you. Someone can still do a nefarious sign. So they still okay. can. Okay. But because that's just free non-commercial speech. And they that's, put that's it on voicing, his property. That's voicing they, an opinion. But I mean, can um, they put so, it on his property the way that they did? But it can only be done during the election t time period. Mm -hmm. Right. So it can't be done, kept up throughout, whenever. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Any other questions or comments, or from either the commissioners or from staff? Commissioner Gibbs. This is going to be a mundane question with all the other details. Uh, Why not? It's 1030. But it's Don't mind a mundane answer. It's something that <laughs> means something to me when it comes to signage, any signage, directions, street names, whatever. Is there anything in the law that says you're going to try to comply with the ADA as far as contrast, letter sizes, if it's a lighted sign, is it going to be lighted in such a way that it's going to cause glare, which for some people would just eliminate it. And I, but that's important to me uh, and a lot of other people with disabilities uh, like that. We do have illumination and lighting provisions. We actually, one of the sections that we did kind of tweak a bit is make it a little bit more specific as to how they're being held to certain lighting standards and directing them. Uh, a cross-reference issue, um, like for sight triangles, we're cross-referencing to the lighting standards in the, in the UDO and the foot candle measurements and such for lighting. So we, we did address that in terms of illumination. Well, I'll tell you, direction toward a person's eyes is a big, big issue that needs to be researched and understood. Uh, anyway, uh, no, those I are had good points. To throw that in there. Right, thank, thank you, you. Commissioner. Uh, anything else from from the staff? Nope. Um, unless something happens, you will see this as a public hearing item next month. But you know, if not, then it will be soon after that, you know, if there's something that we need to address before we get to the hearing. Great. Well, I want to thank you both because this is very confusing and challenging and you sat here all night, so we appreciate so. the time to and explain it, it. Yes, and again, if you have co comments or questions that you just want to forward to us, please feel free to do that and we'll try to address them if it, if it warrants a, a change and we'll, a, we'll say we made that change or why we didn't make that change or what have you. That's great. Thank you. Before we adjourn, we have two final items. Uh, Ms. Smith, since we're in hour six, it seems like the appropriate time to maybe introduce a new staff person and, and to give us an update on what to expect next month. Right. So there will not be an update on what to expect next month because I sent an email that I don't know what you should expect next month because I'm still catching up from last week. But as soon as I know what you should expect next month, I will let you know. Great. And um, that will be sometime this week. And I would like to introduce our new uh, staff member, Emily Struther. She's actually not a new staff member. You may recognize Emily from uh, working in development review. She has been with the department since, oh, what? It's been a little over three years. Yeah, 2015-ish, 14, late 14, 15-ish. She's joining our um, team because, as you know, Mr. Wiggins is um, traversed up to the front of the house and is helping all of our wonderful customers in Durham with all of their exceptional questions and, and land use uh, inquiries. So um, Emily will be taking over um, in some of his cases, but also doing the similar work that he did and working with our team, and you'll see her in the coming months. So, so how frequently are we going to see Carla or Woods? Is Carla, um, Carla has expressed, Carla used to do flum amendments. I think if you recall back um, in her earlier in her career, she did flum amendments back when they were separated from the zoning cases, and now we do a consolidated report. 
and then she was focusing her um, time on historic preservation, but she expressed an interest in learning some other things, and then we were short-staffed, and we got really busy, and we were like, oh, since you want to learn new things, here, do this. So, um, she, well, I was wondering if she yeah. was in, involved in the Forest Hills thing because of the historic preservation aspect. Well, she, she was a natural for that one because she had a Flum um, background and historic preservation background, but she has actually expressed interest in just do, helping us, and, and we are trying to cross-train our team so that we don't have uh, deficiencies when we're, when we're some of us are out or not in place. So, Great. so Thank welcome, you. Emily. Yeah, Emily, welcome aboard. Every every night is this fun and yeah. this long, and Mr. Wiggins. A whole new meaning to aging in place. They don't always place. go this long. So, yeah. Last month was 36 minutes, I was told. Uh, one final item, a point of personal privilege, Commissioner Ghosh. Thank you. For a moment. Uh, so I believe this is my last meeting as a planning commissioner, so I just wanted to say a few words. Uh, first, let me start by saying that I have enjoyed it. I honestly can say that I have learned something from each of you so I thank you for that, and I hope you all can say the same about me. I want you to know that I think the work that the Planning Commission does is very important, which is one reason why I withdrew my name for, con for a consideration for reappointment to the Planning Commission last Monday. Uh, my involvement with the Planning Commission has become quite a distraction, so I apologize if any of that has spilled over to you. Whether for political gain or actual concern, uh, elected officials have called my ethics into question uh, with regard to my public service as a planning commissioner and my private service as an attorney. And while I trust that none of you had any concern about the manner in which I conduct myself, I am happy to report that both the city and county attorneys have determined that I did not violate any code of ethics that governs it, all of us. Uh, it has been a stressful time for me, and I would never wish it upon any of you. Uh, the intersection of my work with that of the planning commission is tricky to say the least, uh, but recently I've noticed that my role on planning commission has caused my interactions with elected officials in my professional role as an attorney to become increasingly antagonistic. At this time, I think it will be best not only for me, but also for the planning commission and the city and county of Durham for me to move on to a different role. I will continue to serve on the planning commission until they make a new appointment, but I suspect that will be later this month, uh, but fear not. As many times I have recused myself from this planning commission, I'm sure you'll see me again. Only next time I'll be at that podium instead of this one. Uh, truly, it has been a pleasure serving with you all, and thank you very much. Well, I, let me say on behalf of everyone, we really appreciate your service, and I think we have learned a lot from you as well. You brought a unique perspective, and you are always engaged and active and very thoughtful. Um, if you are still here next month, we will be honored to have you join us. Um, and if there is a new replacement, we also hope you'll come back so we can thank you for your service on the commission. Of course. Mr. Chairman, if I may, I feel fairly strongly about this. Uh, there needs to be somebody at this table that has your professional experience, which means that for each of us that comes bringing expertise there and a point of view, because we're an advisory body, right. uh, there are going to be tricky times. Uh, I thought you handled the tricky part exceptionally well, and I think we're going to be impoverished by your loss. Well, I and, appreciate that. <laughs> and on that unhappy note, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. <laughs>